All right, so good morning, everyone, and welcome to our 9 a.m. May 13th, 2020 special meeting of the City Council. I have a few announcements, and then we will move on to our regular meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on Community Television Channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. All council members are participating in this meeting remotely. I want to thank the public for staying home to view today's city council meeting. If you wish to comment on the budget presentation today, instructions are on your screen. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through the phone. Please note there is a delay in streaming, so if you continue to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. Call in at the beginning of the presentation you are wanting to comment on. When it is time for public comment, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it's your time to speak during public comment, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes, and you may hang up once you've commented on your presentation of interest. You may also send an email to cityclerk at cityofsantacruz.com. Your comment will be shared with the council members as they are received and will be entered into the public record. And I would like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Um, council Member Byers? Muted. Here. Matthews? Here. Brown? Here. Boulder? Here. Watkins? Here. Vice Mayor Myers? Donna, you muted. Are you muted, Donna? I'll note she's here, but her audio is not working. Yeah. And Mayor Cummings. Here. Next up on our agenda, item number one, our first presentation will be from Public Works. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is a presentation you would like to comment on, now is the time to call on using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation by staff followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and return to the council for any follow-up questions or comments. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to our Public Works Director, Mark Dettel. So let's try doing this. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's Mark Dettel, Director of Public Works. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen um, for our presentation. Can you see the presentation? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Um, so, our agenda for today is, um, we're gonna give you a, a quick department overview, uh, our core services and top FY uh, 2020 achievements by division, and then a working status quo budget. As far as the unavoid, in addition to unavoidable non-status quo aspects of our budget. Um, Public Works. Public Works is the largest department in the city, uh, with over 235 employees. Uh, we have six divisions: resource recovery, wastewater operations, transportation and parking, engineering, and administration. And I'll take you on a short tour of each of the divisions. Um, the resource recovery division um, basically have three uh, sections, uh, collection, resource recovery, processing, and waste production. In collections, we collect refuse, recycling, green waste from residents and businesses. We collect food waste at a pilot group of commercial kitchens, which will be expanding to commercial kitchens throughout the city and then to households, hopefully, uh, in 2022, that's our, our goal. 
Street Sweep is city wide. We removed nearly three last year from our street and respond to the illegal dumping request. For resource recovery, we sort, process, market, and sell recyclable materials. We have a hazardous household waste collection site up at the landfill uh, run by the county, and it's open on Saturdays. We also process construction debris to be reused and kept out of the landfill. What we're not able to reuse does end up in the landfill, and we manage that air fill, that airspace um, very carefully to ensure the longest life of our landfill itself. In addition, we collect methane gas from our, our landfill cells, and that is piped to uh, two turbines that generates electricity and uh, also reduces our greenhouse gas effect. Our, our waste reduction section, this is our education section. It promotes um, citywide to businesses and residents. Uh, encourages uh, efforts to meet the city and state goals and mandates uh, through our outreach and education programs. We also have events uh, and education topics include waste, source reduction, reuse, recycling, household hazardous waste, composting, and pollution prevention. We have a lot of videos that are on our webpage that show, pe that show people how to recycle and how to properly um, compost and waste reduction. They also lead in policy development for issues such as restaurant to go food packaging, as you recall, and single use plastics. And they provide waste reduction audits for the city's green business certification program. Some top uh, achievements uh, from the resource recovery this past year, uh, master recycler program was a huge success and actually uh, won a, it was a recipient of a California Resources Recovery Association's Outstanding Recycling Program Award. It's a volunteer training program that increases awareness in the community of how to, um, how to do a recycling, and they are actually out there helping other people recycle. We use them at Earth Day um, to educate the public. The second item is the construction of food waste processing line at the resource recovery facility. We're very excited for this line to be um, complete. We're in the final shakeout period, and we hope this to go live in the coming weeks. Uh, this will help us meet our state mandatory organics collection law. Uh, let me go back, sorry. What's not status quo for resource recovery? Well, fortunately, we did start with six months of operating reserves, um, and that's going to help us bridge this gap. But but before the COVID impact, we start, we, recycling markets continue to be significantly down. Um, we're still feeling the impact of that. Our paper and plastic recycling, um, the markets have basically dried up. They're starting to come back, but we're we're having to pay to get rid of that material instead of getting revenue for it. And our revenue estimates for the coming year are down about 50% for recycling, which is about a million dollars of our overall $20 million budget. With the COVID impacts, um, we think the commercial usage and revenues are down somewhat the last two months. Uh, residential revenues may be delayed, uh, but we do not expect a significant long-term impact to resource recovery revenue as a whole. And the reserves will help budget us over the buffer us over the short term. We are looking for operational efficiencies and delaying and reducing expenses that can help us bridge the gap. We're looking at delaying vehicle replacements a few months, uh, delaying uh, some capital projects, and delaying filling of certain vac vacant positions. Our next division is wastewater division. It's also divided into three uh, sections, collection, uh, treatment facility, and environmental compliance and lab. The collections cleans, inspects, and repairs over 150 miles of underground sewer pipes, uh, 26 sewer and stormwater lift stations, provides sewer and storm pipeline video inspections to assist engineering in selecting replacement projects, cleans and maintains Sewer storm drain networks provides flood control drainage uh, cleaning as well as weed abatement. 
provides 24-7 emergency coverage. Our on-call staff responding to sanitary spills to protect our waterways. We maintain the leachate system from the resource recovery facility all the way to the wastewater treatment plant, separate pipeline. And then we respond to USA tickets for utility marking and locating uh, to protect city infrastructure from construction damage. The treatment facility treats over 7 million gallons of wastewater a day using an all-natural biological process. It serves the city of Santa Cruz residents as well as Santa Cruz County Sanitation District communities of Live Oak, Aptos, Capitola, and Soquel. The, the treatment facility generates in excess of 70% of the energy it uses through digester gas and solar panels, saving customers close to a million dollars in energy savings each year. It reclaims treated wastewater for use inside the facility, saving over 50 million gallons of potable water annually and produces Class B biosolids for beneficial re reuse in non-food crops. And it educates our customers about their service throughout outreach and facility tours. Our environmental compliance and laboratory provides inspection, monitoring, and guidance to local businesses regarding the discharge into the sanitary sewer and storm drain system. They issue discharge permits to industrial users and liquid waste haulers. They work to eliminate violations, they can levy fines and citations, but they'd rather work to educate the, our customers. The laboratory provides a wide array of analytical and technical sampling, monitoring, and wastewater treatment process in support of the city's stormwater, watershed, and landfill programs and regulatory NPDES permits. It also provides mandatory monitoring of near shore bacteria and other indicators of environmental health and provides analytical support to other city departments in the county. Since we won't be able to do tours in the next few months, we do have a, um, a video that we put together. Uh, it's, a, it's a public service announcement. It's a three minute video. I'd like to play it just to be, give you an overview of what we, what we plan to show. Every day, people in Santa Cruz generate about 7 million gallons of wastewater from sinks, showers, toilets, washing machines, and dishwashers. It flows from our homes and businesses to the sewer. What happens with our wastewater from here is often misunderstood and taken for granted. At the Santa Cruz Wastewater Treatment Facility, an all-natural treatment process helps to protect our environment while providing customers with an essential quality of life service. The process includes the reuse of biosolids and reclaimed water plus energy recovery that saves customers money. First, the wastewater is collected through an extensive underground maze of pipes over 150 miles long, transporting it to the city's treatment facilities. City crews maintain almost a million feet of city pipeline and 18 lift stations, allowing the wastewater to travel effectively to the treatment facility. Up to 5,000 feet of old pipe is replaced each year. Upon arriving at the treatment facility, the wastewater undergoes biological processes that are environmentally friendly. It's clean, much like a running stream purifies water, using sophisticated engineering and all natural biological techniques. The liquid is first cleaned aerobically, moving through plastic media, where bacteria and microorganisms transform organic waste. Clarifiers further clean the liquid, which is then disinfected by ultraviolet rays. Solid waste is separated and reduced by an aerobic process that works much like the human stomach. The digestible content is converted into fuel that generates electricity. This, plus our solar energy system, allows us to produce 70% of the energy the facility uses, saving our customers a lot of money. Centrifuges remove water before the solids are transported to the Central Valley for use as a soil amendment on non-food crops or as top cover for landfill. The daily plant flow of over 7 million gallons is enough to fill 11 Olympic pools. That's approximately 3 billion gallons annually. About 60 million gallons of this water is further treated and recycled for use inside the facility. The clean water that is not reused on site is released to an outfall location 110 feet below the ocean surface and approximately one mile offshore of Natural Bridges State Beach. The facility's environmentally friendly, state-of-the-art treatment ensures that the water entering Monterey Bay is safe and clean for all life in our community. 
community. This environmental stewardship, including energy efficiency, the reuse of biosolids, and reclaimed water, has helped us win recognition as best in class facility in all of California. The facility has won numerous other awards and is a U.S. Environmental Protection Agency top green power partner for on-site production of the energy it uses. Our wastewater treatment facility helps to reduce the city's carbon footprint while providing quality of life service to the community and protecting the environment we live in. So that video itself was produced um, by our communications group, and I think it does a good job of educating the public of what's going on and what we do at the wastewater plant. Um, so we're, we're actually working on a similar video for our resource recovery facility as well. So wastewater uh, top achievements uh, for, the com for the past year, we completed wastewater treatment uh, risk assessment our infrastructure study, we did a, a second evaluation to, to look at critical assets as far as um, what's the high risk asset and what are the, what are the risks that we have on that. Um, identified two major projects, the, the plant 21 kV power, distri power distribution system is reaching the end of its life as well as um, emergency power generation systems and we scheduled a, we're on a preliminary design right now. We're, work, we're working to replace that system. Um, that's a major project. It's probably on the order of 10 to $15 million and we'll bond for that. But that is a, <clears throat> a major project that will be coming your way in the, in the coming year. In addition, we have an agreement, a recent agreement with Pure Water SoCal to provide them with the source water for their Pure Water project. Uh, they'll be using uh, tertiary treated wastewater and then piping it to Chanticleer where they'll provide advanced treatment to that water before they inject it in their wells uh, to stop the seawater intrusion that they're experiencing. And then yesterday you awarded a contract for the replacement of the facility's aging UV system, which will upgrade our UV treatment and reduce our energy costs. There's one other item I'd like to uh, address. It's the full implementation of our sewer lateral ordinance. That's been very successful. It's been in place for about a year. And with the rebate that we provide for residents that replace their laterals, we've had quite a few people take advantage of that and we're seeing a lot less uh, sewer uh, lateral spills and that type of thing. So it's been a very effective program. So what's not a status quo with wastewater treatment? Again, we started with six months of operating reserves with wastewater. So that really helps us out quite a bit. Uh, we do not anticipate long-term impacts to revenue. Um, we have seen a sh some short-term impacts, uh, basically commercial and residential short-term. We will be bonding for our major capital projects, the electrical upgrades and the UV replacement projects. And you'll see an I a request for iBank coming to you either next council meeting or in the first meeting in June. And we're looking to delay uh, capital outlay purchases until the fund stabilizes so that um, we don't stress the fund. Our next operation, our next division is operations division, made up of three sections, streets and traffic, mechanical maintenance, and facilities maintenance. Streets and traffic, uh, they're small uh, but mighty. They have just nine filled positions and responsible for a large group of work. Sidewalk, curb gutter, catch basin installations and repair, repairing and replacing street lights, managing vegetation along our sidewalks, roadways, bike lanes, other areas to enhance traffic and public safety. Vegetation, sediment, debris removal from our creeks and rivers to main flood control. They assist police and parks departments on encampment cleanups and debris removal. They provide critical project coordination and logistic supports for city projects, including the unsheltered population response work and repairing and replacing installing street signs, fencing, guardrails, producing in-house signage for other city departments as well. And painting, including street markings, serves, curbs, striping, and crosswalks. 
and critical logistical supports for special events, such as New, New Year's, Halloween, and street fairs. Our mechanical maintenance provides the maintenance of the city's fleet, including police and refuse vehicles and heavy equipment. They administer city, the city fleet, including vehicle replacement, provide fueling for 24 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They work to replace vehicles with electric and alternative fuel vehicles whenever possible. And they also over, oversee the city's handheld radios. The facilities maintenance. Facilities provides routine maintenance and repair of 28 city-owned facilities. They provide also 24-hour response for facility emergencies. And they provide janitorial and sanitary sanitation services at various facilities. Facilities provide assistance to police, city manager, and other, with other special projects, including shelter, setup, and encampment removal. And they provide safety inspections at all facilities. They've also been a lead in the city's uh, energy efficiency programs and retrofit projects, as well as overseeing the solar PV operations. Their top achievements would be completed the City Hall Annex and the La Viega Golf Lodge remodels. They completed the PPA agreements with solar at three city facilities, uh, at the La Viega Lodge facility, the courtyard, and the landfill. We'll have an estimated $100,000 a year saving. They replaced six more gas fleet vehicles with electric and hybrid models and replaced four existing electrics with new longer range models and facilities played a key role in keeping employees safe during the COVID pan pandemic by providing responsive facility sanitation, PPE supplies, cleaning and hand sanitizer supplies. What's not in the status quo? Well, already very lean general fund revenue cuts could increase decrease deferred maintenance and that's increasing future liabilities. That's the concern. The section May further limit our focus to essential repairs and reduce or delay facility upgrades, vegetation management, or non-mandatory services. Deferred maintenance, that is the big one in, in facilities. Um, in 2013, we had a consultant provide a comprehensive facility assessment. Uh, it showed a deficiency of about $12 million backlog of maintenance and repair needs. We completed the safety items and addressed some of the energy items, but there's other items that are still on that, that list that still haven't been addressed because of the lack of capital investment. Uh, we were hoping this year would be a, a year for us to add to that, but with the COVID impact, it looks like we may be unfortunately adding a little bit more to our deferred maintenance. Um, our next area is transportation engineering division. Uh, the three areas in transportation is the traffic engineering, parking, and education outreach. Engineering designs our capital projects, responds to citizens' requests. They provide analysis of traffic patterns, issues, and solutions, uh, modify the traffic signal system for better efficiency, prepare citywide active transportation plans, implement improvements in crossings or bikeways. They develop and implement plans for downtown parking via transportation demand management other, and other parking analysis. And most importantly, they acti actively seek and secure grant funding for transportation improvements. They've been very successful since 2011. We've been awarded over $21 million in grant funded projects and those hope to deliver through 2024. 10 million of those are under construction with another 5 million ready to go. In parking, we operate and maintain four city-owned parking garages, 24 parking lots, maintain and provide collection for parking meters citywide, provide parking enforcement for the city, and provide parking services for the municipal wharf, operate and maintain two public restrooms, provide refuse pickup, sidewalk scrubbing, and other maintenance for the downtown district to keep our downtown looking clean and beautiful. We operate many parking programs such as the special event parking, downtown employee parking, um, resident permit parking program. We 
We provide bike lockers at several locations in the city and provide parking citation review and collection. Our education and outreach uh, creates and implements several education outreach programs in support of creating safer streets and encouraging alternative transportation. Go Santa Cruz is one of such program. And through February, it signed up over 1,000 individuals and distributed over 630 free transit passes for particip participants and accounted for 50,000 miles of non-single occupant driving. The division also utilizes Street Smarts program to provide targeted education. It's working on development of a city vision zero implementation plan and oversees the city's bike sharing program. Our top achievements are the ATP pedestrian enhanced pedestrian crossing improvements, the Go Santa Cruz program, the construction starting a coastal rail trail segment segment seven phase one, and our bike rank, bike ridership ranking. It's we're second in the nation and we're rated gold rated bike friendly community by the League of American Cyclists. What's not the status quo with traffic engineering? Oops. Um, expected reductions will further reduce ability to progress general funded project, projects and programs. Um, general funded design work will be reduced, uh, redesigned education outreach efforts and rethinking our uh, TDM strategy based on what's going on with COVID. How does that affect transit? Um, you know, carpooling probably is not going to happen for a while, so we're having to rethink that strategy and use what we can to encourage people to still walk and bike and um, get downtown without driving the vehicle. What's not the status quo? Three months ago, this was typical, parking lots full. Um, unfortunately, the COVID has had a, an impact on our downtown parking. Uh, that's probably the largest area of concern and most dependent on a vibrancy of downtown. General fund and parking revenues are, are already affected. We've lost two, two months of revenue. Uh, we do have a, a reserve, but we are, we are generating, a, you know, we are using a lot of it at this time. We're probably going to burn through about $2 million, which is what I expect, maybe more before the end of the fiscal year. So, we're going to have to balance, uh, we're going to have to relook at our capital uh, improvement project schedules. Um, we may have to look at certain programs that we have and reevaluate our non core services that are currently provided by parking. But we're still watching and hope and doing everything we can to encourage uh, the business vitality back to the downtown. Um, the last area is, is the engineering division. Uh, engineering designs and implements capital projects, uh, which includes repair, improvement projects, programs associated with multimodal transportation, street design and reconstruction, slope stability, utility undergrounding, sanitary sewer collection and treatment, stormwater collection, refuse recycling, facility, city facilities improvement. It's really the engineering arm, consulting arm for the city. Uh, engineering develops projects, concepts, secures grant funding for non-enterprise projects. They provide development review and inspection. We issue permits for projects such as street opening, utility, utility installation, concrete work. We create planning and environmental documents including CEQA certification, traffic impact these studies, area plans, and utility and facility plans. They develop and implement the city stormwater management plan and programs in compliance with state and federal mandates. Our sewer, road, sewer, and storm drain really is our, is our funding sources. Uh, energy engineering manages the administration and utilization of key funding sources which pay for the repairs of our improvements to our roads, sewer system, and storm drain system. Gas tax and measure D, measure H funding pays for street improvements and raises the city's pavement condition index. Measure E provides funding for projects and programs intended to keep our rivers and beaches and oceans clean. And lastly, engineering seeks grant funding for certain projects where no dedicated funding otherwise exists. 
And our capital investment program engineering develops and implements the department's annual capital investment plan. Engineering insists, assists other city departments with the implementation of their capital projects. And examples of two major long-term projects that are getting ready to start, the engineering is working now on improvements to intersection highway one and nine, as well as the Murray Street Bridge seismic retrofit and bike pedestrian lane project. While engineering prudently sources use of grants and bonds, partnerships, and taxes to fund projects whenever possible, the engineering, the city still faces an, a large unfunded list of capital projects in excess of $300 million. Our top achievements, the coastal rail trail segment seven construction start of, of phase one. Uh, we hope to have that finished actually by uh, September. We're excited about that. Uh, the Ladera Street sewer and storm drain replacement and the river and water street rehabilitation projects that we just completed with the bike facility enhancements to make biking safer on those, on those roadways. What's not in status quo with engineering? We're gonna have to repro reprioritize, uh, reprioritize the work on enterprise funded projects and grant funded projects until our general fund recovers. In overall, an overall view of our budget, just the pie chart, um, this is our resources by fund. You can see that wastewater at 22 million and refuse at 21 million make up two thirds of our $66 million uh, revenue budget. Parking district revenue historically is the next highest at 7.3 million. And then the net general fund component is about 4.6 million with gas tax, equipment operations, wharf parking, um, and Measure E making up the rest. If you look at our, our expenditures by fund, they typically mirror the revenue as we keep our, our funds and divisions working within the budget. Um, you will note that the expenditures in this year are about $3 million higher than our uh, revenue, and that's basically in the refuse area where we're building our next $3 million cell, and that's shown in the uh, expenditure, although that will not be fully expended uh, in the coming years, but we will have the money to obligate the contract. That's all I have for you, um, and I'm here to answer any questions. I do have my division managers uh, available also to answer questions, if you have any. So if I can unshare my screen. Great, thanks for that presentation, Mark, and congrats on all the ongoing achievements that your department is making. Uh, I'll turn it back over to uh, council members, uh, council member Byers. You have your hand up, followed by council member Golder. Good, okay. Uh, thanks, Mark, for that overview. Uh, amazing, amazing department. Um, the one I didn't know, what is Vision Zero? I never heard that before. Right, um, that's a great question. Uh, Vision Zero is a, a new concept that's being adapted for safety, and it really it came in, the, in from Europe. It envisioned zero traffic fatalities, and so it's a way to bring all city departments, not just public works, but PD, fire, um, and to look at how we look at our, our traffic safety and with the focus on reducing uh, fatalities. And so it's, it's a total kind of a holistic approach. Good. Um, you know, you're, I don't know, I have not heard, but for a long time there was a difficulty with the odor coming up Bay Street, I think in Neary's. Uh, I haven't heard that that's still going on and have you resolved that difficulty of the terrible smell on Bay Street and Neary? Yeah, that, that's also great that you haven't heard anything because I think we yeah. have. <laughs> we use a, we use actually an ozone system called the Vapex system. That actually historically they would try to cover the scent with um, kind of a perfume type system. This is an ozone system that actually knocks mm. the odor out and it basically eliminated odor complaints um, at the wastewater plant. Uh, my, I think my last one. Um, for a long time, I kept hearing that 
it would begin or start uh, putting a roundabout up at High and Bay Street near the university? Is that still just a capital thing that's not happening? Um, it, we do have a plan for that. We have a uh, preliminary design and we have been working oh, with the good. university on it. So um, because it's a joint project, it sometimes is a little more difficult to get projects like that implemented, but that is still the goal to implement a, a roundabout up there. Okay, I think that's it. Thanks, Mark. Sure, thank you. Councilmember Golder. I wanted to thank Mark for the comprehensive presentation and all the work that your department does. And then while you were talking, you said um, you were thinking of ways to rethink the education and outreach that you do. And I remember when we spoke before, I told you how our kids love the field trip to the Resource Recovery Center and the landfill is one of their you know, favorites, one of the highlights along with the watershed field trip. And so I, I love the little PSA that you did and I was wondering if it would be possible to like combine that with like almost like a scavenger hunt type walk or something like that. I mean, looking forward, I'm thinking the next year and, and all the field trips that the kids have already missed, this idea of a virtual field trip where they could watch something and then have something they could take with them to look around would be a super cool idea. And we've been working on this um, wireless Wednesday for today at Bayview and we put out different sites, historical sites around Santa Cruz where kids could go, we, we stole it from the museum. But I think in almost all the departments, it would be really cool to do little videos like that where the kids could watch because we just walked through the other day, my daughter and I, and she's 14 and was like, I've never been on a field trip here. Like, it just looks like ducks roller skating. Like, why are they going in a circle? And so anyway, I just think it's a great video and I'd love to see more from your department and other departments. Great. Yeah, we'd be happy to work on things like that. We have a communications person and um, we're going to have to be creative in sharing what we do because we won't be able to do tours for a little while. So th that's a great idea. We're happy to work with you on that. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Vice Mayor Myers. Oh, you're muted, Donna. We'll come back to you. Um, Council Member Matthews. Again, spectacular presentation. Thank you. <laughs> it's, it's just breathtaking what your department does. And um, like Renee, just congratulations both on the uh, deeply technological, <laughs> all the reviews you have to go through, and the public education is fantastic. I love the video. Um, share it with us, we can spread it around. Great. Um, just, just great work. And again, in every one of your divisions, what you're doing for um, really progressive environmental protection, energy conservation, it's just spectacular. Good work. Thank you so much. Um, let's see. Vice Mayor Myers, can, you, can we try to see if your audio is working? Thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I love the PSA um, and it's a great idea. I think Councilmember Golder's idea of trying to expand on that. Um, I wanted to ask, and also I want to say, um, because we, we hear about city departments and projects winning these awards and it's kind of just kind of jammed in there with the, you know, overall um, the overview where we get a, you know, a brief presentation of the council meetings, but this is a really big deal. And, you know, I'm wondering about trying to, um, I know that we advertise it, but if there's a way that we can kind of keep that in the forefront of people's minds, um, it would be great. If so, just thinking about how to, how to remind people that these awards take a lot of effort um, and a lot of decision-making and this is, um, it's a big deal. Uh, the question I have is uh, about, uh, and you didn't call it out, but I, I'm, it, it goes without saying that the Measure D funds um, the local sales tax for transit and the gas tax, gas tax funding is also, we're looking at major reductions there. And so I'm wondering how um, projects funded with, partially with those funds, how you're thinking about that, or is there anything that specifically that we're gonna that we're at risk of not being able to do 
um, in the short term and, and how do you plan to kind of work around that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we still haven't seen the revenue numbers from that. Um, the thing about projects like that, um, they do take a longer time um, and we have some flexibility. Usually we'll use some of that on paving. So we can adjust paving projects to accommodate what the funding source is. Um, we are lucky that we do have Measure H, which is our own internal um, sales tax program, which helps keep our streets uh, maintained as well. So, but yeah, that's a concern. I think we're all kind of waiting to see where these numbers are gonna shake out with sales tax. Um, and we're hoping that it's a short, we're hoping it's a, a Y instead of a, a U or, or whatever. So we hope it's, we hope it recovers fairly soon. Um, but yeah, we, we'll have to adjust schedules. That's where that will be. We'll just have to figure out what we can push out and try to prioritize uh, the, the critical ones first. Thank you. Yeah. Can you guys hear me? Hey. Can I ask a question or is there someone, is it okay, Justin? You're on mute too, Justin. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's Sorry. Good it was a headset malfunction. Um, Mark, I just had a quick question and, and also just want to add to um, just the the um, just the thanks that of all the things your department does, and I think your department, uh, along with parks, you know, you, you guys do so much visible work for everybody every day in Santa Cruz. So um, just very much appreciate um, what your department does, and you have just wonderful and excellent people who work for you, and um, they're just always thinking about how to do things better. So our uh, our enterprise departments just really serve the city in such an exemplary way. So thank you. I have one quick question, which you probably wonder about, uh, is um, what's the status of the river mouth project? Oh, that's a good question. Um, we're, um, we're probably gonna maintain how we are this year. We're gonna manage the river, but then we hope to go out to bid for it um, in the coming in the let's see it, in the summer we hope to bid we hope to bid it so we hope to have it in place next season is really what the goal is so but yeah everything with COVID-19 kind of threw us out of on a, out of whack so but the, but the state has kept the money and all that there's no risk yeah the money yeah we've been we're still in contact with them on a weekly basis just to keep everybody informed on what's going on great okay thank you thanks for all you're your work welcome. you're welcome all right, Council Member Watkins. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you for the presentation. And I love the idea of expanding the um, the, the PSA and the and the virtual opportunities. Uh, Mark, I just had a quick question in terms of how you will prioritize sort of projects given these limited um, times and constraints financially. Yeah, what, what's going to drive our, our our decision making is always going to be safety. So those will be the first projects we'll, we'll take care of. Um, and then we'll look at um, enhancements after that, but it's going to be a, a safety driven decision. Um, you know, parking is probably going to be the most challenging one just because of revenue and how do we, just the changing environment. We want to work with um, the housing efforts that are going on downtown. So we want to make sure we provide uh, parking facilities for those. Um, and so that's a moving landscape as well. So working with the businesses, working with the you know, development that's going on downtown, um, trying to figure out how we can still work with Metro to get people back on the bus safely. Um, you know, it, we're gonna be very adaptive. We're, we have a very creative group and we're gonna continue to be creative in, in problem solving and how we manage our funds. I wish I could give you a more concrete answer, but that's what I can do right now. No, I, I appreciate that. And I think safety is definitely essential uh, starting place. And I just wonder is, uh, as we start to think about health and all policies, how that could play a, a kind of a factor in um, sort of outlining priority areas and equity and such like that, but safety has to be fundamental. So thank you very much. Okay.
Okay, there's no further uh, questions from council members at this time. I'll turn it over to the public to see if there's any members of the public who have questions about the presentation from Public Works. Uh, if you are on the line, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And when it's your time to speak, you'll hear an announcement that you've been unmuted and the time will be set to two minutes. And so we'll give folks a minute or two if they haven't called in, to call in. And then again, you'll want to press star nine on your phone if you'd like to comment on the Public Works budget presentation. Okay, seeing that there's no callers, uh, I'll just bring it back to council. Uh, council member Matthews. Uh, this is a question for Mark, but probably for Martine Bernal. So you've done a good job of laying out what you do, um, what's in the pipeline, where you see some revenues coming down, some difficulties on some projects. And my question is, when are we gonna get the statistics on that? Will that be for our final budget hearing for the coming, I mean, when do, and I know it's also a moving project and Martine talked yesterday about several mid-year check-ins uh, rather than maybe just one. But when do we start seeing the, the hard choices and decisions? Uh, yes, yeah, so, so the, the process will start with the budget committee, uh, which uh, we've scheduled, I believe we've already scheduled a meeting for that. And um, we will check in with you. Uh, probably the earliest we'll have a, a good amount of data will be in the uh, September check-in. Uh, certainly by budget adoption, uh, whatever we can provide and update you on, we'll do that, which will be the end of June. Um, and then uh, come back to you in December if needed. And, and then again at, at mid-year. Um, there's a lot of uh, obviously uh, uncertainty and a lot of things that are in the works, both on the revenue and expenditure side uh, that uh, will come into play. But uh, the, the major impact of the fund is, is general fund. Uh, and so we'll have to really focus on that. With respect to the parking fund, um, that's another one I think where we'll have to really work really closely with Mark and Mark's group to uh, look at that. Uh, they provide a wide variety of services, as Mark mentioned, uh, that have an impact on the uh, maintenance of our downtown, like garbage collection and uh, sidewalk cleaning and restroom maintenance. So those will be things that we'll have to sort of really look closely. But hopefully we'll be back to you uh, by the uh, September timeframe. Um, uh, and if not earlier, if we, if, we, if we can have something ready for you in June, we will, but it's probably gonna take a little bit, a little bit of time to be able to get back to you with a, a complete set of, of options. All right. Are there any further questions or comments from council members? Seeing none, uh, Mark, thank you again for all the hard work your department's doing. Amazing presentation, um, putting us kind of at the forefront. Santa is at the forefront of a lot of sustainability measures, and so I uh, very much appreciate your presentation and all the work you all have been doing. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next on our agenda is uh, item number two, presentation from our water department. So again, for members of the public who are streaming at this meeting, if this is a presentation you would like to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation by staff followed by questions from the council. You will then take public comment and return to the council for any follow-up questions or comments. And with that, I'll turn it over to our water director, Rosemary Menard. Welcome, Rosemary. Good morning, council members. Thank you for taking the time to hear from us all about our budget. I'm gonna share my screen now and hopefully that will happen. Uh, there we go, a miracle, a technological miracle. 
Um, so I wanted to spend just a few minutes this morning kind of rounding out. Mark gave you a really good overview of a lot of the utility and sort of capital intensive services uh, that the, the city is providing and uh, to support the community and our quality of life here. And I wanted to um, sort of round that out by talking about the water department's um, work in this, in this area. And we have, as you know, a uh, both a robust operating budget and a capital program that we're going to talk about a little bit more today. So with that, I want to just start by talking about our core services. Um, you know, basically, our job is we make and deliver high quality water to 100,000 people. And we, um, you know, we have a lot of experience doing that. It's a complicated process. It requires a lot of ongoing adaptability to as what weather conditions change as well as, uh, you know, hydrological conditions. And I think that we're, you know, we've got a great group of people who produce and deliver the water. It involves science. It involves chemistry. It involves, you know, engineering. It involves operating, you know, on Christmas morning when we're all having other kinds of things going on in our lives. Um, we also provide meter reading billing and prompt and courteous customer service to our customers. Uh, this is a really big priority for us, and I think our staff and the customer services group just do a yeoman's job of, you know, really being responsive and understanding customers, working with customers. And that, too, is a changing set of conditions, both uh, from the economic conditions that we've been experiencing recently. You know, individuals have uh, their own sets of issues that they often come forward when they've got a, a billing problem or a financial problem and our folks really work with folks to try to, you know, keep the water flowing in their houses and make it uh, work for them to pay their bills. Um, we operate, maintain, and when needed, repair or replace water system infrastructure valued at nearly a billion dollars. You know, that's a number when somebody would say, how'd you get that number? I, I can only say that, you know, we have a lot of infrastructure in place and we're, what we're paying to a lot and a lot of our programs and projects that we're working on to um, look at the reinvestment in our system. The price tag is pretty staggering. And I think that is one thing that's really important for our customers and our um, community to understand. This is a really, really valuable, but also an expensive uh, capital intensive infrastructure system in our community. And it's in pretty um, significant need of major reinvestment at this point. So we've been working hard to talk to our customers about that. One of the places where we get a lot of uh, really interesting feedback is I think Cross, our, our community relations specialist, just does this great job in the SHMU review that comes out typically twice a year. And she's got a really na a great knack of being able to make uh, the information about our infrastructure and the choices we're making really relatable. So if you um, get that, that uh, SHMU review, make sure to read it. She does a great job. And then finally, uh, we manage and plan for thousands of acres of land and many other valuable natural resources for long-term sustainability. Unlike a lot of the other departments, our reach of uh, the facilities and the properties and the resources we're managing, you know, extend large, uh, significantly outside the, um, the city limits. And so we end up dealing with, you know, things like, uh, uh, Mount Hermon June beetles or red-legged frogs in the projects that we're working on, whether they're capital projects or they're operational things like how we're managing uh, Loch Lomond. We, uh, we do, uh, you know, quality uh, treatment for the Loch Lomond Reservoir involving all kinds of uh, chemical and fisheries kinds of issues. And so we are really uh, got that whole set of natural resources, land use management kinds of uh, skills that match the, some of those that are, occur in the parks department and in other parts of the you know, city infrastructure, but also for, would match those of much larger systems like San Francisco PUC or East Bay Municipal Utility District or Contra Costa Water District where they have a significant uh, set of resources outside just of their, those in their service area. Um, oh. All right. Um, here's our org chart. Uh, we we have uh, basically 
you know, a number of operating groups. The largest one is the operations uh, division. Chris Coburn manages that for us, and it has water production, distribution, watershed compliance, which includes water resource management and water quality. These are the ones that when you, uh, sorry, when you're looking at the things that we need to be managing on a day-to-day -day basis and the sort of critical um, activities of the during the COVID timeframe, this is where the main action was there, particularly in production and water quality. We have a lot of ongoing regulatory responsibilities for demonstrating that the water is safe. And uh, so between the production of the water itself and the, um, I'm sorry, I should figure out how not to have that happen. Um, between the production of the water itself and the monitoring and testing of it, those were ones that we really, really prioritized making, uh, you know, continuous under the COVID situation. We have an engineering section that's got quite a large um, group of folks involved in the capital planning, um, but also in, um, in environmental planning for the capital projects, obviously finance and administration, uh, we have a new section called utility-wide planning that includes now conservation and uh, utility-wide planning. This is a section I sort of reconfigured when Toby Goddard retired a few months ago. And then we have the customer service section. So apart from the operations sections I mentioned earlier, we have uh, the customer service group has also been a priority project for us or a uh, function for us to maintain during the COVID uh, response. And I think um, Kyle Peterson, who's the manager there, has done a really great job of you know, figuring out how to make things happen uh, with his staff in a remote work uh, situation and also um, figuring out how to utilize his resources in a way that is safe in the field. And that's the meter shop group. So that's, been, that's a really good group of people. This is about 115 people altogether. Um, next, we have, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about key accomplishments in uh, fiscal year 20. So it's obvious the COVID thing has made it clear that now more than ever, safe and reliable water is a critical piece of our being able to maintain public health. And the history of water systems, uh, as we know them today, the public water systems, community water systems, is has a public health as its basis. And this, the COVID situation is a really great example of why this infrastructure is so important to our, our community's health and safety, and also why reliability of this infrastructure and resiliency of this infrastructure as we face conditions that are changing over time uh, really is important. In addition, we are building a 21st century water system, provides reliable service, ready for uncertain future. This is the Newell Creek Inlet Outlet Project, uh, replacement project that you have recently approved and that we are getting ready to mobilize on right now. Uh, it's a huge project involving literally millions of dollars invested in putting a brand new intake in the structure in, in the, um, around the dam at, uh, at Newell Creek Dam and uh, putting a new intake in Loch Lomond that will give us a reliable system for accessing water from this really important, critically important facility under every condition imaginable as we go forward. So this is a, a big project for us that's really getting underway now. And uh, the last thing is planning for and adapting to climate change. We've, we've really experienced in the time I've been here, seven winters now, what I would describe as whiplash weather, that someone else described it that way first. But the bottom line is we go from these really dry conditions, such as we've experienced to some degree this year, to the really wet situations that we experienced in 2017 that involved a lot of damage to our facilities, whether there are our, our transmission, raw water transmission pipelines or our um, critically important coast pump station. These were situations that were every single day we were uh, operating in an emergency um, manner during 2017, trying to understand where the water was gonna come from to make water for people to use tomorrow. And that kind of situation has really, uh, as I said at the time, kind of brought the chickens home to roost with respect to the work that we need to do. Um, our operating budget for uh, fiscal 21 is about $36 million. It's kind of evenly divided between personnel services, which is this big chunk here, 
and uh, the uh, services and supplies. There's, uh, we are doing debt financing for substantial pieces of our um, infrastructure reinvestment. So this is uh, debt service that we've got planned for next year. And then a relatively small pie, a piece of this pie, which is capital outlay. And in, in this terminology, capital outlay means vehicles and uh, you know those kinds of uh, heavy equipment, that kind of thing, as opposed to um, you know, a capital project. So really, uh, this is the cap. This is the operating part of the budget. We're going to talk about the capital budget a little bit further along in the presentation. Um, and then broken down by function, uh, this is water administration and debt. So this is a where you would find that money coming from the debt service I mentioned before in the administration. The administration budget includes our intergovernmental. Uh, um, contributions to the city's uh, services, internal services that you heard about yesterday, finance, IT, HR, we make our contributions to supporting those. It also includes you know, rent for the building that we um, have at 212 Locust. Um, customer service and meter shop, conservation is here. Uh, water engineering, relatively small amount of, of money here because most of the money for the engineering projects is in the capital budget and then the vast majority in the operating uh, budget. And one thing I think to, to mention here that um, is important is to recognize that most of these costs are fixed and they don't change very much whether we sell a lot more water or sell a lot less water. The, our, our sort of general um, differentiation between what's variable and what's fixed of our costs only about 8% of our total cost is variable associated with mainly chemicals and power use. So for example, we're, we're not, even though we're seeing a decline in the water use in the, um, in the commercial sector as a result of the COVID shutdown, we're not having lower costs as a result of selling less water. So I think that's an important concept to keep in your mind, especially as we start talking about you know, rate making on a, for the going forward time frame, And then, um, so what's not status quo about our budget? And this is where the capital uh, program is really anything but status quo for us. Over a number of years, we've been working on, very hard on figuring out how to really take some positive steps forward on our capital program. And we're on the cusp of doing that. We know that the conditions of the, economy have a, a fact, you know, an, an influence on this, but we're proceeding with the, the big projects that we've got underway, uh, the work that we're doing on investing in water supply reliability in the face of climate change. Groundwater storage is one of the big elements of that for us. And we're looking at that both in the um, Santa Cruz Mid-County um, Groundwater Basin, as well as in the Santa Margarita Groundwater Basin. Completed a major study in the uh, Mid-County Basin this last year that gives us a groundwater sustainability plan for that basin that we're really working along with SoCal Creek and the county and the Central Water District in implementing. And I think that gives us some great guidelines for how to proceed with, uh, you know, some kind of a strategy that would improve our ability to store a water that's available in the wintertime uh, that we currently have no place to put uh, so that it can be available for us during drought conditions when we don't have enough water in the system. And then also increasing resiliency by replacing aging infrastructure. This is a little schematic of the uh, project that's getting underway right now uh, to replace the critical pipeline under the San Lorenzo River uh, that's, that's using the former uh, 1220 River Street campsite on the west side and will create another sort of receiving shaft as, as described here over on the east side, kind of at the foot of Crossing Street. And this, this project is also getting underway at the moment and is a really important project for us to improve the res our ability to reliably take water from the river intake and from the coast sources pump it under the river and up to the treatment plant so that we can make potable water uh, from our um, sources of supply. And 
that these two projects are just the sort of the first things that are getting underway. We've got some things going on behind that that we're going to talk about relative. I'm going to go through this chart with you um, very quickly here. So uh, water supply augmentation strategy. This is mostly in the study pilot testing kind of phase right now. So for um, this is $62 million capital budget for us for next year. So that small, relatively small piece of it because we're still finalizing the direction we're moving with that and doing some pilot testing, important pilot testing, particularly in the, um, in the mid county groundwater basin. The, this big pie right, piece of the pie right here, this is the Mill Creek Inlet Outlet um, replacement project. And as you may recall, the bids for this came in in the 60 plus million dollars, the construction part of it. So this, this piece is um, moving forward, has a couple year timeline for construction. And this project is being funded by a low interest loan from the state revolving loan fund, which will give us probably 1.2 to 1.4% interest rate on a long-term borrowing for this project to, to be completed. Uh, raw water diversions to groundwater, or raw water diversions and diversions to groundwater. This is our Laguna um, diversions and some work on groundwater systems that will upgrade or um, make the existing groundwater systems more viable over time. Raw water transmission, this, this bar right here, the, this gold, the goldy color is, um, that's our work on pipelines, the really critical pipelines that bring water from the North Coast sources and bring water from Loch Lomond to the, um, to the uh, treatment plant. And so we know from history and you know day-to-day -day operation that this is, these are vulnerable and we need to be doing some upgrades to that. So that's uh, studying and getting some work underway a little bit on those, on those projects. Surface water treatment, this is continuing work involving um, the, the Graham Hill Water Treatment Plant. We're getting underway in this next um, uh, section, looking at the concrete tanks project, which uh, I think you had, you had an action item a while ago to certify the environmental piece of that project. Um, distribution and metering system, these are important components that we're also moving forward to you know, make that part of our system reliable. And then um, we have this uh, big thing here, which is called water program administration and contingency. This number is big, but it's, it's, way, it's really an administrative way for us to handle the cost of supporting the program. And at the end of each fiscal year, that, that number gets distributed out to the project. So it's not, uh, it's not in fact, you know, just a bunch of money that's sitting there that is, has no purpose. So um, that, that's the kind of overview of what the capital budget um, is for us. And I'd be happy to take your questions. Right, thank you, Rosemary, for that presentation and for all the hard work your department does to ensure that we have clean drinking water. Um, I'll turn it over to council members to see if you all have any questions. And it looks like council member Byers has a question. Rosemary, this is uh, thank you very much for that overview and uh, such a difficult time. But I occurred to me years ago, and maybe I've been out of it, it's been re more recent, uh, did harvesting of trees. Uh, generated quite a bunch of money. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm not promoting we harvest trees, but, but it really is an income and done done right and now everyone knows how you harvest uh, carefully and you know anyway so I don't know whether that's come up but thinking of money and revenue my question <laughs> yeah so um, interesting you should ask that question and timely as well we we have initiated a kind of fire ecology study uh, looking at our the, our lands in the watersheds, um, both in the San Lorenzo, the Zianti watershed, right. we own some land, and then um, the lands that we own more in the North Coast areas. And the goal of that really was to try to get an understanding of the condition of those watersheds, particularly related to wildfire, and what things might need to be done to more sustainably manage those um, those those lands um, against the kind of threat of 
the devastation that would really result from a wildfire in our watershed, for example, the San Lorenzo of the North Creek watershed. Um, the, the water quality implications of a watershed fire would be literally devastating. And we might be in a situation where we didn't have our storage for multiple years following a water um, a wildfire in that area. So we have initiated that work to try to get our uh, hands around what the, um, what the needs might be and what the strategies might be. And then of course, out of that would be, there is some kind of a plan for, you know, sustainable harvest or what have you, then we would understand the financial opportunities there. Thank you. Right. That's my only question. Vice Mayor Myers. Um, Rosemary, I just had a thank you for the presentation and um, your, the work you guys do. Is, um, it's great to have a department that is so enmeshed in engineering and science and producing, you know, our most precious resource, which is our drinking water. So um, your department is very diverse in the way that it's approaching managing that resource, um, but also the resources uh, that create that clean water, including our watershed. So thank you. Um, I just had a question about the debt service. Um, is that tied to our current rate structure and do you foresee any issues with that with um, COVID with regards to some, in, some um, families not being able to, for example, you know, make some of their utility payments? I'm just curious if you have comments yeah. around that. Yeah, so, so we've been looking at it's early days yet in terms of trying to really understand the potential implications of the COVID shutdown on our finances. Um, but we have initiated a, a sort of a look at what, what we're calling account aging. So we know what amount is billed every month and we're trying to assess how much is being paid every month in you know, macro levels as opposed to on a, we're not reporting it out on a um, uh, individual customer basis. But we've seen some impacts, for example, uh, and we've divvied this up into residential, so that's multifamily, single family, business, and then the quote other. And we've seen some, uh, some impacts, particularly in the business category. So we have, we have accounts that are called business general, we have accounts that are called um, business hotel and business restaurant. So that those, those three are all bundled. So we haven't sort of uh, pulled that apart. But I guess what I would say is, um, and Mark made a couple of comments in his uh, comments, particularly related to the solid waste and to the wastewater, how their fund balances and reserves are helping them, would help them to absorb some of those impacts. We certainly are in that situation as well. And in fact, during the 2016 development of the uh, long-term financial plan, the council authorized us to set up a, what's called a rate stabilization reserve in addition to financial reserves that are designed to give us 180 days of uh, operating cash and a $3 million um, emergency reserve. So we have funded those things, but I will tell you that, um, you know, we don't really know for sure what's going to happen with that. And then with respect to the first question you asked about the debt service, um, we, we are in a position during um, 2021, uh, fiscal 21, to you know, be able to service that debt. And, and we need to be obviously looking out for the next sort of five or six years on the long-term financial planning. That work has sort of got underway and we're looking at some timing issues now. But, but fundamentally, we're looking very carefully in, not just to the impacts on us, but sort of more broadly on the utility bill impacts because you know, we're, we're billing in the city for water, wastewater, refuse, and then the franchise fees and the utility tax portion, which goes to the general fund. So all of that is being kind of, um, we're trying to get our arms around what those impacts are. Okay, great, thank you. I can just follow up with that because I, was, I had a similar question because um, I think it would be good to also understand, you know, you have on one hand um, your businesses, for example, that aren't using water and so then they're not paying and so you see a reduction in revenue from that. But then you also have people who are at home who've lost their jobs who are using water 
and then but they're unable to pay their bills. So I think having a good understanding of, of um, where you see reductions from non-operation versus reductions from inability right. to payment will be interesting. The other thing that I was curious about is whether or not there's um, a way to understand how the um, lack of operations at UC Santa Cruz is impacting not only revenue um, and tax generation, but also the water supply in general, since you know we now, I think right now there's only about 2,500 people on yeah. campus out of the roughly 19,500. And so I don't know if you can speak to that or, or um, if that's something that's being taken. Again, it, yeah, yeah, and again, in a kind of you know preliminary because uh, things spill, and then it, you know you have 28 days to pay, so to speak, and so you don't really see the impact of whatever was going on for a little ways out. But we're starting to monitor that. Um, what we're seeing, I think, overall is a slight, modest, modest, but not very huge impact in, uh, increase in residential use and a decrease in business use. Uh, I'm, I don't know that anybody has looked sort of uh, more in, in a more expansive way at UCSC in particular, sort of more bundled in the quote unquote other category. Um, what I will tell you though is while the impact might be big, the portion of their total use of the water in the system is relatively small. So if you take those two factors and you put them together, you know, the cumulative impact of those things might not be as big as you might think just from thinking, oh, there's only, instead of, you know, 20,000 people up there, there's only however many. Um, so I think that's, that is certainly one of the um, things we're looking at. As I mentioned, we're starting to uh, do some work on, a, we brought a contract to you a few months ago on the looking at cost of service and um, next wave financial planning. And that work, will result in a lot of disaggregation and kind of analysis, you know, really deep analysis of uh, how water is being used in the system and who's using what. And it will, it, it, it's work that needs to be done to establish the cost of service basis, but then also following that is, you know, rate structure work that has a whole different set of priorities and goals. So, um, I mean, they link together, but, you know, one builds off the other and they're not a direct thing. So that's one of the big things that we're, we're definitely talking about. And there's a lot of really sophisticated analysis going into our planning, our financial planning in particular. We do have a, what's called a pro forma that is, that takes our operating costs, takes our capital costs, takes our debt service and um, projects out how all those pieces fit together with respect to what kind of revenue increases we want and what kind of um, how we're meeting our financial metrics that were established in the in the financial plan. And that's a very sophisticated product that we work with the Water Commission on and we'll be working with them on um, both before the fiscal 21 budget and then in the future as we start doing the next wave of financial planning. Great. Um, I have um, two other questions. One was, it was great to hear that the uh, 1220 River Street project is moving forward. Just right. wondering, wondering if you could speak to the timeline on that, because I know that was pretty controversial for a while regarding, you know, the camp that was there. Is right. Here, kind of what, yeah. Right. So I, be I believe mobilization is happening right now. And I think that it was, uh, the notice to proceed was issued maybe a couple of months ago in sometime early March, maybe. And the, the COVID thing, you know, created a certain amount of delay. But the goal is to get that project uh, in the ground and finished before it gets into the next rainy season. Because the, there are these huge pits, as the, the little graphic I showed, uh, showed you the pit on the west side where the River Street camp is, is going to be, you know, 70 feet deep and it's 40 to 60 foot diameter or, you know, conditions at the top. And on the other side of the river, because it's lower, obviously, it'll be about 20, uh, 50 feet deep. So the concern was finishing that project in the time where you minimize the potential for those things to become huge pools of water uh, during the rainy season. So we're hoping that we'll be, you know, finished with that project uh, before winter, this coming winter, 
and one that will check a huge box for us in terms of providing reliability uh, to the system, but also will allow us to, you know, have that buttoned up before rainy season. Great. Assuming we have rain, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then my last question um, is around, I know in the past there's been a position that's more or less like a river coordinator. Right. And I know that that's, I mean, I'm not sure that that I would assume that given the impact of COVID that that position might be on hold, but can you speak to kind of what has been happening over time as it relates to that position? Sure. So there was a, a there was a request a few years ago to put in, a, to add a new position, a river coordinator. And so I think in order to, um, to find a place for it that didn't have a general fund impact, it got the position got stuck, got put into my budget um, because theoretically, if it was going to exist in the budgeting way as opposed to an actual way, it would be um, you know all funded by enterprise funds at that point. There was an assumption that was built into that. It was just a way to keep it from becoming an issue on the general fund discussions that were happening that year. Um, for a variety of reasons, it didn't get filled that first year. And the second year, we started to talk about it. Uh, further cuts were happening in the general fund then. And we started to talk about how to, to really ask ourselves a question, what do we want this position to do? And where does it need to be? What level does it need to be um, both administratively housed and also functionally, you know, what are we trying to accomplish with this? And so how do we match up the, uh, what the position needs to do with the level of the position so that it's that it can be effective and that work happened we did some of that work about a year ago uh trying to understand what the needs were there was a lot of um, at that time you may recall about a year ago there's quite a bit of um the homeless issue was really heating up here and a lot of the issues related to some of the goals of the river from the community of you know river activation those kinds of things the conclusion from the work we did internally was that can't be successful until the homelessness issue got better organized and so at that point um we sort of put that on pause and we we've, we've tried to um initiate this back into the hands of now i think the city managers kind of taken over but again the COVID thing and the ongoing set of issues resulting from that have caused a pause in that. The position still is in the water department's budget. You know, in terms of budgeting, it's funded, but uh, I don't know for sure whether or not if it were ever filled, it would be, uh, I don't know that there would be a 100% uh, enterprise funded, um, you know, mechanism for doing that, but it's an open question at this point. Thank you. Uh, looks like Council Member Watkins has her hand raised. Thank you, Rosemary, and thank you for the questions um, that were asked earlier. I think my question is, uh, you know, I definitely kind of piggybacking on Vice Mayor Meyer's comments around this being sort of the ultimate critical infrastructure in terms of uh, our society, right? Um, and then thinking about how, you know, under these COVID circumstances, um, filling some really critical uh, positions and ensuring that yeah. we have the right workforce trained to fill these positions, um, given that there could be, you know, potential uh, for some of our really critical folks doing this work uh, to get ill. So I'm wondering how, you know, you're thinking about that or um, how we can be thinking about that in terms of building that pipeline right. of workforce for you. Yeah, so the, the workforce issue has been a really an interesting one as we've um, gone through the COVID thing. The strategy that we've used, and I know it was used in a couple of other places, particularly in our water quality lab and our, um, and our water treatment facility, was to sort of separate the groups into two teams and have them not overlap at all. So um, scale the, the work so that a half of a team could do whatever work that needed to be done while the other half was working from home or, you know, on some kind of leave at the point, that point. Um, I think what we've done, what we've managed to do is to maintain that isolation of the teams, but also we really shut down the facilities. We, we got ourselves to a place where, you know, you couldn't go to the water treatment plant unless you worked there. 
on a daily basis because we were trying to avoid the cross-contamination and the opportunity for anybody to be ill that would result in, you know, damaging the, our ability to do the, the work we needed to do. Um, I, I think that on a going forward basis, we know we have a number of issues related to key, um, key kinds of skill sets, electricians, instrumentation people, mechanics. These are positions that are very difficult to fill here locally because of lack of the industries that would feed us into that area. We've done some work on growing our own. We need to do some more of that. And we also need to be thinking more strategically in the future. It's definitely on our list. And I think it's one of the areas that we, um, we're beginning to talk about, particularly as it relates to some of the work that we're doing on the capital side. Great, and I, I guess I would just add that, you know, with some of the um, career technical education programs and apprentice programs, I, I really just want to echo how important it would be to yeah. see how we could fill and build that pipeline here on our own. So happy yeah. to work on that moving yeah. forward. Thank you. A couple, a couple of years ago, we did create what's called a utility maintenance tech trainee that is a kind of a combination of on-the-job training and book learning that the, the people in that position go through and some testing at various steps along the way. That was a good model, um, and, it, and it meets the needs very specifically for a particular facility. But I think there's some bigger picture things that we could start doing. Great. Thank you. All right. Uh, looks like we don't have any further questions from council members. So if there's any member of the public who is watching and would like to comment on the water budget presentation, um, there should be some phone numbers on your screen that you can call into. And once you've called in, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And when it's your time to speak, you'll hear an announcement that you've been unmuted and the time will be set to two minutes. So if there's any members of the public, now's the time to call in on the water budget presentation. We'll give folks a couple minutes to see if anybody wants to call in. Jason, are we on uh, channel 25 today? Yes. Thank you, I thought so, but yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, seeing that there's no members of the public who want to comment on this item, I'll bring it back to council to see if there's any further questions or comments. Council Member Brown. Yeah, thank you. I um, thank you, Rosemary, for the presentation. Um, you know, my, my big question is how in the world are you going to um, continue to function and um, be successful in this uh, environment? But I think that I'll save that. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, I know you'll you'll work very hard to, to figure it out, and, and we'll we'll get through. Um, I and my questions have been answered, asked and answered. So I appreciate all the questions from my colleagues. Um, you know, mine were kind of around the debt service question and um, and labor workforce issues. So. I um, mean, thank you, Councilmember Watkins, for uh, making that suggestion about ROP. Um, and so, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you for all everything you all do. It's pretty amazing. I'm sorry we can't do those tours this year, yeah. um, but because it's pretty amazing um, for those yeah. who haven't been on it. Um, uh, but um, look forward to hearing how you uh, how you manage as we proceed. Thanks so much. We're, we're in good hands, so thank you. Thank you so much. We have a great team, and I really want to acknowledge the, all the work that they've done. And I, what I would say to sort of echo something Mark said is there's a lot of creative problem solving going on in, in our city and certainly in my organization. And I think that that is really a sign of a strong organization that we have all have a, every right to be really proud of. Uh, Council Member Matthews. I, I just can't let you go off screen without thanking you and your team. 
<laughs> it's a spectacular report. It, it never fails to impress. And um, your combination of customer service on the micro level and very long-term, very big picture thinking is so impressive. Thank you so much. All right. With that, uh, thank you again, Rosemary, for the presentation and all the hard work you do. Everybody is obviously very appreciative. And uh, with that, I think we'll move on to our next presentation. Thank you. Good day. Okay, next item up on our agenda is item number three, our third presentation of the morning. It's going to be from Parks and Recreation. So as members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is a presentation you would like to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation by staff followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to council for any follow-up questions or comments. I just wanna let uh, council members know, and staff and, mem and uh, members of the public know that roughly around uh, noon, we're gonna likely take a break for, so folks can have lunch. Um, but we will um, revisit that as we get closer in time. Just wanted to give a heads up for folks who uh, might be wanting to have a lunch break around now. And with that, um, I will turn it over to our Parks and Rec Director, Tony Elliott, to provide the budget presentation today. Welcome, Tony. All right, thank you, Mayor and City Council members. This is Tony Elliott, uh, Parks and Recreation Director. I'm here with Lindsay Bass, our Principal Management Analyst. Um, and together we'll walk through our fiscal year 2021 uh, budget summary. Uh, so I'd like to introduce Lindsay to start us off. Great, thank you so much, Tony. And um, just to get us started, good morning, Council members. Wanted to give you a quick snapshot of um, what, we'll be co what we will be covering today. So I'll run you through. Um, a very quick uh, department overview. I'll cover the core services that the department provides along with some annual uh, numbers around the impact that we have each and every year. Um, then I'm gonna pass it off to Tony and he's gonna walk you through a few of our key uh, fiscal year 2020 key achievements. Um, he'll talk through the working status quo budget that we put forward as well as some of the challenges that we see around that budget, especially given the current atmosphere. So with that, we'll get going. The City of Santa Cruz Parks and Recreation System is world-class and unique. We have much to be proud of. Um, beyond the facts that you see up on the screen, uh, I'm just gonna emphasize a few of these um, and then we'll let you guys um, peruse this in greater detail um, later. But um, as a starting point, uh, combined our parks, beaches, and open spaces cover over 1,700 acres. That's about 17% of the land area of the city of Santa Cruz. It's triple the national average of parkland per capita, which means we're managing about 26 acres of parkland per thousand residents. Um, given that massive and impressive system, we also attract um, through that uh, world-class system nearly three million people who are here to visit our places, enjoy our programs, <laughs> and attend a wide variety of really unique creative events that we put forward. And then down at the bottom of the graphic, uh, you know, we also, um, with that large um, and impressive system, you know, try to be very careful stewards of um, the natural resources that are embodied within that. So within our park system and the irrigated um, areas within that system, the volumetric water budget that we're assigned every year, we only use 43% of that. You know, So we try to be very, very careful with how we use our water across our system. Um, and that translates into a water savings of over 2,500 Olympic size swimming pools. So, um, really trying to uh, provide great recreation, but also um, be stewards of um, those 1,700 acres. Now I'm gonna run you through uh, some of the core services of our department, and you'll see here that uh, we are organized into two major, or three major groups, apologies. Um, the first being our recreation department. And uh, this is the department that brings uh, really creative uh, core service programming for youth, teens, adults, and seniors in the community. So um, summer camps, um, junior guards, 
uh, sports and beaches programming. You know, this is the type of programming that's happening in our facilities, but also within our park system. Um, they also put forward um, over 125 unique events every year. Um, and right now, in the current environment, the team is also really, you know, bringing a new level of creativity to what we do in figuring out how we provide um, recreation and programming in a virtual um, capacity um, for both those different uh, service groups, but also through our events. Um, in addition to the types of programming that they do in our places and in our parks, we're also beginning to look at how they can help the, co the community in a COVID-19 environment um, uh, enjoy those spaces in a safe manner, right? So uh, we have a group that is serving as West Cliff hosts and beach hosts to help folks understand how they can be in those places right now in a safe and socially distant uh, manner. Uh, they're also, in many respects, our key and connection to lots of community groups. Um, so we really see community partnership as critical to our ability to get our work done. Um, these involve connections with Nueva Vista, the Natural History Museum, Coastal Watershed Council, um, engagements with the Surfing Museum. Um, in addition, we also work with our Friends and Parks and Recreation group um, to put forward scholarships each year so that we're trying to create opportunities for underserved um, folks to have access, equitable access, to the awesome programming and events uh, that we host every year. Um, and finally, uh, this is the group that also um, promotes uh, sponsorships and does a wide variety of outreach and communications and marketing around uh, the work that our department does. Moving right along to this um, center group, our parks department um, there at the Mike Fox State Park, which was one of our big um, projects this year to improve the, the coping there. Um, and this group um, is one of our larger groups in the department. Um, they're responsible for refuse and green waste removal from all of our parks, beaches, and open spaces. Um, and that's a wide, vast system. They also take care of all of the amenities that are included within that 1,700 acres of park system. That includes bathrooms, ball fields, pools, um, our Harvey West pool, the disc golf courses that we operate, um, the De La Viega golf course, the wharf, um, which is the longest wooden wharf in the U.S., um, our skate parks, playgrounds, um, various sports courts, um, and uh, over 35 miles of hiking trails and pathways. Uh, they also do a wide variety of plant, turf, and small tree care. Um, they issue tree permits and inspections um, and do a variety of system planning, environmental compliance, as well as our large project management. And then to bring it home, the administration department um, is kind of the public connection to the community. So um, our main line provides service assistant. Um, we take in permit requests. Um, registrations um, for events and programs, uh, and also help facilitate things like responses to public information requests. Uh, we do budgetary planning, revenue fiscal processing, um, as well as, as advisory body support, um, and a wide variety of um, uh, permitting as well. Recently bringing on board um, the city special events um, group. So a lot happening. Uh, within the department. Uh, within those three areas, you'll see a bit more here with our org chart how we are organized and some of the different functional areas within those three different divisions. Um, as we move into fiscal year 21, um, our organization is staying largely the same um, with the exception of a cost-neutral reorganization that will take effect in fiscal year 21 in our parks division. So you can see that outlined in um, the shaded box there on the right side of the screen. Who could argue with this statement? <laughs> Especially right now. Um, COVID-19 has really underscored how much our community and our visitors love the environments, experiences, and programs that our department offers. Um, and the following few slides are just a snapshot of the impact that we have on the community each and every year.
So we take in about um, 7,000 annual reservations um, for people to uh, uh, have fun and play in our spaces. That equals or translates into about 335,000 experiences of folks um, across our park system. This past year, we also completed over $300,000 um, in capital improvement projects. And just to give you a sense of um, some of the, the major features of um, those projects, that included um, new bike park ramps um, at our uh, bike park. Um, it also included a new playground at Harvey West, which you're looking at on the screen. Uh, we replaced the skate park coping at the Mike Fox um, skate park. Uh, also uh, improved and put in a new retaining wall on the Cliff Street walkway that's beautiful, um, have really improved that as a transportation pedestrian corridor in the city. And then finally, um, uh, partnered with uh, the city of Santa Cruz on some gymnasium updates um, for the Natural Bridges Gymnasium. So again, um, that component of partnerships being really critical to our ability to serve the community. I mentioned uh, the role of the parks team in stewarding um, those 1,700 acres. So every year that team on average removes more than 200 tons of refuse and about 126 tons of green waste from that system. Um, this is one of our trucks on West Cliff Drive and on West Cliff Drive alone we have 32 waste receptacles that need to be serviced regularly. So a massive job, but wanting to make sure that that experience for those 3 million visitors um, that, that play in our system every year um, have um, uh, an enjoyable experience um, without uh, any refuse. In addition, over 137,000 folks participate in our events, classes, and programs. Um, you can see here. Um, some hula happening out on the wharf during the Aloha Polynesian Festival. So that's just um, a quick snapshot um, of some of our annual impact, and now I'm going to pass it off to Tony so he can take you through um, a few of our key accomplishments from fiscal year 20. All right, thank you, Lindsay, and yeah, thank you, council members. Um, just wanted to uh, really build upon what Lindsay described is really uh, our day to day. A lot of what uh, was described is uh, operationally what we do uh, day in and day out. But a couple of the achievements um, on top of the daily operations uh, that we wanted to highlight. The first one is a result of a CAL FIRE grant that we uh, received um, and completed planting of 500 trees this year. Um, through that, uh, we also did a tree inventory across the city of 25,000 trees. Um, engaged uh, 10 different organizations and over 250 volunteers engaged through tree planting uh, across the city. Most recently, uh, in light of the COVID-19 public health emergency, we have also uh, created a virtual recreation uh, platform and program um, that really kind of led the way in the Central Coast area, really led the way across the state um, in terms of how to provide recreation during this really unique and unprecedented time during the public health emergency. So. This, I think, is a testament to the creativity and innovation and adaptability of our Parks and Recreation staff and coming up with this virtual recreation platform. In a very short time, um, we have served thousands of people through our virtual recreation offerings. In the first six weeks, we served uh, over 1,000 seniors um, in particular, um, which is great through a variety of, uh, of classes and opportunities. And we continue to provide uh, opportunities through virtual recreation and add new content um, uh, weekly. And uh, some of those include, uh, you may have seen on social media in different places, um, walking tours around the community with our city arborist, Leslie Keedy, uh, doing a tree walk um, to a variety of, of classes and exercise opportunities. So this is something that's been so successful um, and really created in a very short amount of time but something that we'll plan to keep um, into the future. And in fact, some of the programs that we will work on this summer, for example, junior guards. Um, unfortunately, we won't be able to run junior guards this summer in a way that we've done in the past, but we will have opportunities virtually uh, for people still to think about junior guards and train, uh, learn water safety, and prepare for upcoming years 
uh, through things like Junior Guard. So this is a platform, um, really, I think that's not even just necessarily specific to Parks and Rec, uh, but as Mark Dettel mentioned earlier, with opportunities for tours at other city facilities or uh, uh, through tours or engagement with our partners, the Museum of Natural History uh, or others. This is really a, an open gateway for our community to experience uh, recreation and learn uh, moving forward. So we're really excited about that achievement this year. So covering our budget, getting into the numbers here as we look at fiscal year 2021, uh, our 21 status quo budget is a little over 17 million, and you can see how that's broken out um, pretty simply in the graph here on the screen. About 11 million of the 17 uh, is for personnel services. On our revenue target, so trending over the past few years, we typically bring in about $5.4 million in revenue uh, per year against the uh, 17 million um, in expenditures. Um, what we're looking at heading into fiscal year 20, uh, the current fiscal year, and then heading into the new fiscal year, is likely a reduction um, in that revenue, a, a decreased number in that revenue target. And that's due to the COVID-19 uh, health emergency hitting in quarter four of the current fiscal year and quarter one of the upcoming fiscal year, which are really uh, typically um, strong revenue quarters, the, really the strongest revenue quarters for the department. So we will see uh, some decreased revenue. What I'll mention though in context uh, is that in fiscal year 20, um, our fiscal year 20 budget was approximately 17.1 million. And through salary savings and water savings, as Lindsay mentioned earlier, um, and just great, uh, a great deal of efficiency across the department, we're actually giving back about $1.3 million of our budget back to the general fund in the current fiscal year. So while our budget was 17.1, our estimated uh, year-end expenditure will be about $15.8 million at the end of this year. Uh, so just wanted to put that in a little bit of context as we head into the new fiscal year. I um, also wanted to mention the, the second bullet point on the screen here is that uh, our cost recovery as a department um, trends around 38% annually uh, compared to the national average, which is about 27% uh, in cost recovery. This is an area actually that we think we can improve. We're working on a revenue policy and a variety of strategies as we move in to fiscal year 21 and beyond to find ways where we can generate additional revenue uh, in areas where we haven't necessarily gener generated revenue in the past. Um, and, but but the meantime, in the meantime, making sure that our rates and fees are very low um, for our community members um, and making uh, as many free offerings as we can to the public. So being very thoughtful and strategic about where we can generate revenue without uh, uh, impacting our community members. And this is especially critical heading into the new fiscal year uh, in light of the COVID-19 emergency. Uh, we recognize uh, the critical nature of parks. I think we've all seen photos of how empty our beaches have been recently uh, in uh, comparison uh, to what they are typically this time of year. So uh, this public health emergency has just highlighted the importance of our trails and our parks and our beaches, but we wanna make sure as we head into the new fiscal year that we're providing those services to the best extent we can and at very low, uh, if no cost, uh, to our community members to make sure they can get out for their physical and mental health uh, and in an affordable way. The greatest asset that we have uh, in the Parks and Recreation Department and in our system um, are our people, our staff. Um, so as you saw in the budget, the vast majority of our annual budget um, is for our uh, people. We have. In a status quo environment, 87.25 full-time employees, uh, or FTEs, I should say. Um, and the one thing I wanted to highlight with this is part of our savings in the current fiscal year, a lot of that is due to vacant positions that we have. And so we're gonna continue uh, to keep many positions vacant as we move into the new fiscal year as a result of the hiring freeze. Um, that presents some certain challenges and pretty specific challenges for us as we head into the new fiscal year. Um, uh, and, and really our ability to get work done, and that's uh, our ability to maintain parks and keep parks open, um, our ability to provide uh, core services um, in terms of serving youth and teens, adults and seniors. So 
with reduced staff, um, it will um, uh, be a challenge for us as we head into this new year. But again, that creativity and that uh, innovative spirit of the Parks and Recreation team, that can-do spirit in the department will, uh, will carry us through uh, into the new year. But this will be really critical for us to continue to work with the city council and the city manager's office to define, help define how we prioritize uh, with fewer staff and fewer resources into the future um, uh, and with ongoing uh, changes to our operations as a result of COVID-19. Um, there's a lot that we'll have to work together on uh, to prioritize and, and how we serve the community. So I wanted to cover capital improvement um, briefly here. Um, we this year spent about $300,000 on capital improvement projects that Lindsay highlighted a little while ago. And big picture though, I wanted to mention that we, um, although we're investing about $300,000 per year through uh, dedicated sources of revenue, uh, for Parks and Recreation Capital through our Quimby Fund and Park Facilities Tax. Um, that 300000 really is, is a pretty minimal amount. As you can see on the chart here, we have approximately $12 million in uh, unfunded and, and deferred maintenance across the park system. Uh, the lights uh, on the ball field and the image here are one of our deferred maintenance items. These lights are 30 years old and um, are, are not very efficient lighting fixtures and um, are something critical that we need to fix among many other things. This number doesn't include big uh, ticket items uh, that may result from the Santa Cruz Wharf master plan, uh, big ticket items associated with the Civic Auditorium, um, considering a, a future renovation of the Civic Auditorium. Um, those are big dollar items um, as, the, as you all know. Uh, so this is really just deferred maintenance um, in the, uh, uh, within the park system. And then some of our status quo challenges, again, I've hit on these a little bit, but deferred maintenance and unfunded CIP, similarly to what uh, Public Works uh, mentioned as well, again, with uh, at least $12 million of deferred maintenance um, and limited opportunity through Quimby and park tax uh, to fund those. That will be an ongoing challenge. Uh, related to everything from um, ADA accessibility uh, to public safety um, and efficiency of our facilities and so forth. Uh, we continue to have new demands from the public uh, through our Parks and Recreation Master Plan and the different master plans we have for properties across the city. Uh, we, uh, we continue to have uh, goals and new demands from the public. So in the image here is pickleball, um, uh, the idea of a, a dedicated pickleball court somewhere in the community um, is, uh, is highly desired by, uh, by many in our community. So we, we continue to have new demands, and so how we fund those in the future uh, is an ongoing question. Uh, staff safety um, has been a major priority and consideration for us in the past year. Um, we unfortunately have had um, some challenging situations with our staff in the, uh, in the field with, um, um, with, with frankly, some, uh, some assault uh, issues or threats in the field and so staff safety uh, is a huge priority for us and we're working with the Parks and Recreation Commission that has a subcommittee on staff safety and we're doing a lot more tracking um, and collecting data more than we ever have before but staff safety making sure we have the proper equipment um, and making sure we have communication tools are going to be really critical moving into the future and as I mentioned staff vacancies um, are uh, are a critical um, uh, issue for us and um, uh, not having our full staff is going to be a challenge as we move into the full year. So again, I just wanted to kind of frame some of these key things that we'll be looking at into the new year and uh, just hope and, and look forward to working with the City Council to be really creative uh, on how we address these, how we prioritize the needs um, and allocate resources to uh, uh, continue to provide services uh, to our community. So with that said, we're happy to answer any questions uh, that you all might have. Thank you. Thank you, Tony, for the presentation and for all the great work your department continues to do. Uh, are there any questions from council members at this time? Council member Byers. Oh, thanks, Tony. What a wonderful overview. And it's always fun looking at pictures, too, of our, our town. Um, uh, De La Viega Golf Course, I believe, opened maybe just a week. Do you have any feedback on how that's going? 
Yeah, thank you. A great question. Uh, it's been going really well. We have virtually sold out the tee sheets uh, over the past week. There's been a lot of uh, pent up demand at the golf course. We have, um, we've been somewhat limited based on the most recent county public health order. We're limited to groups of two at the moment um, mm -hmm. and uh, aren't able to use golf carts uh, at the moment. So we're working with the county health officer um, to hopefully be able to get groups of four uh, playing up at the golf course. It's a really exciting time at the golf course. It's the 50th anniversary um, mm -hmm. this year of, of the golf course and uh, the restaurant is uh, really completed and ready to open any time. Uh, we also, last year, as a result of the budget meeting, completed a golf course operations plan where we identified uh, strategic steps on increasing um, uh, our fees at the golf course and finding some efficiencies uh, to get as close as we can to a break-even point at the golf course. So we've got a lot in the works that's really been on hold um, as a result of the, the public health emergency. But so far it's been going really well, very uh, very busy, and we look forward to opening up full scale. Great, thanks. Uh, next question. Um, the Trust for Public Land, you're a nationwide uh, environmental, sustainable, open space group. Um, I know it's doing a nationwide project where they have come out that uh, every child should live within a 10 minute walk of a park. And so they're moving into communities assessing that and I believe uh, they might be doing Watsonville. I don't know whether you've heard of it. Um, if not, pay attention to it uh, because it would be wonderful if they would target us and just, you know, what they do is just analyze it and give you advice. Or, just tell you the facts. So, so I guess my question, I don't know whether you heard of it or they contacted us. We've heard of it, yeah, thank you. That's a great point. And as Lindsay mentioned earlier, we have um, uh, about three times the, the park acreage per capita of the, the national average. And um, um, and I think overall we've got uh, a pretty, pretty good accessibility to our parks across the city. The 10 minute, um, Walk Challenge is something that our trade organization, the National Recreation and Parks Association, uh, they're a big advocate um, of that program as well. So yeah, this is something very much on our radar and if we can connect with the Trust for Public Land, um, certainly for resources or just kind of working together to, uh, um, to help define what we have and where it is and communicate that to our community so they're aware of all the assets uh, and amenities we have. Um, uh, we love that idea and, and um, and uh, would be happy to champion that forward. Uh, that statistic you just gave out about acreage, uh, thanks to our green belt and all the past councils who helped purchase those green belts. That's all my questions. Yeah, one, one detail that I'm just seeing here in my notes is um, we do, uh, I guess we do have this assessment in place uh, already and 96% of our oh, residents okay. are within a 10 minute walk of a park. Oh, wow. Great, thank you. Um, moving on, Council Member Brown. Hi, thank you. Um, thank you, Lindsay and Tony for the presentation. Thank you for all the work you've been doing to try to make uh, the Parks and Rec experience uh, accessible to people through uh, virtual activities. Um, it's uh, the virtual uh, page and all the opportunities there. It's really amazing. So if folks haven't looked at it, I really highly recommend you do fun at home. Like, have some fun at home while we're all sheltered in place. You know, the photo challenge, all of these things are, you know, really awesome. And uh, so I want to applaud you for those. I do have a question about how you're approaching, uh, because we know that there are people in our community, young kids in our community who don't have access to, uh, you know, they don't have stable access to uh, the virtual world. Uh, and so I'm wondering, and I know that those programs are really important for low-income families, for some low-income families out here in the summer and, um, and others. Uh, but I'm just wondering about the, the folks who are kind of not um, as plugged into the virtual world. Have you thought about how you're um, going to try to make opportunities available for them? 
And then and the other question that I have, well, I have a couple other questions, but um, I'll just start with that one. Yeah, that's a great question. And um, if I understand your question, so one thing I want to hit on is that we've uh, been providing a, a daycare, I think as the council knows, uh, through the COVID uh, emergency for essential city personnel. Um, uh, so again, something we've sort of adapted to provide. Um, but I'd like to, I think Rachel Kaufman, our recreation superintendent is out there. I'd like to uh, connect with Rachel. Um, and this I feel uh, is, pretty well in line with what our team at the Loud Nelson Community Center, what they uh, tend to do. I'm not sure if we have specific plans on that just yet, but I'd like to connect with Rachel here for any feedback. Yes, thank you, Tony. Uh, council members, I hope you can hear me. It's Recreation Superintendent Rachel Kaufman. And uh, this was certainly something that we looked at with our seniors when we moved all of our senior classes online. And we have uh, staff dedicated to helping seniors, even if it's one-on-one, -on -one, to access you know, our online programs. And we've been so successful with that in the effort and dedication that we've devoted to that. Um, as Tony mentioned, that's been highly successful and we hit that 1,000th mark of participation in those online programs. And we do see those programs as something that will continue. It um, has been um, one of our kind of shining programs that we really see. We've always um, wanted to delve into that online world for our seniors. And you know, while this has forced us to do so, we have really seen the benefits of that um, for people who are unable to access the center for various reasons that they have really tapped into our program. So um, we're happy with that. And then as far as with our youth programs and access, our recreation team is working collaboratively with the whole county of Santa Cruz on uh, programs for youth because we do see that there is this huge change in our services and need. And so we're all working to um, help one another to both create programming that fits within the public health order as well as uh, find grants and look for grant opportunities um, to increase access for youth. So this will continue um, to be work that we um, will, or that will continue and that we do meet regularly, uh, weekly with County, Santa Cruz, Watsonville Parks and Recreation, Capitola, Scotts Valley um, to both, you know, create programming and kind of see what others are doing and what resources are out there. So it definitely feels like a team spirit and collaborative atmosphere because what we all see and what we all hear from parents is that childcare has become a huge issue and need within the community. Um, and so we are looking at ways that we can help parents with that. Thank you. Uh, so my other question is about the golf course. I've been tracking this for a while now, as you know. Um, I'm just wondering if, in terms of how, I know we were trying to move towards, uh, you know, cost neutral on the golf course operation, and we have quite a long way to go. I imagine some of that water budget savings was related to the brownouts that we, um, you all uh, uh, proposed and we approved. And so I'm just wondering, like, are we still moving closer to that now? Um, do you see that um, taking more time? Um, I know it's probably too early to tell how, you know, what exactly how we're gonna proceed, but I'm just wondering what you're thinking about that in, in terms of how we move forward. Uh, uh, to not, because it's, it does cost the city quite, you know, the taxpayers quite a bit of money, and um, I know it's a valuable resource, and um, I'm just hoping that we can kind of keep moving in that direction. We don't get derailed. Yeah, I think that's a great point, and uh, we uh, continue, to, as I mentioned, uh, with the operations plan, continue to take steps forward in accordance with that plan, and so I think with the new restaurant coming online, with the increased rates that we really hadn't increased, uh, in over a decade, uh, that's gonna uh, certainly have an impact. Um, we've just seen more demand as well. So before COVID um, hit, um, our use at the golf course uh, this spring was outstanding. We were on a just kind of a different tra uh, trajectory to start the year, which was great. 
And for what it's worth, even when we closed the golf course, we um, uh, we had hundreds of people playing a day at the golf course, even when it was uh, closed. Um, uh, <laughs> we didn't want that to last exactly, but the demand is there. And I think the amenities uh, are there. We continue to invest in those so with the new restaurant and so forth. It is expensive uh, to operate, uh, as you mentioned, um, but it is our highest, uh, one of our highest cost recovery, uh, I'll call it an, uh, an enterprise within the department. So we cost recover at the golf course about 75%, and I do think that we've got um, a lot of opportunity to get that much closer to, to 100% in the coming years. But it's a matter of getting the golf course back open, um, increasing rates, keeping our water usage really low, um, and um, you know that, that balance of revenues and um, and decreasing expenditures. Beyond that, we could have a long discussion about the De La Viega as a whole. But the disc golf course, um, we host about 40 to 50 thousand rounds of, of disc golf um, at the park per year, and that's an area of our operation that um, I think we have a lot of opportunity, and we're working closely with the disc golf. Uh, club and association here in Santa Cruz to figure out how we can better manage that and potentially bring in some revenue there as well. So with, with the variety of offerings that we have at the golf course and, and the park as a whole, I think there are opportunities for us to be much closer to cost neutral. Thank you. And um, I'll save my questions on the pool for another time, but um, I'd love to <laughs> talk with you about how we're going to move forward on that um, under the circumstances. I mean, we made a great start, and you know it's a goal to get the Harvey West pool reopened when we uh, for uh, longer hours and public access. Um, so I'll check in with you about that soon, hopefully. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Golder. Hi. Um, sorry, I went outside to see the F-16s. I'm still waiting. They haven't arrived yet. My question is regarding the seven vacancies. I was wondering if those are full FTE positions or are those some of the um, summer um, camp coordinators, that kind of thing, or are those positions going imp to impact your day-to-day -day operations if left vacant? Yeah, that's a great question. Those are full-time employees, those seven vacancies. Um, we have about a 13% vacancy rate on our park maintenance team uh, right now, um, uh, which, uh, which may have an impact um, on how we operate uh, moving into this new fiscal year. The type of things that we're working on, um, and I don't have great detail on, on this at this point, but what we're working through, again, in the spirit of just being creative, is we recognize that um, uh, some of our recreation team, for example, at the Civic Auditorium, um, the Civic will be will be quiet likely for a while with the the um, direction from uh, county and, and state health on mass gatherings and events. So we're working to move our Civic Auditorium uh, staff over to parks uh, to fill in some of those roles uh, to help temporarily um, on park maintenance. And so, um, in terms of temp staff or seasonal staff. Um, we hire over 100 uh, temp staff or seasonal staff per year um, for things like summer camps, uh, junior guards, um, and for park maintenance uh, as well. And so um, right now we have, um, we're on a, essentially a furlough of our temp and seasonal staff, so we have not hired um, virtually any of them or, or hardly any of them. Um, we may hire a few temp or seasonal staff coming into the summer. Um, to help support with uh, the summer camp, the summer day camp that we plan to offer. But that 100 plus staff that we typically hire, that will be a tiny fraction of what we hire moving into the summer. Thank you, and thank you for the presentation and thanks to everyone in your department for all their hard work. Thank you. All right, I'll pass it over to Vice Mayor Myers. Uh, mute. I'm always on mute. Okay. Why I, sorry about that. Um, yeah, Tony and Lindsay, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I have just a couple of quick questions. Um, you mentioned the Quimby Fund and the Park Improvement Fund, and 
I believe those, could you just give me a little background on um, are those allocations from the state or where where are we getting those revenues from? I'm just curious about um, your future with regards to any kind of capital, smaller capital improvements for next year. That's a good question. The Quimby Fund and the Park Facilities Tax are essentially impact fees. Uh, that are tied in with building permits uh, development that occurs around the city. Uh, so those are our, our local funds um, that, uh, again, are, come through uh, the, the building permit process. And so um, we have, um, we do have some funds available and we have um, a number of smaller projects that uh, are, uh, are appropriated uh, based on those funds. Um, including things uh, like investments in, in trails and investments in, we've got a small uh, appropriation for pickleball courts of about $50,000. Um, and then we do reserve those funds as well. We hold a percentage of those in the spirit of uh, pursuing grant opportunities as well. So we hold a portion of those back in the case that we apply for a large state grant and we need to provide a 20% match, for example, um, that's a, a pool that we could draw from uh, in pursuing large grants. But those are really local funds uh, from development uh, that occurs across the city um, as part of an impact fee that we can invest uh, for um, renovations or, or new park amenities across the park system. And um, Tony, the other question I had, okay, so, and then are you guys, um, are you able to sustain any grant writing during this time where you're just, you know, just, just a bad time? Um, is there any, I, I just don't know if that's, if that's available to your department in terms of internally using any of, of your staff for that kind of work. I do know that, you know, some of the infrastructure improvements in the state, you know, at least getting people construction of trails and other things. Um, I think can, will continue to be somewhat of a priority in terms of the bond funds from Prop 68, but I'm just curious if you have that capability um, or if we're gonna lose that capability during this period. That's a great question. Uh, we, we have that capability um, uh, and, and really expertise. Uh, Lindsay Bass, we've been fortunate to bring on this year and uh, Lindsay has that expertise uh, and bandwidth. Over the past year, we yeah we applied for Prop 68 funds. Unfortunately, we didn't receive Prop 68 funds this year. Uh, but Lindsay, um, in her uh, short time here, less than a year, has already, uh, in partnership with Public Works, secured about a quarter million dollar uh, grant through Cal Recycle uh, to do uh, cleanup work and, and waste management uh, waste management work across the park system. So we do have that capability and capacity. Um, and again, just from a, a match standpoint, the Quimby and Park Tax Facility Funds um, are a source for a match. And then also through our uh, OPTS, our other professional technical services within our operating budget, that's also a source of funds that we can utilize uh, to, uh, for uh, contractual support and grant writing um, or um, you know, application um, uh, support for fees and, and so forth. Okay. Okay. That's good to hear. And really glad you're on board, Lindsay. It is um, times like these where, uh, you know, having the ability to potentially pull in some additional funding. I guess my last question is um, uh, status um, of wanting just to confirm that the state funding for Poganip is secure in terms of the cleanup. Um, it doesn't sound like that's changed. Um, I know in the last in the last issue, when we in 08, some of the, the, the state actually took back some of those funds or froze those. Is that work? I know you can't probably do the work because of the COVID-19 issue, but are those um, funds for the cleanup at Pogan up still secure for the homeless garden project? Yes, they're still secure, and we're moving forward on that assessment right now with the State Department of Toxic Substance Control uh, to assess the property at Poganip, and then this summer we should have uh, an idea of uh, the sort of characterized uh, nature of the property at Poganip, and then we can decide um, in partnership with Homeless Garden Project what it's going to take to remediate um, the property. Um, their goal is to get in uh, to the property, really start doing infrastructure work this year with the goal of uh, beginning farming by spring of 2021. Uh, so we continue to move forward in partnership with Homeless Garden Project on that effort. 
Okay, great. Well, thank you for your all your work in your department, and um, um, I'm 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 worried about the safety of our park folks, and um, I think that that is one of the hard things that we we need to really keep track of. Your your employees have been. Um, Frankly, they've been at great risk in some situations this past year, and um, you know, I, I I I find that to be very hard to um, to acknowledge. And um, I think we need to really understand um, what uh, you know what 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 kinds of exposure your um, staff are having. And uh, I'm, I'm I'm very appreciative of the planning uh, of the Parks Commission taking that up. Um, it's something that we really need to pay attention to, and uh, we need to keep, keep our parks folks, folks safe. So thank you for your presentation. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Walker. Great. Thank you. I'll just echo um, our appreciation for the presentation and just the work that your team does and um, year round and parks definitely make life better. So I will echo that that comment. Um, I just had a few a few comments and then one brief question. The first is that I think as we look at the budgets and I know um, we had some follow up to do in terms of the children's fund, but there's opportunity there to see how we could use that resource to really prioritize equity and access for um, not only child care and um, getting the needs of our essential workers uh, child care needs met, but also access for those who are struggling to access our, our services during this time. And um, so I, I just sort of want to offer that. I also just want to applaud your department and the city for being the first in our uh, in our in our county to create a uh, pop-up child care facility for our essential workers and um, just really recognizing that critical need I, I have like a partial like grieving a little bit in that I am um, so many of these wonderful programs that we just um, define our community in terms of like the junior guards and stuff like that it's uh, it's really it's it's a, it's a hard it's a hard hit for sure and um, just really recognizing how great you've been at being able to pivot it during this time. Um, the one brief question I want to um, I want to ask. Well, before I ask the question, I also just want to offer one resource: is that the Child Development Resource Center is really working hard to try to connect people to existing child care facilities that are operating at this time. Um, some places are still in operation with uh, not enough uh, enrollment, and so they're really looking at how to connect those looking for child care uh, to existing child care facilities. So I just sort of want to offer that resource to those who may be listening that are needing child care at this time, and it's the Child Development Resource Center. And then the brief question I had um, is one, I do want to follow up in, in regards to the pool, and then two, um, how, what is the timeline in, in associated with the disc golf course reopening? I have some folks who've been wanting to track that a little bit. Yeah, thank you very much for all those points. And um, oh gosh, yeah, I'd like to address all those, but I know in the interest of time, I'll, I'll move on from those. But I, pre I just want to acknowledge one really quickly, the Children's Fund um, is held by our Friends of Parks and Recreation. And I think that's a really great point in terms of utilizing those funds uh, for um, some of the points that we've discussed, especially helping uh, kids who may not have access to virtual programming, helping to get them access and get those resources in the, in the right place. Um, we have, um, th that's been very much on our radar in terms of what do we do with those funds. Those have been um, appropriated as scholarship funds, um, as was directed by the council uh, last year, uh, but with fewer programs this summer, um, really there are fewer scholarships uh, overall that we're offering. So um, that may be something that we can come back to the council on to, um, to reappropriate those funds in a different way to serve um, at-risk uh, or low-income kids in particular. So thank you for mentioning that. Uh, in terms of the pool, um, the uh, we had a Harvey West pool subcommittee that met, and really the goal of our of the pool is to find a way to to open it year round um, and really invest in the pool in a way so that it's modernized and sustainable. And so moving into the summer, unfortunately, we uh, we won't be operating Harvey West pool as a um, result of the COVID-19 emergency. Um, however, we do continue to make uh, investments in the pool in terms of uh, replacement of heating equipment, 
um, and, and so forth. So we're taking some iterative steps to keep it uh, functioning. But longer term, what we need to do is um, uh, we do have funding coming into this year um, for a Harvey West pool, uh, essentially strategic plan or analysis, um, kind of a market analysis to understand what is the demand and uh, what is needed uh, in a potentially new pool. So if we can come up with really good direction um, in terms of what should the pool be in the future, that's our goal for this year. And then on top of that, moving into fiscal year uh, 22 and beyond, uh, have a, a big capital campaign um, of some sort, maybe work with the philanthropic community or, or grants uh, possibly to, to fund uh, a new Harvey West pool. So that would be the, the long-term goal. Great, uh, thank you. I think I missed another question. And, oh, disc golf. Uh, disc golf, we are working uh, closely with the disc golf club um, on how we can open um, safely. And so we've got a good plan that we just confirmed yesterday with the disc golf club. Um, I don't have the date offhand of when we're going to open that, but I expect that it will be uh, this week um, that we'll reopen disc golf at La Viega. Thank you. Member Matthews. Yeah, Tony, as usual, um, your report shows how your department uh, does some big project planning that's very grounded in reality and uh, also has a wonderful vision of everything this community wants. And it's been so impressive to see how you've um, adapted uh, almost overnight uh, to the online news and, and uh, changing world. Um, I think it was Sandy mentioned uh, how to reach out to uh, schools or to, to young people who may not have access to online um, uh, services or resources. And I believe um, Renee and Martine, you may know more about this, but I believe the schools have been making sure that every student has a computer. So yeah, she's giving yeah. a thumbs up. So um, that's right. They're making a. Uh, certainly school-age kids, but they all have access, and so it may be possible, maybe you're already doing this, I don't know, but working with the schools to make sure that the schools help publicize all those other things besides the schoolwork um, that are available to kids and families in the way of the parks and rec resources. And Rachel, I was really interested to hear that you're, not surprised, but interested that you um, recreation professionals are meeting weekly and sharing all your resources. And there again, working with our community partners to publicize because what you're doing online is spectacular. Um, and I can think of other campaigns that I've worked with where the gray bears have put flyers in their food bags, and that would be a great way to reach people, uh, low income residents and sick and seniors countywide with the offering. You may very well be doing this already, but I think we do have such strong partnerships. Um, and some of our nonprofits that serve large, large members of the community to um, promote the recreation services through them. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Sorry, I was muted. Council Member Brown. <laughs> Yeah, sorry to jump back in, but I, I did have one additional question. I will say thank you to Vice Mayor Myers for raising the uh, personal safety issue. I think we need to take that very seriously. And um, so please do uh, get back with us about anything that we can do, however we can kind of help uh, ensure uh, safety of our uh, parks crew who sometimes are out in uh, more remote places um, in particular. And my question is, um, it reminded me, um, I, uh, Council Member Watkins mentioned the disc golf course, but constituents also want to know about the skate parks. So um, do you have a timeline on that? We got an email that it would probably be sometime this week, and I haven't heard anything since. Yeah, that's correct. We're working, again, with the skate community, and we've done this really across uh, the city with the surfing community, uh, disc golf, skate park, uh, skate parks, um, archery. Really wanted to work with them. Once we open these amenities, we want to make sure that it's uh, as safe and sustainable as possible so that we don't open amenities and they become overcrowded and we get direction to, to close them again. 
Um, so you're exactly right. We plan to open the skate parks um, likely later this week um, in partnership with the, the skate community who's been uh, great and really receptive to a variety of ideas to help self-manage um, and, uh, and just help us kind of keep the place safe and sustainable. Councilmember Goldman. I just was going to touch on the, the question that um, Councilmember Brown had and Councilmember Matthews brought up is that that one of the um, positives of the COVID-19 is that we have been able to, in Santa Cruz City Schools, um, bring families up to the digital age like we never have before. And we've given out almost all of our Chromebooks and most of the schools are letting the students keep those through the summer. And um, they're allowed to have one device per child. So there's many devices in the houses. We've also given out um, these T-Mobile hotspots for families that couldn't afford or couldn't get Wi-Fi wherever they live. And so there's, at most of the schools that I'm involved in, there's maybe one student that is not online. So it's been really, really fantastic seeing everybody being brought into the digital age together and you know um, making it a more equitable experience for our Santa Cruz City Schools, school age children at least. Right, thanks for that comment. Seeing uh, no further comments from council members, I'm gonna turn it over to members of the public. If anyone would like to comment on the presentation that's been provided by Parks and Rec, uh, now's the time to call in. And after you have called in, you can press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And when it's your time to speak, if you're an announcement that you've been unmuted and your time will be set to two minutes. We'll give folks a couple minutes to see if anybody wants to call in. Nobody missed anything with the jets. You couldn't see them. You could only hear them. <laughs> okay. I think that there's no members of the public who are calling in. Um, I'd just like to bring it back to council for any final questions or comments. Okay. Hearing none, Tony, I'd just like to thank you again for all the work that you've been doing. And I'd also like to, to um, kind of piggyback on what Vice Mayor Myers had said, um, but extend it a little bit further, which is that not only do we need to ensure the uh, safety of our parks employees, but uh, the parks are open for our the members of our community. And I think that uh, we really need to continue to ensure that parks are places that people can go and feel safe uh, whether they're in Poganip or whether they're in the neighborhoods, the parks are vital to our mental and physical health and whatever we can do to ensure that parks are safe and accessible for everyone in our community, um, I think that we should continue to make that happen. So thank you again for your presentation and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, right now, given that it's, uh, it's about 11.30, what I was thinking is that if there's no um, opposition, maybe we can take a break from now until noon and restart at noon, or we could continue um, just knowing that we'll possibly be going a little past noon with our next presentation. Councilmember Brown. Perfect. Yeah, um, I, is economic development next? I think they are. Um, uh, I think it would be great if we could, because um, I see that um, Bonnie has been on, um, that maybe we could do that one and then take a break. But I'm open, either way, it's fine. Councilor Matthews. Oh, I was gonna vote for a break because I think economic development may be longer. I was so. thinking it's gonna <laughs> probably take some time, so. 
Um, I think we'll take a, a quick half hour break and we'll reconvene at noon and then we'll start back up with the economic development and go yeah. through the continue to the presentations. Thank you. Great. Okay, thank, thank you. you. I was just on. I'm not sure if somebody's here. Justin, my video won't work. It says the host hasn't opened it or something like that. Oh. Yeah, it says you cannot start your video because the host has disabled it. That's weird. I'll see you. Okay. Can you try now? Um, I'm going to push OK. There you are. Oh, good. Okay, thanks. Yep. I'm going to text Cynthia to let her know we're going to get started again. And can you let me know if you can hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, good. Thanks. Yeah, come on. Oh, there she is. All right, Bonnie, I think we're good to get started. We're all good here. Okay. Great. Good afternoon, Mayor and members of the council. Is my volume okay? Yes, good. There's a slight echo, but yeah, I think you're okay right now. Okay. Um, well, I'm pleased to present to you our fiscal year 2021 budget, and um, it actually is a fairly short presentation. Um, we're presenting a status quo budget, so I'm ha I'll be happy to answer any questions at the end, but I'm not showing um, the depth or breadth of what our department covers at this time. Okay, so this is our team. We have 14 uh, full-time uh, FTE. Um, we currently do have three vacant, which makes for a challenging time in our department at this time. Um, I like to think of our team as a small but mighty team here in economic development. We're divided up into four areas, and that's business development with our business liaison, Rebecca um, Unit, leading that area, infrastructure and property development, um, with Dave McCormick um, leading that area, arts and culture development, and housing development with uh, Jessica DeWitt leading, leading that area. And I'll briefly just go into the core services. I just have um, one or two slides for each area to talk about. Um, but before I get there, I briefly just wanted to mention, you know, because it's not always intuitive why we have these four areas as part of our department. I mean, what we see is that these areas from art to infrastructure, property development, housing and business, that they all interrelate and have profound effects on the local economy, community and enhanced quality of life. So that's one of the reasons we have them in our department and we think they work really well together. Um, briefly, our business support team, we work as you see on the left um, in the downtown, we manage two assessment districts um, and are the fiscal agent for the downtown association as well as the cooperative retail management district in the downtown managed by the downtown management corporation. So we have two downtown assessments that we manage here in economic development and we care a lot about the downtown and working directly with businesses and providing business support. Um, we also 
manage a growth Santa Cruz loan program in addition to the resilience microloan program that you've recently heard about and I'll give you some highlights of that program in a few minutes. Um, we welcome about two to three hundred new businesses a year to Santa Cruz and that includes you know connecting to the, them to the chamber with ribbon cutting we send out a new welcome business letter um, telling them about city resources and doing follow-up to see how they're doing. We manage a facade and sign improvement program and average anywhere over the life of the program over 178 uh, facade grants. Additionally, lately we've been doing additional signage grants, a lot of those in the downtown and our commercial areas on the east side and along Mission. We have a trolley program and just in the last year secured a major grant uh, for electric trolley um, program that you're familiar with. We do marketing programs. And then we have a lot of collaborations, and I think a lot of the work that we do is about the collaborations that we do, whether it's um, in the downtown with the Alliance for Women Entrepreneurs, or with Santa Cruz Works and New Tech Meetup, or with the university, for a number of the university initiatives we have, like the current Get Virtual program. So we won't go into a lot of those today um, in consideration of time, but happy to answer any specific questions that you have. The photo you see on the right is a photo of one of our pop-ups where we're featuring new and growing businesses in Santa Cruz. Um, another pillar that we have in economic development is the infrastructure and property development and property management. So this is just a, a few photos of some of these uh, core services that we provide. Um, we bring into the general fund over 2.5 million in general fund annual revenue through properties that we manage um, at the city. We have over 100 sites and management you know, across from the uh, wharf to uh, retail spaces in our uh, parking garages downtown, former redevelopment agency property like the Del Mar Theater, um, and then we manage 22 cafe extensions and parklets that you see in, in the downtown area. So we have a lot of uh, infrastructure development. In addition, we do projects like the Tannery Arts Center and uh, work with Art Space and work with the Arts Council and our major tenants there, including the Jewel Theater at the Colligan Theater for the Arts. Uh, projects like the Marine Sanctuary Exploration Center, uh, the Warriors Arena, and current projects like the Metro Pacific Mixed Use Station that you heard about a little bit um, yesterday in closed session. And then finally, we also have our wayfinding project we've been working on this year, which is replacing all of the purple and teal signs you see around town. Um, on the arts and culture development side, we have a, approximately five programs, and in addition to that, we work with the arts, um, with the arts commission in approving public art and our percent for art program um, that we have uh, in at the city. And of course, this is the wonderful uh, goat park mural called Jump In by Sarah Bianca. Uh, who is also an artist at, at, who lives at the tannery. Um, we have our sculpture program, um, and you can see that evidenced by some of the amazing sculptures that you'll see downtown. Um, those are all managed through our public art program. The scrap program, which is actually reusing uh, materials from the Resource Recovery Center and creating some incredible art for our community, and we have that annual uh, exhibit every year graphic traffic, which are cover all of our traffic boxes in town with some just stunning murals. Uh, the Rail Trail Master Plan for the Arts, which has some pretty incredible um, designs and art projects. And then of course our mural matching grants like this one. And then I'll hi uh, highlight a couple of others. Of course, earlier today, um, during the Public Works presentation, you saw the amazing mural by Elijah Votenhauer um, of the giant whale on the water treatment plant. That's also through our public art program. So we're really proud of um, the impact that the arts have on the community and the economic impact. It's really part of Santa Cruz vibrancy and part of our culture that makes Santa Cruz unique and, and part of the reason why we want to live here. Um, and finally, our housing development activities. Um, obviously, this is very detailed. This is just a snapshot so that you can see of the diversity and depth of the number of housing activities and development from working with our CDBG and our home program at the state through different policies, working with our planning division on inclusionary um, fee waivers, um, affordable housing agreements, um, and then cross the community engagement. This, you know, this is Affordable Housing Month, actually, this month. Um, working with our Affordable Housing Trust Fund um, and the monitoring that we do on affordable housing units um, across the city. We have an interactive housing webpage. If you're curious, um, go to our housing page as part of our uh, site.
at the city, our housing webpage is part of the Chief Santa Cruz, and you can actually look up any of our affordable housing projects and click. This is a, a little snapshot of Jesse Street to get a little more info um, on individual projects and backgrounds. And then I'm going to highlight just three of our 2020 accomplishments and achievements and um, respect of, of time. Um, and just from a couple of these areas. So the first is our Water Street apartment. And this is one that uh, we're really proud of that was approved in late 2019. This is 41 units on Water Street. 33 of those are project-based vouchers working with the housing authority. And um, what does that mean? This was completed last year. The developer is for the future housing. The architect is Tenover Studio. Um, and we have five sources of funding that go into this project, about $4.5 million in city funding across our community development block grant program, um, across, show you another picture from the grand opening, uh, community development block grant program, uh, our home funds, fee deferrals, uh, contribution from our affordable housing trust fund, and our former RDA. So all of those funding sources went in this project to close that gap and make this 41 unit project affordable. And so the question always is, well, what does that mean as far as affordable? Well, with the project-based vouchers from the housing authority in that project, um, 33 of those 41 are paying at 30% of their income or less utility allowances. So that is truly affordable. The balance of those units, another seven, are paying between 50 or 60 percent of area median income. So these are deep affordability units that, that are being um, made available to members of the community, and it is a really lovely project. Um, a highlight this year um, is a very recent one. This is our Santa Cruz Resilience Microloan Program. Um, this was actually funded um, through our Economic Development Trust Fund. Um, we, uh, council, thank you, authorized half a million um, in loan funding that we could provide for the community. We partnered with Santa Cruz Community Credit Union, and they have been just incredible. In addition to them um, being and working through providing Paycheck Protection Program loans, uh, they partnered with us and um, are servicing our loan program for us. So we deposited our 500000 in their bank. And um, we approved on our end in economic development the loan um, recipients. And then uh, Santa Cruz Community Credit Union is actually going to provide them with their monthly, monthly statements and fund their loans on our behalf. So this is a really great partnership. In less than two weeks, we awarded 51 loans out to the, our business community. And you can see the breakdown there. These are the four areas that we prioritized for these loans based on the feedback um, that we were getting. Uh, from businesses in the community. And majority of those, I would say, had applied for paycheck protection loans and EIDL, you know, emergency economic assistance loans, and they just hadn't been funded or they were deemed ineligible. So we're really pleased that we've been able to provide this influx of capital into our businesses to help keep them afloat across the entertainment, restaurant, retail, and service-oriented industries. Um, we were also really uh, conscious of where these loans were going in our community. We wanted to make sure they were going um, geographically um, across. We do have loans from the west side, east side, downtown. I'd also say we have some loans in the Sash Mill, Harvey West, and along Mission Street as well. 59% of the loan recipients um, are, went to women-owned businesses, and 25% overall were minority-owned. So this is a program. We'll come back a little bit later with more detail, um, but I wanted to give you a snapshot um, right now. And so appreciation to staff. Um, we have two staff members um, working on this um, over the last, you know, three weeks. And um, I will say to, have, to pull off um, from beginning to end a loan program and to get a half a million out to the community, it feels like a miracle looking at it, but I really want to acknowledge uh, Rebecca Unit and Kathy Mintz um, on our staff for making this pro program possible. Um, this is our Clean Oceans mural, and I think this is near to dear and dear to many people's heart in the community. Obviously, this is a 600-foot wall on Bay and Mission Street. You can see from the top photo um, it's been an eyesore and a source of graffiti in town. And just to highlight our mural program, just for a second, uh, that's really what we try to prioritize. There are areas in town that have a lot of uh, view from the community. They get, uh, also get tagged a lot with graffiti. And what we found is by 
putting um, artwork and murals um, in large public spaces, particularly in commercial areas, it really reduces the graffiti overall. And of course, it doesn't hurt to have um, an amazing artist um, that we have um, on this project, this collaboration that we have uh, with Taylor uh, Reingold on this project. What's incredible about this 600 feet, feet wall is how quickly it went up. You know, this is obviously next to Bayview Elementary School. Um, but this is a collaboration um, between Santa Cruz City Arts, Santa Cruz City Schools, the Tim Broch Foundation, and of course, Taylor Reinhold, um, who created this mural. Here's another close up of just some of the detail um, that you can see on this mural. Taylor is now working with Pangea Seed, a Hawaii based internationally engaged nonprofit organization acting at the intersection of culture and environmentalism to further the conservation of our oceans. And what you'll see, here's just another close up. In the next year, we had, and it was actually planned for this June, but we're postponing it a year. Um, we're uh, really uh, proud to be a sponsor of Seawall Santa Cruz, a community-based public art project to help raise environmental awareness and public engagement in issues related to conservation of Santa Cruz's marine resources, the Bay Area and the world's ocean. So we'll be uh, one of the international sites for this program and we're postponing it to next year so that we can have the whole community collaboration and fully experience it the way that it should be. Um, so this is our status quo budget, um, and you can see sort of the breakdown across our areas. I will say um, overall, so this includes, you know, project support and admin, that 10% at the top includes legal fees, planning services, financial analysis of property, sales tax, et cetera, is within that 10%. Our overall budget is 5.5 million. That does not include adjustments um, that I'll talk about briefly um, for grants and um, CDBG and home that have just that has just been awarded at the time of us submitting our budget we didn't know what those um, CDBG and home funds so this actually changes our status quo budget slightly it reduces our personnel down to 30 percent and it takes our 68 percent of the general fund down to 60 percent and our housing and community development increases to 35 percent of our overall budget um, that outside funded, um, outside of the general fund. Um, I will say arts and culture looks a little skewed here. That's because this is only representing the general fund expenditures of arts and culture. It doesn't include the 1% for public art funding. Um, let's see, what's not status quo in our budget? Um, again, I just mentioned this, our HUD annual action plan. Um, we have new revenues and labor offsets. And so of course this includes the um, COVID-19 um, CARES Act funding that we have as well. So that additional 282,000 that you received a presentation from Tiffany Lake on our housing team yesterday, as well as an additional staff um, housing cost offset of personal label of credit of a total of 134,000. Um, new grant funding as well that wasn't in our budget, um, and that's the Cannabis Equity Grant. Um, so this was approved by the council on April 28th, so we have new grant funding coming in, new resources to our budget of 147000 and we have uh, related personnel savings um, of 112000 And this actually goes across uh, multiple departments. Um, there's a savings to economic development of approximately 64000 planning 42,000 and the police department about 6,000. Overall, um, I would say our general fund personnel savings um, from across the CDBG, cannabis, affordable housing, uh, trust fund and housing successor credits um, is about 200,000 um, more than, than what was originally in the budget. Um, what else is not status quo? The poster on the right is actually the Pangea Seed um, looking specifically at the arts initiative that we hope to have, be able to, that I mentioned a few minutes ago, move forward with like next year as one of the international sites. Um, but what is not status quo in our budget? Um, obviously our microloan program uh, wasn't something that we had budgeted for this year um, that you approved that came out of our Economic Development Trust Fund. I will briefly mention, and we can go over this in more detail if you have questions, our ED Trust Fund um, is a source of revenue for economic development activities. Um, it was created after the uh, redevelopment agency was terminated at the time.
time um, when we took the measure to the voters for increasing the transiting occupancy tax with the understanding that 1% uh, of that fund would go towards economic development activities. So we do have a fund balance on this. We're proposing as part of the overall uh, deficit picture to use a portion of the ED trust fund um, to address the deficit. My hope is that we'll still have some funding available to be able to apply towards additional longer term recovery efforts in our community. But we'll have to revisit that um, as that picture unfolds over the over the months ahead. Um, additionally, what's not in your budget, um, what's not status quo, is that you authorized um, actually back in December an environmental. It's a site characterization for Sky Park, and some of you who were on the council last year will recall that we had a purchase sale agreement um, for the Sky Park development that fell out. Um, due to, the, re roughly due for a variety of reasons, but one of the stated reasons was related to the unknown uh, environmental characterization on the site. And with stricter state regulations coming in um, for cleanup uh, requirements, we needed to further characterize the site so that we could say what is the true value less the cleanup that we need to do there to, to know what we could actually sell the site for. So that will be a credit adjustment to our budget to pay for that against the future sale um, proceeds for the Sky Park, which is roughly estimated in around the $8 million range. Um, again, and something else that's not status quo in our budget would be the uh, potential downtown property-based improvement district. I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation that we have two assessment districts that we manage, one on behalf of the Downtown Association, which is a business assessment, and the second one, which is a smaller property-based improvement district. We've been um, working with Puma and um, a consultant that does property-based um, property improvement districts around the country and the Downtown Association to create a merged larger downtown district with a larger budget with a focus on downtown support, revitalization, cleanliness, safety, all of the top issues that really resonated with our property and business community and business visitors coming to the downtown. Um, the impact to the city is not insignificant. Um, it's roughly about 160,000. If this is approved by council, this will come before you, both to accept the petitions from the property owners, as well as a contribution from the general fund or from a city fund to pay as property owners. The city owns quite a bit of property in the downtown area, about 15% um, in the district. So 160,000 would be the city's share of the contribution. So that discussion will come before you in the next month. And then finally, what's not status quo would be the rent for some of our city-owned properties. This includes uh, former RDA properties, now city properties, the Del Mar, rent on the Del Mar, our NIAC building um, that tenant has left, that is site is slated for redevelopment as part of the Pacific Station. But we've received some pretty healthy rents in the past for that. So we do have some changing rent um, related to COVID-19. We are tracking those. We're also tracking those for the larger city um, for our properties on the wharf and our other tenants and our commercial tenants in our parking garages. So that'll be something that we'll bring to you um, coming up in the next months ahead as we're revising um, on a month by month basis what those revenues look like, what's coming in um, so that we can help um, with the overall uh, revenue budget picture for the city. And then I will mention as far as the cafe extension and the kiosks, um, as looking towards recovery and reopening, looking at how can we safely work with our restaurants and our businesses across the city and the downtown, how can we work with our restaurants um, and looking at cafe extensions, looking at our parklet program that we have in the downtown, which you know for the last two years has been more of a pilot but looking at social distancing and, and reduced capacity in restaurants, we need to think about how can we actually provide that additional capacity safely. Um, expanding into the parklets might be one area to do that. Obviously, there's some revenue um, impacts from that. So these are some ideas we're talking to now as we're looking at long-term recovery that will come before you in the months ahead. And thank you. That concludes um, my presentation, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. All right, thank you, Bonnie, for that presentation and for sharing all those achievements of this, this year. Are there any council members who have questions at this time? Councilmember Byers. Um, regarding the downtown, and I think you call them parklets, is that those extensions like in front of, I can't remember, in front of they outdoor cafes, outdoor cafes? Yes. 
Yeah. We have both the parklets that are in. The parklets are actually in the taking over a parking space. In the yeah. Street. Oh, okay. And the cafe extension would be uh, like in front of the Del Moret. Yeah. You know, I get this question for years. Why do we make it so, I don't know, complicated to put a couple tables out in front of the restaurant? I mean, they're all over the world. It's full of outdoor restaurants. And... And, uh, you know, you kind of walk around them or you see them. They're so inviting. Anyway, I, I, I don't know whether the merchants are finding it difficult to do or it's expensive, but it just seems that uh, we're just terribly, I don't know, conservative regarding that. Yeah, you raise a really good question. I think as part of the recovery efforts, we're really going to have to focus on how we support our businesses and our restaurants adapt to um, making people feel that they can, you know, yeah. come as customers, come as patri patrons to their restaurants coming forward. And I think activating um, our sidewalk safely so that you can still walk through um, and really probably creating more parklets for those restaurants that want to participate in that program so that people can really come down and enjoy our public spaces. If I could just add to that, I think I'm – Maybe I didn't. Maybe the 11 o'clock news last night because we were still all <laughs> up uh, about to go to bed. Um, it, I think it was Pacific Grove. And one thing there, I'm not really sure where it was, but it was showing how because of the situation, uh, they were all putting stuff out on the sidewalk to sell or to serve. It was very interesting. And, and the commentator talked about how this is just putting all this out for people to enjoy because they can't go inside a restaurant. So it, it's kind of hand in hand. And so I'm glad you're, you're looking at it because I really think we're such an outdoor community and people love their, you know, coffee outdoors and, you know, weather is never an issue. So anyway, I'm glad you're looking at that because I think there's a, a world we could really improve on. Great, thank you. Yeah, just to briefly follow up on that, we've been receiving some emails from folks discussing, you know, oh. shutting down Pacific Avenue and putting all the, allowing for people to eat outside. And um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, we'll just have to be creative as we move forward and think, thinking about how we can reopen and restructure um, our downtown. Uh, next is Councilmember Matthews. Good one. Love the report. Um, on the Ocean's Mural, I thought I saw in the slide feed show just a couple of little graffitis popping up. And um, did you ever get enough money to put the graffiti coating on that? You know, Council Member Matthews, that's a good question, and I'm not entirely sure. Um, I, I remember asking Beth before she took off, and it was still hanging out there as a <laughs> unfunded last step, but, you know, it's a beautiful long mural and you want to protect it as long as possible. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. I'll, I'll follow up on that one. Uh, Councilman Watkins. Thanks, Bonnie, um, for the presentation and for all the different aspects your department does. Um, I, I was just going to follow up because you mentioned something about the parklets being uh, sort of a cost-neutral approach to uh, uh, as a change, and I, I, I kind of wanted to see if you could speak a little bit more to that. Um, sure. So, Councilmember um, Watkins, I think that it really depends on how we approach it. So, I think we can we can have it be a cost neutral. We could have um, it be something as a recovery effort that we um, present a variety of options for consideration. For example. Um, our pilot program does have a cost that um, the business takes um, into consideration and, and actually pays for the cost of the parking meter, if there's a parking meter in front of that space, as part of the cost of the program. So what we could, um, going forward, in order to encourage um, and really encourage both the social distancing and the activation of the space, we could cover that cost um, on behalf of the businesses that wanted to do that going forward. So I think there's going to be some options for you to consider when we look at reopening and trying to support our businesses um, going forward. Great. And the only other thing I would say, um, and, and I agree with Councilmember Byers, in that um, 
you know, there's so much opportunity for outdoor experience and downtown having a place for, and this is sort of post COVID and we can actually have our kids interact with other kids, but you know, little parklets for kids to play and have open sort of just a closed off space. And you see those little similar to how we have the parklets for restaurants, just sort of play areas too. So as we're thinking kind of holistically about that, I'll just make a quick plug for that as part of the kind of thought process. Yeah, I would say uh, we actually had a working with the downtown association and uh, had been in discussion of activating a number of our public spaces, including uh, Fraser Lewis Lane. So we are hoping to be able to get back to that. We're looking at the whole downtown holistically as far as what's the public property versus private and how can we work together to activate some of those spaces. So I think for long-term recovery, that's going to be a key area as well to really support people coming back down um, downtown and to you know really engaging in our community. Great, thank you. Vice Mayor Myers. Thanks, Bonnie, for the uh, presentation and all your amazing work. Um, you guys are truly the, the little the little department that 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 uh, does so much. Um, I have a, just a quick question. Um, just being a patron of many of the of the businesses over on the west side, um, I just am wondering. Um, I know since we have, you know, actual obligations on a lot of the downtown in terms of you know our roles and responsibilities as a city, but I'm just curious about. Um, outreach to the west side and the east side. I was very pleased to see that um, the funding was able to be kind of, you know, moved around with different businesses throughout town. But just curious about, um, you know, the resources that you have to actually engage, you know, with these other parts of town that have these small business districts that are, um, you know, really becoming part of, you know, these neighborhoods, our east side, west side neighborhoods and things like that. So just curious about, um, your resource base on that and whether that's something that we need to be aware of um, in terms of next year's, you know, budget and resources and things like that. Um, yeah, Council Member Myers, that's a, that's a great question. You know, I, I will say we were really sensitive to that as we were looking at the microloan program. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things we've done, and it's not specific geographically, but um, in looking at uh, recovery efforts in particular is that we developed a survey. It's on our website, Choose Santa Cruz, when you click on COVID, and it's by industry sector across Santa Cruz. And so when you think of, of you know, West Side or think of certain areas, there are more types of certain types of businesses geographically um, mm -hmm. dispersed around our, around our community. And um, we have a very specific by industry sector, I think we have nine different ones, um, that we're trying to get feedback on on what those needs are versus, you know, if you're in the hospitality industry, the hotel uh, specifically versus someone in manufacturing, retail, um, you know, across some of these areas, restaurant. We're trying to get specific feedback so that we know how we can help them and what their needs are specific to recovery and long term. Um, so that's something that we're doing right now. In addition to having a survey on our site, we're actually um, doing one-on-one -on -one calls with the survey to make sure that we have a certain number of responses from each category and working with some industry partners um, to make sure that we get a good response across, across, across each of those areas. Um, one of the things we have done geographically over the years and what we really focus on and we're going to need going forward is focusing on our banner program. We've looked at the infrastructure development to be able to support um, sort of that place making by area. So when you look at, you know, sort of Swift Street and that Swift Street courtyard area and that sort of burgeoning retail restaurant area of being able to create a sense of place and support by that infrastructure. So through banners, um, through banners on the east side when you get to the midtown areas, how can we help them and help the East Side Business Association really feel supported by our community. So those are two programs looking at beautification areas. We obviously have a lot of that for the downtown, but looking at those both on the east side and on the west side are some areas that we're, that, that we're working on um, through some of the work that we do. Um, I will also mention lastly, because I didn't mention in the presentation, um, as part of our resources, which you can access on our business page, we are developing business kits for um, all businesses, they are on a first come first serve basis. We are 
sending those out information about them out to all the business licenses um, in, in um, our community as well as through our ED newsletter. And that includes uh, their business reopen restart kit. So it includes hand sanitizer, includes social distancing floor markers, posters to post on the doors, um, includes face coverings through our volunteer-led effort, 10,000 Mask Project. And shout out to Amanda Ratella on our team who did an incredible job. Um, so we still have a few rolling in, um, but 200 sewers in the community creating 10,000 masks um, is quite an accomplishment. And some of those are now going to our critical businesses across Santa Cruz. So each business can have up to 25 face coverings to go in their special kits. So we definitely um, look at each of our geographic areas and what those needs are. Um, generally, some of the infrastructure um, needs on the east side, we've looked at a tree program in addition to the banner program or different things that we think um, of outside the downtown or things that are needed. Thank you. Um, I, yeah, I think that, that that's it. Yeah, I was just curious about that geographic coverage and really, really excited to hear about all that work. So thank you again and please thank your staff for all their work they're doing. We know it's a hard time. Thank you. Thank you. I just had um, a couple comments and, uh, and then I had one question. But the comments just given this discussion has made me think about, you know, uh, we've seen our farmers markets model be successful at being able to operate and function and, and we haven't really seen any transmission of COVID through those kinds of markets. So it'd be interesting to think about, you know, whether or not we could have a similar market for some of our retail businesses downtown or even sidewalk sales that might be able to be to function uh, with social distancing implemented since retail is now something that's um, been approved for curbside and how we might be able to take that further. So just thought I'd put that out there. Um, in addition to that, I did have a question about the microloan program um, because it sounded like there's 700,000 requested, 500,000 funded, which is kind of the limit of our budget. But one of the questions I have with that remaining 200,000 is whether uh, all those applications were um, eligible. Because I know I'm, I'm my thought is that my sense is that there were probably some folks from the county who applied for city funds, and obviously they're not going to be eligible uh, because they're outside of the city's boundary. But I'm just kind of curious if, like, what would what would it take if there were, you know, eligible grants that weren't able to get funded? How much more it would take to kind of uh, support those businesses as well? Yeah, Mayor, that's a really good question. Um, we had, of those, we actually had in the first two days, we had to close our portal because we received, in the first two days of opening, over 90 completed applications. And recognizing that we only had 500,000, we didn't want, um, we were concerned about expectations and didn't want people to go through the process of completing a loan application when we, did, when we knew we, did, we didn't have sufficient funding. Um, we did prioritize and set up, um, and this was communicated also on um, the guidelines for our loan program. We were focused towards those four areas. So. Uh, specifically, you know, restaurants um, that are a uh, cash-based business primarily and without having patrons um, and that number of, you know, folks, customers that usually come in were, were incredibly impacted um, by the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, also, service-oriented businesses and um, some entertainment businesses. We additionally prioritize those with storefronts, recognizing that vacancy and being able to make sure that when um, it's time to reopen, that we have been supporting um, those retail and those businesses um, with a street and storefront presence in Santa Cruz. As far as the number of percentage that weren't eligible, there were a handful. We had a lot of disclaimers, but there, you know, right at the beginning, but there were a handful of people who applied who were out of the city. Um, and so we did send all of those that weren't eligible, um, that didn't meet our criteria, that were outside. We had a few, a couple manufacturing um, that applied that weren't uh, part of our ranking criteria. I think if we had a few hundred thousand extra, we um, could definitely uh, award those, no problem. Um, I think just sort of weighing um, our overall deficit and our budget um, from the city, we really felt like we needed to prioritize initially um, with, you know, a fairly modest program, but I think that um, the software that we used and Slide Room was really effective in being able to 
um, look at the program ac applications fairly quickly and to be able to rank those um, based on the criteria. And then our partnership with Santa Cruz Community Credit Union, I think we could, um, if there was an interest by the city council, there's definitely an interest by the community to expand the loan program. So if there, you know, we didn't include in the first round um, nonprofits, for example, and there were a number of nonprofits that had applied. So, um, so could we fund more? We absolutely could, um, if there is an, an interest to do so. Great, thanks. Uh, Councilmember Brown. I thank you, Bonnie, and everyone on the ED team. You all do great work. Small and mighty is a good way to put it. Um, I'm always amazed by the work that you all do, um, how extensive it is, how deep in the community. And um, so I just wanna say thank you for that. Um, I'm, I'm glad that you brought up the, the 10,000 masks, and, I'm, and thank you, Amanda, for uh, spearheading that. It's just such a great thing, um, and I'm glad to hear they're gonna be going out to businesses. I'm wondering if, uh, because I just did recently a little mini tour of some of the um, homeless shelter expansions that have happened, um, and I'm just wondering, like the Vets Hall and the Armory, and to, uh, the Armory is kind of connected because of the Salvation Army with the um, Laurel, the front, the Laurel Street um, uh, space, but I'm wondering if, because they all said that's a, it's a huge need for them, I'm wondering if it might be possible to, or if you've maybe already talked about this, um, to channel uh, some small uh, number of them to the, for the workers in those places. I mean, they do have masks, but they're, they're saying that it's, it's kind of a constant need because they're, they're really needing to change their masks all the time. Yes, Council Member Brown. Um, we had we made the um, masks available to through our EOC. Um, so I think six thousand of them went directly to the EOC for distribution to anyone in our unsheltered community and also workers working at, through Housing Matters and through you know Vets Hall. They're all available through um, through that project. Yay! Thank you. Uh, Council Member Brown, I'll also let you know that. Um, and to the rest of the council members, that in partnership with Bella Canvas and the, U, the U.S. Conference of Mayors, we received 120 masks um, for distribution. And I also gave those to um, our homeless coordinators to distribute to folks in our homeless communities and at the different haunts and haunts club locations. So that's an additional source of masks. Okay, at this time, um, since there's no further questions from council members, I'm gonna turn over to members of the public. So if you're interested in commenting on the economic development budget presentation that was presented today, um, now is the time to call in if you haven't already. And after you call in, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And then when it is your time to speak, you'll hear an announcement that you've been unmuted. And so we'll give folks a couple minutes if they feel like calling in to comment on the economic development budget presentations, please call in at this time. Okay, seeing no members of the public calling in, are there any further comments from council members on this item? Okay, seeing none. Um, Bonnie, thank you again for all the work that you do and, and your staff for all the amazing work and please let us know how we can continue to support your efforts. Thank you, Mayor. I'll let my team know as well. All right. Moving on to our next item, our fifth presentation of the day is from our Planning and Community Development Department. And again, for members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is a presentation you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation by staff, followed by questions from the council, and we will then take up public comment and then return to the council for any follow-up questions or comments. 
And with that, I will turn it over to our Planning and Community Development Director, Lee Butler. Oh, you're, you're muted. Sorry. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. Um, I am going to share my screen here. All right. We are going to have the same agenda as the other departments, and so I'm going to jump right in. Uh, the mission for our department is to enhance the quality of life, safety, and civic pride for our community by providing land use and development services in a responsive, respectful, and efficient manner. We have five divisions that um, comprise our 37 and a half full-time employees. In code compliance, we've got two divisions. Rental inspection ensures the health and safety of our rental housing stock. Our code enforcement division is mostly reactive to a wide range of complaints, everything from unpermitted, uh, uh, unpermitted construction to inoperable vehicles on private property to people having roosters in their neighborhood. Uh, you know, it, it spans a, quite a range. Uh, in current planning, they review permits and applications for new construction on private property consistent with uh, general plan, zoning ordinance, local coastal program, and other regulations. Our advanced planning team uh, maintains and updates many of those programs and policies. Um, and then our administration division provides support for uh, staff and all the other divisions, as well as um, our public hearing bodies, of which we have three that we manage, the Zoning Administrator, the Historic Preservation Commission, and the Planning Commission. And then finally, our largest division, Building and Safety, they um, review plans for consistency with plumbing, electrical, mechanical, and structural, uh, as well as green building requirements. And then we have an inspection division that makes sure that out in the field, the construction is consistent with the plans and applicable regulations. Moving on to our biggest accomplishments, the new permit center, the public counter area was completed this year, many years in the making, and uh, you can see the before and after here. We've got um, nearly double the amount of space, um, both at the counter and for the public um, in, in the uh, front facing area. So we're really happy uh, that we were able to get that up and running. Thanks to our public works team, to um, our IT team, and also to Sarah De Leon, who managed that project on our end. Um, moving on to some other additional accomplishments, we. Um, approved 117 new units in planning last year. Uh, actually, uh, these numbers are for the calendar year of 2019 um, because we, we do the annual reports. And so uh, we'll, uh, we're pulling from those annual reports. 117 uh, units approved, 15% of those were affordable. This is one that we're uh, excited to see the tally of. Um, we had 158 permits issued. 83% of those permits were for affordable. Most of those were um, accessory dwelling units, but we did have some additional affordable units um, with the um, 350 Ocean Street project, which had about 64 units. And then when we look at um, the building permits finaled, Again, a huge percentage, 71% of our new housing stock that was occupied was um, affordable to um, moderate incomes or below. And again, the reason for this um, was in large part due to our accessory dwelling units. Um, we have also worked really hard this year at improving our uh, technology use to be more environmentally friendly and to better serve our customers. Um, we had two of our um, commissions mostly paperless uh, before, and we've now transitioned to the third, our Historic Preservation Commission, to paperless, so that's saving money for applicants and being more environmentally friendly. 
We've updated our code case tracking system to send automatic status update emails to complaining parties, so that's saving time for our team and better serving our customers. We've implemented online commenting features for our advisory body meetings. Um, our ADU webpage has been updated and has tons of great information to save our staff time and the community time in researching what they can do out on their properties. And then we're finalizing the rental inspection payment system um, so that we can get online uh, payments in coordination with IT. Um, Post-COVID, we've fast-tracked our electronic plan submittal and digital review of applications. We've uh, moved to online community meetings and public hearings with our uh, hearing bodies, and um, we have uh, conducted virtual inspections, so we're using Zoom and um, FaceTime for our inspectors to remain safe but still complete their work. We've done a lot of things remotely um, to comply with permit, uh, uh, Streamlining Act regulations, as well as meeting internal deadlines. And uh, big thanks to IT for helping us out on working on a lot of these projects. When we talk about the core services that we provide, the heart of what we really do is strategic visioning, providing health and safety, uh, promoting community well-being, and providing customer service. And each one of our divisions really does each one of these things. From strategic visioning, a lot of that happens in our advanced planning division with general plan and zoning ordinance and local coastal program updates. Uh, but our building division is contributing to changes at the state level for building codes, and many of our sustainability efforts fall into our strategic visioning category. When it comes to health and safety, our building division, building and safety is front and center. You know, plumbing and electrical, they're making sure those are safe. They're making sure that buildings are uh, safe in an earthquake and that fire escape and rescue standards are met. But we do that in our other divisions as well. Planning is looking at you know, promoting eyes on the street to encourage safety and um, encouraging an active community because our built environment really influences daily activities and health. And then uh, our green building program, rental inspection program, and code compliance services all help support healthy living environments as well. On the community well-being end, we conduct environmental review for all of our projects to promote decisions that support our natural environment, and we're planning for open spaces and aesthetically pleasing community. When it comes to customer service, we directly serve a lot of customers. Um, just in our administration division, they are expected to handle over 12,000 phone calls this year. Um, we are expecting to help about 8,000 people in person this year, just in planning and building, and that is with basically a stop of in-service, uh, or sorry, in-person service beginning in March. Um, we're uh, on schedule to complete over 12,000 inspections between building code and rental. Uh, we're expected to close over 300 code cases, issue over 1,600 building permits, and complete over 3,000 building plan checks. And then, of course, our uh, community engagement efforts where we're going out on projects and policies, that's an important part of our customer service as well and something that we regularly do. Jumping into our budget, we have uh, approximately $7.5 million in expenses. The vast majority of that is in our personnel. We do have a, a small chunk of that in services, um, and those are primarily in our building plan check and inspection services that supplement our staff. The only thing that we have that is not status quo this year is in prior years, we have funded some of our code enforcement efforts, actually proactive code enforcement efforts, with uh, CDBG funds. And um, that uh, this past year was $70,000. Um, that has shifted to other general fund projects. So there's no net general fund impact from that change, but we, uh, we are calling that out as a non-status quo item because that has shifted in terms of the reimbursements. Um, finally, I just want to thank you all for listening here and also want to thank our team for the great work that they do, um, not only throughout the year, but also in particular um, during this pandemic time. And we are available for any questions.
All right, thank you very much, Lee, for that presentation. And really great to hear that all those about all those affordable housing permits that are coming through. Uh, are there any questions from council members at this time? Seeing none, I will turn it over to the community. So if you're tuning in today and if you're interested in commenting on the planning and community development budget presentation, uh, now is the time to call in. You can find a list of phone numbers on your screen. If the first number doesn't work, you can try the next number. And once you're able to get through, you'll want to press star nine on your phone to raise your hand and when it's your time to speak, you'll hear an announcement that you've been unmuted. You will then uh, have two minutes to address the council. All right, seeing that uh, there are no members of the public calling in, I'll bring it back to council uh, for any questions or further comments. Council member Byers. Oh, thanks. Um, let's see, what was my, oh, I know uh, on the org charter, when you started, you had a few vacancies, maybe not many, but I saw, I think that maybe two. Um, or, oh, there they are. Yeah, one and a half, oh, and four. Uh, are those frozen or are you aggressively recruiting or what's up with them? Thanks for inquiring about that. Um, so we are holding off on the recruitments in both um, current planning and advanced planning. Um, really, we are in a, uh, a wait and see mode for that to understand what the implications of the COVID pandemic are going to be on um, uh, development and planning applications and entitlements as well as uh, building requests. Um, so uh, we've heard from a lot of individuals that they're going to be continuing their projects. Um, and if that, uh, if that workload continues, we may look at um, filling those at some point. But at this point, we're holding off on those. We're holding off on some of our building and safety um, uh, vacancies as well. But this has been a continual uh, challenge for us, and it's not just here. It's also uh, in other jurisdictions. Um, you know, there are a lot of uh, systemic issues uh, that are contributing to that, the, the giant downturn in construction back with the Great Recession in 2008 um, had a lot of people leaving the industry, as well as you know, the private sector being able to uh, get a lot more um, uh, higher wages than what often happens in the public sector. And so that's a challenge. We are moving forward with uh, a couple of those tentatively. Um, uh, we are seeing uh, if we get a superstar candidate, then we may uh, look to bring some of those folks on board. For, for that particular, um, for those positions, we get work that has to be done. We've got to do the plan checks. We've got to do the inspections. And so what we end up doing, um, and in fact, uh, just recently, um, you had a budget adjustment in front of you, whereby we had to transition some of our salary savings from our vacancies into our, um, our uh, consultant services budget. And so we end up paying our um, plan check and inspection consultants if we do not have the in-house staff. So we are trying to see if there's a great candidate out there for a couple of the uh, building and safety uh, vacancies right now. Um, and really, we're, we're looking to see what happens with the um, development activity across the board. But we are hopeful, uh, we're optimistic based on what we've heard from a lot of the folks that we've been talking to about the continuation of projects and even new projects that are, are coming in and inquiring. Great. Thanks. Of course. All right, Councilmember Watkins. 
Thank you. Thanks for the presentation, Lee. Um, in regards to the affordability kind of components that you were suggesting in terms of the permits, and you mentioned, uh, just for clarity, so you suggested that a, a good portion were ADUs that were um, falling into that into that category. Yes. Is that is that accurate? And, and do you know, because I know we've done so many things in terms of ADU policy, do you have an understanding of what it is that has now led to this sort of incentivizing around um, more affordability and, and ADUs? So uh, thanks for that question, Councilmember Watkins. Um, so there are sort of two parts there. Um, I'll tackle the first one, uh, which is, Yes, a big chunk of these are ADUs, um, and uh, there were 64 units on this one that are the 350 Ocean. This is building permits issued, um, and a big chunk of them were ADUs. When we did a survey um, this past summer, we inquired about rent levels, and what we were able to do is um, uh, extrapolate based on square footages of the ADUs, they were falling into different um, affordability levels. So not all of these, I, I do want to be clear, not all of these are deed restricted. Um, you know, the 64 units at 350 Ocean are deed restricted, for example, but the, uh, the majority of these are ADUs and those are not deed restricted, but they are um, more affordable by design by nature of their sharing space and by nature of their size. And so based on their size, we've, we've lumped them into these categories, um, whether they're um, low or moderate income. And then um, in terms of um, the um, incentives, uh, I think you know, the state has been doing a lot of things. Um, and, and I'll note that some of the things the state has done um, have uh, basically stolen from things that we did the year before. And so um, I think that shows that uh, we're doing some really good things with our ADU ordinances. And um, it's good to see that those are getting rolled out on a statewide level. Um, but all the things that the, the state is doing to um, promote affordable, or excuse me, promote um, accessory dwelling units, as well as um, what we are doing locally to go above and beyond the state, are encouraging homeowners to come in. There's certainly a, a big incentive over the next five years, um, which is the ability of um, new accessory dwelling units to not have an owner occupancy requirement. That is something that we required um, up until January 1st of this year. And um, through um, uh, next five years, four and a half years at this point, um, the state has said you cannot have an owner occupancy requirement. So I, um, I know that that has motivated some folks to um, get the ball rolling on their ADUs, and I expect that some of the uh, ADU production is related to that. Um, and some of these, uh, uh, but that said, these numbers are, are 2019 numbers. Um, so these are before that restriction uh, or that allowance came into effect. So um, we're going to continue tracking this and see how these numbers change in response to those uh, new regulations. But we are um, providing a lot of detailed information on our website now, and I think that's helping the community understand um, how uh, the restrictions have been loosened significantly over the past um, five to six years, and um, many people who um, weren't able to or didn't find it convenient to um, to uh, develop an ADU previously are now reconsidering that. That's great. Thank you. I just wanted to follow up on that question real quick. So when we talk about like this level of affordability as it relates to ADUs, but do you have any sense of what that kind of looks like? Because I know in addition to that, when we were discussing arena numbers last year, um, there were a fair amount of ADUs that went from moderate into some of those higher um, categories in terms of how affordable they were. So could you speak to like what percentage of these, as when we're saying that there's 83% of the housing uh, building permits that were issued were affordable, what level of affordability? Sure, so um, I will see if I can 
Uh, I will pull that up quickly and I'll share that screen with you um, just to give you an idea. And in fact, what I'll do is um, I will share the screen so that you all can see where you get to it. This is actually coming um, directly from our, um, our annual uh, housing element report. So all of these numbers are pulled from there. And I'm going to stop my screen sharing and then restart it. Let's see. See if I can get that. Um, well, since I'm having that technical difficulty, let's see if this is, yeah, it's not letting me. Let me try this. Uh, oh, there we go. It's on my other screen. So I'll stop the share there and start this one. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, there we go. On our, uh, so this is our planning and community development webpage. And if you scroll down to the documents link on the right hand side here, you can get the housing element annual report. And as you scroll down, um, this is page five of 16. You can see the um, actual categories for um, above moderate income, um, moderate income, deed restricted, moderate income. Um, non-deed restricted and so forth. So here's the 64 units from um, uh, 350 Ocean, and then we actually had 51 that, that qualified as low income, and that's based on those size thresholds. And um, I can follow up with you. Those size thresholds um, were in the housing element annual report, but I don't think that they're, um, yeah, they're not captured in this table. And so I don't recall those size thresholds off the top of my head. But this is where you can um, go and reference all of those um, individual projects and how we came to those numbers. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Council Member Matthews. Referencing the uh, question about vacancy on the org chart that was in our budget binder, there were or eight pink spaces. Are those pink spaces vacancies? <laughs> Reference back. <laughs> it, it looked like even more vacancies than, sh than showed up on the org chart, if that's what they are. It didn't say what pink meant. Oh, Sarah's there. <laughs> You're muted, Sarah. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, thank you for catching that. So that was an older org chart pre some of the uh, vacancies we filled. Okay. So we no longer okay. have any vacancies in admin, for example. So what you saw on Lee's chart is most updated. Okay, thank you. Vice Mayor Myers. <sighs> Hi, Lee. Thank you for your presentation. Um, you guys are doing uh, just Chugging along, it's great, it's great. Um, and I'm glad to see the, the new um, remodeled, um, you know, plan encounter up and operating, but nobody can be there right now, but it looks beautiful. So I'm glad that, that um, we did get that done and people will be there to use it soon. Yes. Um, I had a little bit of, I've been having a little problem with my, um, my cell phone and so going in and out a little bit. One question I have for you is are we, um, do we have, uh, are we required to update our housing element starting this year? Or is that, or is that a calendar year? So, um, I mean, a it's a, the, the current cycle is um, 2015 to 2023. And um, interesting that you ask because um, at your next council meeting, we will be um, presenting you with a request for authorization to apply for a grant to complete 
car housing element. And so um, that is um, one of the items that would provide us the guaranteed grant funding, and that's $300,000 that would be um, contributed towards our housing element. So we are required to update our housing element before December of uh, 2023. And that will be um, a significant effort, and that $300,000 will, will certainly go towards um, a big chunk of the work that we'll need to do in that. And do you see any risk? That's great that there's grant funding available. Have you heard through the state or anything that any of that those grants that grant funding may be jeopardized? I'm just curious. It's such an important thing. For, you know, this is an important time and period of, for us to be doing that work, and I'm just trying to forecast a little bit in terms of running into issues without being able to, um, and, and not being able to unfortunately update that element. So I'm just curious if you have your ear to the ground on that. I have not heard anything about that funding disappearing. Um, I believe uh, that specific funding was a part of a bill package that was passed. You know, we've got uh, the um, objective standards grant that we're working on right mm -hmm. now and this is a, mm -hmm. a later phase of that. And so I think that okay. all of that is, is in place and um, I'm not hearing anything uh, otherwise. And so fingers crossed that it will still remain for us. We're bound to update the housing element one way or the other. So hopefully we've got that okay. grant funding to assist. Okay, great. That was my only question. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there any further questions? Um, for Lee at this time. Okay, seeing none. Lee, thanks again for your presentation and for all the hard work that you and your staff are doing. Thank you. All right, take care. Have a great day. All right. Next up on our agenda is our sixth presentation of the day, which is the City Council, City Attorneys, City Managers, Clerks, and Community Programs presentation. And so for members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is a presentation that you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation by staff, followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to council for any follow-up questions or comments. And with that, uh, I will turn this presentation over to Laura Schmidt, Assistant City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. Are you all able to see my screen? Awesome. So as Mayor Cummings said, I'll be covering the City Manager's Office, then the City Council budget, and then I'll hand it over to Tony Condotti to speak briefly about the City Attorney's Office budget. The agenda is as everybody else has been doing, so I'm going to breeze right through that just as Lee did. The city manager's office is comprised of 14 and a half full-time equivalents. As the assistant city manager, I pretty much act as the city manager's department head for our area. We have a funded but unfilled communications manager vacancy right now, and then um, an assistant to the city manager, homelessness, sustainability and climate action, and uh, principal management analyst, uh, Ralph, who does communications and other uh, analytical work in our office. And then we have Suzanne as our executive assistant to the city manager, and then Bonnie leads up our clerk's functions. When I step back and look at the various uh, components and functions of our office that our 14 and a half staff execute, we have the city's clerk's function, which is quite distinct and um, intuitive to understand. And then administration, communication, and strategy comprise our overall administrative overhead, human resources work, and then the strategic work that we do with the council. And then on the other side of it, I look at it as ongoing programs and existing work that has come to our office that is usually citywide in nature and we do on a continuous basis. And then we do a lot of ad hoc project work where we're helping ideas develop through their process. We're staffing ad hoc committees that come up like the budget committee that was formed on, at the April 28th meeting, like the 
um, revenue committee that preceded it. So a little bit about our functions. Our city clerks, um, not only do they do all of the documentation and work behind the scenes for our, any of our council meetings, uh, but they are also the ones that staff our main public counter and our phones. So Anna, Sherry, and Rosemary do an amazing job of fielding calls and have to know enough about our entire city to be able to route uh, our community members with questions, either answering the questions directly themselves or getting them in touch with the right department or person within our organization that can help them. They act as our official city record keeper. They handle all of our public records requests. So any public records request goes through the city clerk's office to then be sold out to the respective departments or departments that actually can help answer the question. They staff the city council meetings. They pretty much take care of the council chambers in conjunction with information technology. And they manage our community TV relationship as well as all of our elections. And as uh, Justin acknowledged in a proclamation earlier, it's uh, Professional Municipal Clerks Week. So many thanks to uh, Bonnie and Julia and the rest of the clerk staff for all the work that they do. On the administration, communication, and strategy side, we oversee the city budget and the 12 departments, and we help support the city council with email correspondence and any other administrative support that they need. We also have recently really beefed up our communications function within the city manager's office, and then this has been critical in the COVID-19 response. And then we just do the day-to-day -day administration of all the human resources and personnel, all the contracts and purchasing. And Suzanne does an amazing job of handling hundreds of contracts and invoices and anything else that comes across her desk. We also staff joint powers authorities and um, we represent, for instance, at our Santa Cruz Regional 911. Uh, board and I sit on the animal shelter board. So we do staff various joint powers authority. And then overall, we are the hub of the strategic planning that crosses the city. And then we work uh, in lockstep with the city council to be able to put uh, the strategic plan together that we can then execute for you. On our programs and standing committee work, um, we have an amazing climate action and sustainability manager, uh, Tiffany Wise West. She's probably one of the leaders in this space in California. And I would even say possibly the nation. So she does an amazing job putting Santa Cruz on the map and keeping us on the leading edge of climate action and our, all of our sustainability and environmental work. We recently hired Brooke Newman as our new homelessness response manager. She just started a month ago in the middle of the pandemic, but uh, she's jumped right in and is doing an amazing job already. We house the independent police auditor function, and we also uh, lead the legislative program for the city. We do a lot of contract administration, and that includes the Santa Cruz County core programs and then the other social services grants that we coordinate with the county. And then we staff the various standing committees, the Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women, the Community Programs Committee, and then the Public Safety Committee. So those are the types of things that we do on an ongoing basis. And then on any given day, week, month, year, we will also get assigned special projects. Usually if there's a project that comes up and there is a department that has a subject matter expertise that can act as a lead department, they may end up taking that special project and running with it. But in the case, if a project crosses multiple departments or is more citywide, then that will come to the city manager's office and we'll staff and um, have somebody on point to lead that special project. Same thing happens with other ad hoc requests that may come up from the departments, the community, or the council members. We may uh, take an idea that initially comes up as a request, uh, do a little research, see if it's going to be seeded and sponsored, and if it'll turn into something else or won't be pursued, we'll do a lot of research on, on those types of ad hoc requests. The other types of work that we do, if there are ad hoc committees that come up, like the Community Advisory Committee on Homelessness, the Budget Committee, the Revenue Committee, we'll staff those um, dur during the duration of that ad hoc work, and then it'll sunset, and we'll move on to another committee that gets formed. 
what have we been doing in fiscal year 2020? So I just tried to highlight a few of the achievements for our office. On the homelessness front, we have staffed and facilitated the Community Advisory Committee on Homelessness. Uh, Ron Prince, who was here as a special projects manager, helped um, build the bridge to the National Guard so that we were able to occupy the armory for the first time in several years and get that in place um, as a winter location that was covered. And then uh, we developed the homelessness response position with the help of HR, and then we recruited and hired Brooke Newman last month. We've also worked with the city council to do an offsite and translate that um, work from the offsite into a six month work plan. And then we started our strategic plan with Nicole Young, and we'll be picking that up later on once the pandemic settles down, hopefully. And then um, last but not least, we have developed a council member on boarding manual that we were able to use with council member Byers and council member Golder. They were the beneficiary of over a hundred page document, which I am sure they've read end to end. The other thing we've done this year is developed a robust communication function. Uh, Ralph Americott came to us from the city of Santa, uh, San Diego and has done an amazing job help us, helping us beef this up. And without this communications function, we wouldn't, wouldn't have been able to do the public service announcements and uh, keep you and our community up to date during this COVID pandemic. So that's been some amazing work. Uh, my being a, a, a technical person, you know, in my heart of hearts as your former IT director, I went and did some uh, statistics running as far as a council meeting. And the city council meeting that the city clerk staff uh, staffs and, and does all the work, it's not just the meeting itself. Behind the scenes, uh, they touch every agenda report. They have to plan the meeting and figure out the timing of it. Uh, respond to and attach all the public correspondence to agenda reports. They have to deal with all the in-meeting logistics, both the normal day-to-day -day and the emergencies that happen when a mic breaks or something like that. They do action summaries and minutes. They scan information. Um, they do all the budget adjustments that come out of the city council meeting and the resolutions and proclamations and everything. So there's a lot of work that goes to standing at the council meeting. I counted and we've had 22 meetings, including special ones um, through April 28th meeting. That equivalent, that was about 176 hours. And on average, you guys were in your regular meetings for 9.6 hours. The longest meeting took 12 hours and 47 minutes um, this last fiscal year. And I pondered in my mind, what takes about 13 hours? And so I went out to Google and it said on average that the average person spends about 13 hours in their email in one week. So you did that in one night in one council meeting. And then I recalled, I was like 13 hours, that sounds vaguely familiar. How long was I in labor with my kids? So on average, apparently, the average baby takes six to 12 hours to deliver. So you guys went beyond the average of delivering a baby in just one council meeting. And I think in total you had maybe even four council meetings that were 12 hours or more. So Justin, if, uh, I doubt you'll deliver a baby, but you've gone through a longer council meeting than it takes on average to deliver one. Our city manager's office budget is $6.2 million and covers multiple activities. From this section, the city manager's office budget with personnel and services and supplies is about 33%. Uh, the uh, Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women is 1% as well as the police auditor function. And then city clerk takes up 16% with climate action and our membership and dues at 3% apiece. Our animal shelter contribution to that joint powers authority is 10% of our budget. And then between our two social services buckets, one for core and the set aside program that we run every year and community programs and services and the coordination of programs with the county, uh, those take up 33% in total as well. Our non-status quo highlights for fiscal year 21 in the city manager's office activities, 
uh, under city planned events, we are have requested an additional news service to be able to find out when the city of Santa Cruz is mentioned out in any press or internet service, as well as a little bit of a bump in our advertising budget. Uh, we've moved health and all policies as an ongoing funding from the city council to the city manager's office. It was previously its first time in city council budget at 20,000. And then you guys requested that be bumped to 25,000. So that is in the city manager's budget. And we also increased the police auditor budget slightly. It hadn't been increased in quite a few years. On the clerk side, we are uh, finding that the election budget is has not been sufficient. And then for the community television budget, we have added closed captioning, which is a requirement by law. And we've met with CTV, the service that they offer, and we've received the estimate and included that in our budget, as well as the advertising that the clerk's office needs to do for um, various uh, resolutions and changes to our um, just the noticing requirements that we have to do our current advertising budget is not sufficient. The other status quo items in our budget, memberships and dues are things that increase that we don't really have um, control over. So if the League of California Cities, for instance, increases their dues, we just include the increase in our budget. On the community programs and services side, uh, we know that our downtown outreach worker and our mental health liaison programs that uh, the county helps us with, uh, they received uh, cost of living adjustments and those cost of living adjustments have been passed on to us. So there's an increase in those two programs. Additionally, the point in time count is coming up again. That's an every two year function. So that has been added to this budget. And there are looming adjustments that we don't know enough of yet. But uh, as a, for instance, for the homelessness front, we went from a win winter shelter only model and that's what was budgeted last fiscal year. And as you now know, we have gone to a year round model. So that is going to inherently increase our budget substantially on um, just that aspect of the community programs piece. Moving on to the city council budget, the city council budget is around $466,000. It's split between 70% in personnel and 30% in supplies and services. The brunt of your uh, budget in those areas are in a couple of accounts and I emailed you all um, and we have available later for discussion if you would like to go through it, the non-status quo aspects of your professional services and your miscellaneous service and supplies accounts. And we can go into that if you would like to later. Um, the city attorney's office, I'd like to hand it over to Tony Condotti at this point, if you could jump in. Tony. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor Cummings, members of the City Council. Uh, my pleasure to present the City Attorney's uh, portion of this presentation today. Uh, our mission is to provide uh, the City uh, legal counsel and to advocate on behalf of the City and to support municipal operations and programs and community policies. Um, pardon me. We're proud of the fact that as a private law firm, we are public servants in the community we live in, and we strive to work with the city council, city manager, and city departments in making Santa Cruz a healthier, safer, and more equitable place to live for all members of the community. And our, to accomplish our mission, we strive to support the city council in the accomplishment of its critical and top priorities uh, to provide objective, accurate, and timely legal advice that facilitates informed decision-making and effective policy development by the council and its implementation by the city manager and staff. And to provide the council, uh, boards, commissions, and city departments with high quality, efficient, and effective legal services, advice, and opinions, and to represent the city's interests in litigation, contractual agreements, negotiations, uh, in land use, water, and planning, and building issues, 
in law enforcement issues and to serve the community and the interests of justice with effective prosecution of municipal code violations and code enforcement. Uh, to those whose familiarity with our office is limited to the observation of council meetings, it, seem, it may seem like we're primarily there to provide advice on the Brown Act and rules of meeting decorum. But in fact, we are a dedicated team of nine lawyers, six full-time and three part-time, two full-time paralegals, an office manager, and two administrative staff. Uh, the agenda packet that you are provided we have carefully reviewed or participated in the preparation of uh, most or all of the items on the agenda, whether it's presented by the city manager's office, the public works department, water, parks, parks and rec, planning or finance. Uh, this of course includes your ordinances, resolutions and every one of the contracts that are typically approved without comment on your consent agenda. We're also deeply involved in a myriad of issues that generally don't come, come before the council at all from day-to-day -day advice to representing the city in civil litigation and criminal administ and administrative code enforcement and collections matters. Uh, in terms of achievement, that's a little bit tricky for me because uh, of the nature of our function. Uh, and I feel like we share somewhat in the achievements that have been reached by the city as a whole uh, over the course of the past year. A couple of things that I am particularly proud of, however, uh, I'm proud of the way that my office has handled the city's response to homelessness over the past year, uh, particularly in the wake of the Martin versus Boise decision, which continues to reverberate throughout uh, the Ninth Circuit and the United States uh, in general following the Supreme Court's rejection of a petition for writ of cert in that matter. Uh, that, of course, is still a work in progress, uh, and it has been since I joined the city in 1993. But we worked closely with the city manager's office, the police department, uh, and departments in addressing both the nuisance conditions associated with homeless encampments and nuisance uh, behaviors, but also ensuring that our actions are implemented in a thoughtful way that respects the rights of the community as a whole, as well as those experiencing homelessness, and that protects the city from potential liability under the careful scrutiny of homeless activists, advocates, <coughs> and activists, and civil rights groups like the ACLU and the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty. I think it's significant that under the very uh, tense situations that we've uh, experienced with regard to homelessness over the last year. The city had not uh, been sued uh, by any of those organizations. And we've tried to maintain effective relationships with uh, those, those entities as well. I'm proud of the way that we've maintained effective and constructive working relationships with seven individual council members over the, uh, over the years whose views on a variety of issues have often been very different. And, uh, and uh, this past year has been particularly want, uh, a difficult one in terms of the issues that have come before the council uh, and, and council interrelations, to be frank. Um, and then thirdly, I want to give a shout out to my litigation team led by Cassie Bronson, but also um, Tori uh, Thompson and Barbara Choi uh, and Stephanie Duck. We've successfully resolved a number of litigation matters favorably for the city uh, in this past year. And by favorably, I mean that we've settled cases uh, in an amount that was substantially less than our assessment of the potential liability exposure, and thereby avoided significant litigation costs and potential liability. In addition, we've prevailed outright in a number of matters, including uh, going back to the end of last fiscal year, the Quintero matter in which the city uh, initiated a process to uh, close down the Ross encampment behind the, the Ross Dress for Less in the Gateway Plaza Shopping Center. And the plaintiffs filed a lawsuit in the United States District Court seeking to enjoin the city's closure of that encampment on constitutional grounds. In this fiscal year, we were successful in obtaining the outright dismissal of the case and also thwarted the plaintiff's attempt to appeal the dismissal to the Ninth Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals. Uh, a more recent example is, uh, just goes back to last Friday, 
in which the United States District Court for the Northern District of California granted the city's motion to dismiss in David Myberg versus the city of Santa Cruz, which is a lawsuit that was first filed in February of 2019 and at the time included 32 separate legal causes of action against the city and against 12 city employees in police, planning, and parks and rec departments. In this case, the plaintiffs broadly alleged a citywide conspiracy related to the enforcement of the city's search school ordinance and a separate code enforcement matter. Theories of liability include the federal Sherman Act, which relates to antitrust violations, unfair competition laws, First Amendment retaliation claims, and a civil rights cause of action alleging an illegal search of Mr. Myberg's property. The plaintiffs sought well over $150,000 in damages in that case, plus attorney's fees and costs, which could have easily been over $150,000. I would add that it was resolved at the pleading stage, which means that the city did not file an answer. There was no discovery, and so the litigation was very inexpensive for the city relative to the potential exposure and the issues in the case. On January 20th, we obtained dismissal of the case of Chase Mason versus the city of Santa Cruz, a federal civil rights lawsuit against the city, which alleged that the Santa Cruz Police Department improperly and inadequately investigated a traffic incident where he was injured. The plaintiffs sought over $100,000 in damages, plus attorney's fees, which could have easily been well over another $100,000, so significant savings on that case. And then the Gomez case involved a police pursuit of a suspect who drove in the wrong direction, approaching traffic on the Highway 17 and crashed into the plaintiff's car. The plaintiffs filed a federal civil rights lawsuit against the city and the police department, and our office settled the case for no money out of pocket in exchange for a waiver of a $7,500 discovery sanction award that our office obtained against the plaintiff's counsel. Plaintiffs had previously attempted to negotiate a settlement in the multiple $10,000 range. In terms of budget, this is a budget estimate prepared by the finance department in consultation with my office. It's a little tricky because the cost the city incurs for legal services are dependent on the demand for legal services to meet the needs of the city, which fluctuates. You can see just over two-thirds is allocated to general legal services, providing advice, preparing or reviewing ordinances, resolutions, and contracts, and attending city council meetings and other meetings on request, and working with staff on a daily basis. General legal services are provided on a flat rate basis for the first 275 hours per month and a discounted blended hourly rate thereafter. I would note that in 2018, we voluntarily increased the number of hours provided on a flat rate basis from 260 to 275 hours with no increase in cost to the city, which effectively resulted in a 4.5% decrease in the cost of general legal services at our blended hourly rate. And our blended hourly rate has not increased since 2017. The rest of the pie is primarily litigation and code enforcement, and that, again, the cost incurred by the city is heavily dependent on factors that are only partially within our control. Our rates for special legal services, likewise, have not been adjusted since 2017, and we are not proposing any changes for the upcoming fiscal year. In sum, it has been my pleasure to serve as your city attorney for the past five years and to serve the city in some capacity since 1993 when I joined this law office. I'm blessed to have a dedicated team of lawyers and staff, all of whom are proud of the work we do and its impact on the city and its residents, and I am happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you, Tony, for that presentation and for all the work that your staff does, and thank you, Laura, as well, and for all the hard work that we have happening in the city manager's office and the city clerk's office. Our next case is Jeffrey Hoffman v. Santa Cruz Unified School District.
are there any questions from council members at this time? Councilmember Watkins. I just have a, a quick question. Um, yes, thank you for your presentation. Thank you, Laura, for reminding us of these really long meetings we had. <laughs> I think I remember that meeting. And I remember having to present at one of my daughter's school the day after and remind, tell the students that we started one day and ended the next. So <laughs> anyways, um, I, um, my question actually is for you, Tony, in regards to sort of the status quo, did you feel like last year was sort of an outlying year given all of the kind of the legal uh, stuff that we had going on, or do you anticipate that same level of demand this, this year as well? So um, I, I do think it was an outlying year in, in one respect in particular. Um, well, in two respects, really. It, it, the, the first is that the issue of homelessness in light of the Martin case was front and center uh, with our office um, in a way that it's never been before. And it, and it generated a lot of of work, not just on the Quintero matter, but on uh, managing issues that the, that the Parks Department and the Police Department and City Manager's Office have been dealing with. Um, we've been much more involved in the day-to-day -day response to homelessness, um, I think as has city staff in general in the past year. And the second is with respect to the demand for services uh, from the City Council. I think last year was probably um, let me take a step back. We only started tracking uh, the, the time that we spend on city managers on city matters by department a couple of years ago. So it's really hard for me to provide an accurate assessment. But in terms of the hours that we've spent uh, on uh, directly responding to requests from the city council, I think that was significantly higher as well. Thank you. All right, Council Member Byers. Oh, this, uh, Laura, first for you, I, you're right. I have not sat down and read the whole onboarding manual. However, <laughs> I do pick it up, you know, every once in a while, it, it's a reference guide. And because I, you know, things have changed a little bit and uh, department heads have changed, so it, it's been helpful, thank you. Uh, no You're questions, but just, uh, and Suzanne has been outstanding because I'm always needing something. It's interesting having to sort of set up a home office. So uh, she's been it is. so helpful, you know, with my iPad, and now I got Stanford instead of propping it up with pillows, and it's just constantly one thing after another, but she's been outstanding. And t uh, for you, Tony, ooh, I'm running out of battery. Um, it's nice to be back and it's nice working with you again. And I, you're very generous whenever I call or something. And I appreciate that because it's usually a last minute, you know, question and thank you. Well, a, 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 a not a very well-known secret is I generally clear my calendars on the Monday and Tuesday before <laughs> council meeting for that purpose. Exactly. So happy to do it. All right, Vice Mayor Myers. Uh, um, yeah, Laura and Tony, thank you for the presentations. And um, yeah, Tony, especially some of the things that you noted were really helpful to hear about the work that you're doing in your office um, with regards to litigation and, and other matters. Sometimes, sometimes those are things that community doesn't realize that you know, along with everything else, we we also are having to do that kind of work as well. Um, I just wanted to recognize um, the city manager's department and the staff there. Um, I know the homeless response and the, um, you know, the just the difficulty of facing our communities with the unhoused populations um, and people and the folks that we have here. Um, you guys do an amazing job and, um, you know, you, you act in a very respectful way and I think that, um, you know, you just need to be recognized for the work that you do do and the way that you've integrated, um, you know, both national and state models and standards to really try to address, you know, a, a, um, a crisis that we have, not just in Santa Cruz, but throughout the West, Western United States. So just wanted to recognize you guys for that. Um, and I know it's a really difficult um, public policy 
uh, issue, and I think you do it with uh, with great um, uh, great dignity. And I just want to just point out uh, that work that you do for our community. So thank you for that work. I appreciate that. And even though we just hired Brooke Newman, Susie and Megan in the city manager's office have been holding down the fort and doing amazing work for the last one to two years in this space. So they, they need to be acknowledged as well for all the hard work that they've done before we were able to develop and fund this position. Thank you. I see Martin Bernal has his hand raised. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor and Council. I just wanted to also just thank the staff in our office who do amazing work and were able to really quickly pivot to responding to the, the COVID uh, uh, virus, which was uh, you know, instrumental in, in us being able to, to get ahead and, and be responsive to the community. And uh, if you just think about everything that uh, we've put in place to respond, it's been really incredible and amazing work. And uh, uh, the, the team in our office, as well as the, the whole department head team, really deserves uh, a lot of credit for that, and I want to thank them. And uh, lastly, I, I've, I've attended council meetings for like, what, 23 years? I think there's been probably hundreds of thousands of kids born a lot of the council meetings, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Governor Brown. Yeah, thank you, uh, Laura and Tony for the presentations and definitely a big thank you to all of the staff in the city manager's and city clerk's office. Um, I won't, I'll just echo all the comments that have been made so far without repeating. Um, and then, and Tony, I wanted to also thank you for uh, this time around really highlighting the behind the scenes work that, that goes on and, and laying that out for us because I think it is something that um, the the public is probably not so much aware of, and even for ourselves, because you know we have interactions with you during the council meetings and closed sessions, and also of course when we call you usually last minute, and you know you, your office, you and your office are always very very accessible and uh, reachable, and you get back to us quickly, and it, it's just so helpful to know that we can get that kind of advice, um, good advice, uh, kind of on the spot. So. Um, yeah, to send send a thanks as well to everybody in your office and um, keep on keeping on. I, for, for some reason, I think everybody in my office has been watching the whole budget presentation today. <laughs> <laughs> what to my surprise? Uh, Councilmember Matthews. And this is their 15 minutes of <laughs> um, thank Thank you both for your, your presentations. And again, um, the um, ability to uh, grapple professionally with very high profile emerging issues. And, you know, at the same time, um, the remarks about all the work that goes into the relentless every two weeks meetings. I mean, everything, all the different reports, hands on the reports, eyeballs, et cetera, that, that have to sink in apparently seamlessly, <laughs> but it's not. I mean, it's it's not without a whole lot of work. So it's so appreciated week in, week out. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, at this time, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to the public to provide comments or if anyone from the public has a question. So if you're interested in commenting on the city council, city attorney, city managers, clerks, community programs, budget presentation, uh, now's the time when you can call in. And after you have followed the instructions to join the meeting, you'll want to press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And when it's your time to speak, you'll hear an announcement that you've been unmuted and you will have two minutes to speak.
seeing that there's no members of the public who are wishing to join to comment on this item. Uh, I'm going to bring it back to council for any further comments. Uh, council member Watkins. Thank you, Mayor. I just had one last um, question, but really want to echo my colleagues' um, sense of appreciation for our entire city manager's department and staff, and city attorney staff, and um, we get to see firsthand just your stellar team working on an ongoing basis and just really high caliber group. So um, thank you to everybody. I can't wait to see you again, hopefully soon. I miss seeing them in the office. But I had a quick question in regards to the to the core funding. I forgot to um, ask earlier, is that, what's the um, sort of the thoughts around that in terms of the cycle and next steps? Because I think it's, I remember it being extended the year. So if you could, or if you have any idea of what that's looking like, um, I just wanted to get a sense of that. So the budget that we put in for fiscal year 21 per county directive, it's the status quo from the previous year. They were in the process of going through a new um, strategic planning and coordination process to create a new RFP and develop a new methodology for the next round after next year. But that was um, smack dab in the middle of, of ramping up in Feb January, February, March, and then the pandemic hit. So from what I understand at this point is um, we're probably going to add on another year of, of carrying forward the existing allocations, but they may be able to squeeze in some COVID related applicability to where the funding disbursement goes, but that's still to be determined. So at this point, we carried forward from fiscal year 20, the same programs to 21, and then um, the county will let us know as they get back into things if they're going to change the allocation methodology at all. Great, thank you. All right, cool. Tony, thank you again, and thank, thank all your staff for all the hard work they do. And um, I'd also like to just echo the uh, special thanks to the city manager's office, especially for um, how rapid they were to respond to um, even when we were just beginning to hear about COVID-19 coming into our area. I think that it's because of those efforts to really um, kind of shut things down really quickly and shelter in place really quickly that have aided in our ability to have uh, a very low transmission rate and a low occurrence of COVID-19 within our community. And so um, thank you all for your hard work and, and great decision making and leadership. Thanks. We appreciate that Thank feedback. You. And as Martine said, it's been a huge team effort. So all the departments have banded together. So it's been a wonderful sight to see everything, everybody working so well together. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right, we will move on to our next presentation for the day, which is from our police department. And so for members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is a presentation you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation by staff followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to council for any follow-up questions or comments. And so at this time, if uh, Chief Andy Mills is on the line, uh, we can move on to your presentation. Uh, good, morning, uh, good afternoon, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we're having trouble getting the uh, video portion because the host has stopped it. So maybe Laura can open it for us if somebody else can. There we go. Well, uh, first of all, thank you so much for the opportunity to share what the Santa Cruz Police Department has been doing. And, uh, and uh, on behalf of all of the men and women who uh, work as officers, detectives, rangers, uh, CSOs, our professional staff, uh, we couldn't be more thrilled with the team environment that we have and pressing forward with some uh, fantastic initiatives that we believe can really make a significant difference here in the city of Santa Cruz. You know, it's interesting that as we press forward during the year, um, if you come up and you wind up with a worldwide pandemic that uh, throws everything uh, off kilter. Uh, but the response from the men and women who are the essential servants of our community 
They switched to 12 hour shifts immediately. They worked around the clock. They did everything they could possibly do to make this community safe in spite of the uh, apparent risk to themselves. And what was interesting to me as the chief and having done this for 42 years, uh, I did not hear one ounce of complaining or hesitation, but just charging full speed ahead, making sure that we did everything we could possibly do uh, to work with the community and make sure that uh, people were safe. So my undying gratitude goes to the men and women of the Santa Cruz Police Department and all sides of the department, both sworn and civilian. You know, we started off with the mission statement that you can see on the screen is that we're committed to self serve selflessly and compassionately through collaboration and innovation. And I think that really sparks for me what we have tried to do over the last couple of years here in the Santa Cruz Police Department. Think about how we work with the community to collaborate with them and then to innovate and find ways to target specific problems and deal with those problems as opposed to randomly doing enforcement where it doesn't make sense. And so as a result, I think what you've seen is our folks uh, very heavily focused on solving problems uh, in our community and uh, pursuing criminals absolutely where it's, uh, where it's needed and necessary and doing so in a way that's transparent and responsive to our community needs. So as we go through this uh, presentation, I'm gonna have uh, Deputy Chief Escalante uh, start off with uh, talking about uh, what he sees from his position as the Administrative Deputy Chief, and then our budget analyst, Trisha Dodge, will give you the information on our budget and what that takes a look, uh, looks like. So we'll break this into a few areas. Uh, we'll be bouncing back and forth between the three of us, and uh, to make it, sure you can hear us, we'll be unmasked during our talk, and the rest of the time we'll have masks on and uh, keep it our social distance. So first up will be Deputy Chief Escalante, and uh, to give you a department overview, our achievements, uh, talk about our core services, and then uh, Patricia will talk about the working uh, budget and the status quo budget, and then some of the unavoidable costs that we're going to incur this upcoming year, and then uh, obviously certainly handle any questions that you might have. So first up is uh, Deputy Chief Escalante. Oh, never mind, I'm taking the, uh, I've been corrected by, uh, by my staff. Uh, this is our organizational chart that you see in front of you. We have two significant divisions. One is administrative, that handles investigations, recruitment, uh, our management analysts, our records section, and uh, they're a pretty darn busy unit. Uh, as part of this, uh, we were authorized to hire up to 102 people. We've actually, uh, our 94 budgeted positions, and we are currently at 91 sworn positions with 20 people in background. So there's no doubt in our mind that we could uh, well go well over the budgeted uh, positions. However, we've obviously put a uh, put the brakes on because of the COVID-19 crisis, and we're going to wait and see how this shakes out uh, over the upcoming uh, little bit. We have 12 CSOs, 12 Rangers, and 18 professional staff that are budgeted uh, positions also. On the operations side is uh, headed by Deputy Chief Lippo, and he has all the uniform personnel in our department. Uh, this last year, we screened 1,100 applicants. We put 433 applicants uh, through the investigation process, excuse me, uh, screening process, and then 45 people went through backgrounds, we hired 20. So we're almost at completely full staffing. And uh, for the first time in many, many years, and that's due to the hard work of a lot of staff members, including Wes Morey, uh, Scott uh, Gardner, uh, Dan Flippo, Bernie Escalante, and a lot of other officers who did the uh, screening of these folks, as well as our background investigators, which have done a great job. So uh, this is the structure of the department, and uh, now we're moving forward. And uh, we'll have to adapt and move and overcome the challenges that lie ahead. But we're uh, ready to go and make sure that we have it. Bernie? All right. Good afternoon, Mayor Cummings and council members. Uh, so, as the chief was mentioning, uh, related to our staffing, one of the uh, many achievements that we're very proud of here uh, is we were able to put together two specialty teams. Uh, due to our staffing levels, we were able to pull some folks out of our patrol division um, and have them focus on special uh, neighborhood problems that we could try to apply different strategies to this and, and find some solutions. 
the HERO team, which stands for the Homeless Engagement Resource Officer, um, that team uh, brings a different type of strategy. Um, they do very little, if any, enforcement, but they work closely and collaboratively with other city departments and, and the county to find resources for people that uh, have found themselves living in the uh, on the streets of the city of Santa Cruz and, and try to find solutions for them and get to the root of the problem of why they are, are living homeless. So then the second team, the neighborhood enforcement, uh, neighborhood policing team, they apply a different strategy. They, uh, they go out and do, you know, uh, strict enforcement. They're using the law enforcement tools and the laws and ordinances given to us to uh, as a different type of strategy to solve problems within a neighborhood. Uh, they also work very closely with other city departments to uh, find solutions to the problem. So both these teams were a luxury uh, for us in the sense of once we were able to get our staffing levels up, we were able to raise our level of service to the community and solving solving problems. Um, we are extremely proud of the strides that we've made over the year of 2019 related to threat assessment and, and de-escalation. Uh, our staff has gone through a tremendous amount of de-escalation training, crisis intervention training. Uh, we were able to purchase tools to make our officers uh, more effective in the field related to de-escalating uh, very dangerous situations that ultimately ended, ended safely instead of tragically. So we're very proud of that. Um, one of the things we also did, if you remember in 2019, we uh, hosted the POP conference, the problem-oriented policing uh, conference here in the city of Santa Cruz, first time ever and had hundreds of uh, representatives from law enforcement, uh, you know, scientists from all over the, the world that, that came here to the city of Santa Cruz to really study the profession of, of policing. Um, and lastly was a threat assessment. We, uh, we also established our own threat assessment protocol that is currently being used across the country. And what that does is really gives us a tool to assess uh, mass casualty threats that we oftentimes see you know, over the internet or social media or something to really give us an idea of what the problem is that we're dealing with. Uh, the volunteer program, we are extremely proud of the men and women uh, of this program. They have brought so much to our organization. Um, the program has built up to over 40 uh, volunteers uh, in, the, in 2019. Uh, I got some stats here that are really amazing. Uh, the folks in 2019, they put in over 400, I'm sorry, 4,500 hours of service for our organization and for the community of Santa Cruz. Uh, and that's compared to just over 1,100 hours in uh, 2018. So uh, the 40 plus members that we have as our volunteer in our volunteer program have done a, a tremendous job Again, thinking of different ways to provide a high level of service to, to the city, uh, and these folks have done a great job for us. And last but uh, not least, of course, one of our uh, main functions is to uh, pre prevent or, or reduce crime. And so these numbers will show you a, a trend over the last four years of uh, accomplishing exactly that. Um, in all of these categories, you will see from 2016 to, to 2019, um, the men and women of this organization have worked extremely hard and have uh, really produced great results for the, for the community as, in relation to the prevention or reduction of, of crime. And I believe at this point, uh, Patricia will now take over related to the specific budget conversation. Oh, no, I'm sorry. One more. Uh, our core services. Um, you know, enforcement is one of the ones that's out front and center all the time, every day, every night. Um, 
investigations. Um, in, in 2019, the detectives in our investigations section uh, addressed over 1,600 cases throughout the year, uh, all the way from you know, major violent crimes to uh, property crimes. Our community involvement, or also I'd like to refer to it as community relations. Um, we, over the last couple of years, have built such a great relationship with uh, the stakeholders in our community through social media, the volunteer program that we already mentioned, um, and just all of the continuous outreach has created uh, such a great trusting relationship, uh, an inclusive relationship with our community that has um, really built um, itself over the last couple of years through a lot of hard work with Joyce Blasky and our community relations um, unit. And then lastly, uh, records, our records section, they really do all the important work behind the scenes that nobody really gets to see. Uh, but just a, an outstanding number I'd like to share. In 2019, they processed over 15,000 police reports and 6,500 citations. On top of that, they managed to uh, work through, on average, 54 public records requests every month for the year of 2019. So that group uh, of men and women should be commended um, just as much as the men and women out in the, uh, out in the field every day uh, for their hard work behind the scenes. Um, next, I'm going to talk about our budget. Um, in terms of our status quo budget, I'm zooming way out here so that you can see the big picture. So, as usual, 82% of our budget is strictly for personnel costs. The other two slices of the pie are professional services and then basically everything else. So, this is the big picture. And now I'm going to take you into a deep dive of our professional services contract. So again, this is only 9% of our total budget. And the vast majority of this 9% is um, dedicated to our 911 call center contribution, the joint power agreement. Um, in, in addition to that, the little small pieces of our professional service contract budget, um, our janitorial services are 3%. Special Assault Nurse Examiner Program, which will now be in the County of Santa Cruz, that's 3%. We spend 3% of this 9% of our budget on um, background investigations, and that's something we do before hiring folks onto our workforce. And then the next biggest category is Ocean Street um, Private Security. So you'll see there are a few other items that take up 1% and a lot of much smaller professional service contracts. Um, items that are less than 1% of this 9% of our budget. Um, in terms of the other slice of the pie, another 9% of our total budget, 24% is dedicated to um, surety bonds. This is a category that we actually don't have control over. Um, you'll see that 11% is spent on small tools and equipment, and that's a little bit bigger this year than last year because we need to upgrade our mobile communications units that are in all of our vehicles. Um, and that's an upgrade that needs to happen as a piggyback to the RNS system upgrade um, that we're involved with. Our vehicle work order charges are shifting as more of our vehicles are being um, procured through the enterprise. Uh, program, which seems to be saving us a, a good chunk of money, which allows us to expand the small tools and equipment budget um, to accommodate those new in-car computers. Aside from that, um, safety, clo clothing, and equipment, that's only 4% of this 9% of our budget, um, and 4% on telecommunications services, 4% on our building um, and facility and base maintenance. And then we included a whole lot of details on the far right side in terms of our other smaller costs um, that are dedicated to this part of the budget. So in terms of what's not status 
Expo this year, we actually were able to do a pretty amazing job of accommodating all of the other cost increases within our budget, um, mostly because of savings on vehicle lease costs. Um, one area that we were not able to accommodate into a status quo budget was the cost increase of the 911 call center. So our bill goes up um, this coming year by $30,006, $30, and that's what we weren't able to absorb. So historically over time, this has not um, factored into a status quo budget for the police department. It's sort of something that is assumed to go up every year. And with that, uh, do you have any questions? All right, thank you for that presentation and thank you for all the hard work you all have been doing, especially um, given the constraints of COVID-19 and, and all the concerns with it. Uh, you all continue to do a great job for our community and we appreciate everything you do. Uh, I'll turn it over to Council Member Brown for the first question. I thank you for the presentation. Uh, lots of good information in there. And thank you for all the work you're doing. Um, everybody on the force uh, right now, I know is a very challenging time. Uh, and uh, your, uh, your willingness to kind of step forward and, and find a way to uh, continue to provide uh, critical public safety services for our community is, is very much appreciated. Um, I have a couple of questions, two are uh, relatively small and then I have a bigger picture. Um, so um, uh, when you're talking about expenses, um, the sexual assault nurse moving to the county, I think I've kind of vaguely tracked this, but um, does that mean that there would be a budget reduction as part of that? Um, I'm. I'm wondering if we then would be supporting uh, the the program and through a contribution to the county um, or what's happening there. And then just kind of a, a small one, and maybe I've heard this before and I just don't remember, but what is Pepperball maintenance? It's, I just, am, it made me curious. It's probably a very small amount, but what is that? Um, and then the, the final question is kind of the, the bigger question uh, related to uh, you know, everything's in flux, I know, but uh, given the challenges that we're kind of, we're faced with now and probably into the future, how are you thinking about, uh, are you thinking about maintaining the, the organizational structure and uh, um, kind of policing the regional or neighborhood policing teams and the HEROES team, or is there any reorganization that w is going to need to happen? Um, just what's, you know, what are you thinking along those lines? Um, on your first two questions, the sexual assault nurse program moving to the county will increase costs for our department. Okay. Um, however, those were costs we were able to absorb in our budget, so they're not beyond the status quo. Pepperball um, is a $500 a year cost, and that is one of our de-escalation tools. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, there's, an there's an expiration date on the on the gas that's in the vault, and so you have to replace them. That's the purpose of it. Um, as far as what the organizational structure will look like uh, once we get through this, I'm not sure yet. Um, we're waiting to kind of find out what the negotiations look like uh, with the city manager's uh, office, council, and, and the, and the uh, associations. And so depending on what that looks like, there very well could be after have to be a restructuring of some kind um, and reducing the level of service that we're able to give to the community. Uh, but we'll see what that looks like and if there's a way to work around it. Uh, we're committed to neighborhood policing no matter what form it's in. Uh, and that is the strategy that we're using as a community. And I think that the crime data showing a slide from 2016 uh, is indicative of uh, of us being on the right track, um, but uh, we're adaptable, we'll, we'll move, and uh, as General Crystal said, you have to uh, you have to make sure that uh, you're changing for the environment, so we're changing. Thank you. All right, Council Member Byers. Thank you. Um, hello, Andy. Uh, I think of your arrival, and uh, it was like double whammy, you were brand new, but right then that Boise homeless case came out, which I think had a huge impact on 
the way we do things and our homeless population. And uh, Tony certainly uh, talked about it, but because uh, right off the bat, we had to take a look at the homeless a little bit differently. And I just want to commend you because I knew it could not, it hadn't, what I want to say, I'm sure it wasn't easy. We've had long time protocols that we've been doing in Santa Cruz and this sort of made that a little topsy-turvy. So I just want to thank you for your work on that and, and how you how you managed it. I'm sure it's not quite over yet uh, adapting to that, uh, but I appreciate it. And I would only run into you, uh, and we're always talking about the homeless because that is what I was so involved in. So now it's nice to get a wider view of the department uh, and what you're all doing. Um, and so good job. and. Call me, you know, I'll, I'll call you, but if you've got any questions or want to seek my advice, uh, I wish you would do that. I think that was the only question, not really a question. Oh, and then the third whammy is now we have the uh, pandemic. So all three of those have been a really unusual time. Uh, I think no other questions. Well, thank you for that, uh, Council Member, and we appreciate your support. Our entire department does. It's, it's the men and women who are out in the field taking care of business that are actually getting the stuff done, and uh, we appreciate their efforts. You know, uh, going back to uh, Mr. Kandati's presentation, I really do appreciate the expert counsel that I've gotten from him, and that real early on when uh, we, he and I collaborated and made sure that uh, we were on the same page because we were pretty sure the Supreme Court decision was coming, which it did. And it put us in a place uh, to avoid uh, significant litigation because of, I think, what was uh, good decisions made at the, at, the, at the head of the city. So um, we're in a good spot right now, and, but we need to deal with some of these magnanimous problems. All right, Council Member Matthews. Um, I was glad to hear that you're uh, almost fully hired to the budgeted number. I'm curious, um, compared to sometimes in the past, uh, how many, um, what do I want to say, uh, not in active service because of injuries or leave or something like that. So are those all on the street or um, what's the uh, kind of temporarily out of commission number there? Yeah, so thank you for that. Um, at one point, we had, uh, I believe, was 18 people in our department. And right now, we're down to two. Oh, my God. Uh, so working with the human resources and working with um, helping people that need to be retired because their injuries they were not going to be able to come back from, uh, as well as transitioning people out in terms of retirement, uh, we've been able to hire and, and get us almost full staffing. Uh, we do have, uh, I think, uh, seven people in the academy right now, and, uh, and I think a couple of people in field training, but everybody else is deployed in the field other than uh, two people who are currently uh, injured, and one was off to the injury, the other one was an on duty injury. So we really feel positive. We're doing, we're, you know, in a good space and doing, uh, doing well. Thank you. If I had a question um, regarding just the like how well your the performance of the department's been, kind of seeing these downward trends in crime statistics, and I kind of the question is kind of related to the structure of the department. So, is there any? I mean, given that it seems like a lot of engagement that the police officers have are with people who are homeless or experiencing kind of mental health issues within our community, is there any sense of kind of expanding, uh, if we continue to see these downward trends in crime statistics, expanding more of those um, homeless engagement resource officer teams um, versus kind of the neighborhood policing, like how, how do you kind of foresee it? And I know that, you know, we're all kind of, um, it's a black box right now with regards to COVID, but just kind of, you know, as we're seeing these trends go down, what are your thoughts on um, kind of having bigger homeless engagement teams versus neighborhood policing. Yeah, so thank you for that, Mr. Mayor. I think that uh, there's a couple of things that are uh, salient points here. Uh, the HERO team has been very instrumental in helping us achieve some goals, some important goals. 
one of which is they got numerous people into housing. They've been going out, contacting people, helping them. Uh, I know that uh, just before COVID started, they'd already gotten, I think, seven or eight people, uh, vets, into, into housing permanently. So that's the value of having a team out there like that and making sure that they're taking care of that kind of business. On the other hand, the neighborhood policing team uh, is, is very important also because we do have a lot of higher-end drug trafficking in our city. We have a lot of uh, problems that uh, very well could be caused by uh, narcotics in terms of mental health. So we do need someone to do that side of the, of the, uh, of the investigations, that proactive work. Uh, in addition to when we get problems such as burglaries or a robbery series, I need someone who can go out there and really shake the bushes and see what we can get. And so the, that team has been very instrumental in doing those things. Because as you know, we get lots of emails from people to city council, to me, to the city manager. Someone has to be the enforcement arm to handle that. So our hope and our goal is that if, as we can keep the amount of staffing that we need, to continue to raise both of those teams to a point uh, where we are as effective as possible and then look at other teams. Uh, other teams that we have considered, for instance, is, uh, is uh, helping probation and parole control some of the people that are currently on probation and parole. We see the same people that we arrest all the time. Somebody's gotta hold them accountable and in the absence of a different organization, we're willing to do that. And so uh, we arrested a guy last night currently on, on, super, on, on release from a different burglary case. Well, somebody has got to do that. And so our neighbor policing team is an important enforcement tool, but just as critical as the hero team. Uh, our goal, though, is to get the county mental health services to work with us as part of that team to maximize our benefits, to maximize our team, to make sure, <clears throat> excuse me, that uh, the people with the resources are actually out in the field helping us uh, accomplish those tasks. And so uh, we need to leverage the resources of others as well. Great, thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor Myers. Yeah, Andy and, um, and your team, I just wanna thank you for the presentation. Um, I'll just make it brief. Um, I just wanted to compliment you and just kind of encourage this kind of thinking in terms of the way that you have structured some of these community inputs in terms of, you know, um, neighborhood and, and you know, downtown and other things, especially I think about the police volunteer program and some other innovative things. Um, you know, your walk around town last year, um, I think the one thing I hear a lot of is, and I know this is a time intensive um, effort, but you know, the, the ability to actually get, you know, um, our officers and our police leadership, um, you know, integrated in the community as well as, um, you know, having, having not just an officer show up, but a volunteer or a trained person that's dealing, you know, has been trained to deal with certain issues. Um, I think it just sort of spreads your presence around the community in a, in a, in a very positive way. So, and I'm especially um, thankful for the creation of the Hero, Hero team. Um, so uh, I congratulate you guys on a good year and, um, and uh, hopefully we'll get through this COVID thing in hopefully in one piece, but thanks for your work and please let your department know of my thanks. Appreciate it. All right, uh, Council Member Watkins. And actually, um, oh, there we go. So I'm so, I apologize, I got kicked off uh, a couple of times, but I think I'm good. <laughs> um, but I do wanna just also echo the appreciation and things that's been said and um, want to just also suggest or just share if there's anything that we as a council can do to encourage your partnership with the county in regards to social workers or mental health liaisons, um, please let us know. I think that's a critical part of being able to holistically reach kind of that population that definitely needs um, those skill sets and uh, hopefully will lead to um, more uh, long-term changes for some of the repeat uh, folks that you have to encounter. So if moving forward, there's something the council can do to support that relationship going forward, please, um, please let us know. Okay, at this time, um, 
members of the public are interested in commenting on the police budget presentation, uh, there should be a list of phone numbers on your screen. And if you could please follow the instructions to call in. Once you've called in, you'll need to press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And when it's your time to speak, you'll hear an announcement that you've been unmuted and the time will be set to two minutes. And so we'll just pause for a few minutes to see if anybody wants to call in on this item. Mr. Mayor, while we're waiting, if I can just make a comment. Um, the HERO team was not my idea. Um, as much as important as it is, it was actually uh, Bernie Escalante and has uh, implemented it, and Jose Garcia is running it. And I just think it's important to uh, show that some of our other leaders have really stepped up to be innovative and thoughtful about what they're doing. And uh, as far as uh, community engagement is concerned, that is so vitally important. And uh, we were actually set to have three community meetings just before COVID hit to discuss the quality of life uh, ordinances. I know that you and others are interested in. And hopefully as soon as this is lifted or also find a different way to do it, we'll make sure that that engagement's there. Great. Thanks, Chief, and thank, thank you for uh, for all the work that you all have done to get this program up and running. Okay, given that uh, there are no members of the public who um, wish to call in, I saw that Councilmember Brown had her hand up. I think I accidentally lowered it, but uh, you have any comments? Yeah, I just wanted to say one more thing. I feel like maybe I should just wait till the end of the questions because I always come up with something more. Um, but I thought it would be, that, you know, I just felt really compelled to highlight again the HEROES team and the work that you all are doing. Um, and thank you, Bernie and Jose, um, for, you know, coming up with this. Because I think, you know, we hear most of the communications we get about police activity, um, you know, is negative. Either they didn't, you know, people, they, the police didn't respond, they feel um, unsafe, or um, interactions with uh, our unhoused community members. And so I just wanted to say that um, for all of those, there are so many more positive uh, interactions. And I've seen some of those uh, in ride-alongs, um, you know, knowing that the, the um, HEROES team, the people on that team, you know, really understand what is what resources are available, um, know, get to know people in, you know, unhoused community members and, and what their needs are. And so I just feel like um, that's, it's just really worth highlighting again and saying thank you for everything you do and um, keep on keeping on. And I'll just, I guess I'll follow up with that because having grown up in a neighborhood that did not have uh, where the police were not as, as positive and weren't as nice to many of myself and my friends growing up, uh, I definitely, since I moved to Santa Cruz and just over the years, have had really pleasant engagements with the police in our community and have been really, have felt safe in this community with our police officers. And I think that, as Councilman Brown said, you know, we, on the, at a national level, we hear a lot of negative things about police officers, but I think our community has really done a, a fantastic job, and our department's done a really fantastic job of trying to be positive and integrate with the community. And so, to the extent that we can kind of celebrate um, how positive our police force is, I think we should continue to do so because we do a lot of really good work. To, um, to you know, really protect and serve the community. So, thank you all for your, all your efforts. Councilmember Byers. This is rather a self-serving question, but um, because I was on the council when the building got built, how, how is the how is the building working out? I mean, it's old now. Well, it's not old, old, but um, is it holding up? Do you need more space? Is it already? 
you know, to something or other? Well, thank you for that question, but uh, it is fantastic. So whoever designed yeah. it, build it. Yeah. I know Steve Belcher was uh, heavily involved and in, uh, probably leading the task. But uh, it, this is a phenomenal building. We're, wow. we're bursting at the seams, but uh, we're good for now, and we appreciate your thought on that. Yeah. Oh, good. Thank you. Good to hear. I, I, do you still have the uh, – I mean, it was very c slightly controversial because it was going to add a lot to the budget. The shooting range or the practice range? We do. It's still oh, okay. operational, and, uh, and our officers use it to make sure that uh, we get what we aim at. Yeah, because you used to, I think, had to drive to Salinas or something, Watsonville. Right. Spectrum. Okay, good. Thank you. Sorry about that. I just wanted to uh, say thanks again for being here and for providing that presentation on our police department. And with that, I think we'll move on to our next presentation. Great, so at this time, um, we have our eighth presentation of the day. And just so everyone knows, this is our second to last presentation. So hang in there, everyone. Uh, but our next presentation is from our fire department. And uh, our presenter will be our fire chief, Jason Haidu. Uh For members of the public, there we go. Uh, for members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is a presentation you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation by staff, followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council for any follow-up questions. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jason Hyduke, our fire chief. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor and City Council, Jason Hyduke, Fire Department. Joining me today will be Paul Horvat, our OES manager and PMA, along with Division Chief Rob Odie, and they'll be taking over some slides as we get into it. And I'm gonna start off by uh, giving a, uh, the agenda, which is the same as all of our other um, departments that have been presenting. And I'll get into the structure of our department, uh, which is, uh, has not manifestly changed in a long time. Um, we have a fire chief, uh, principal management analyst, who is our OES, um, runs our Office of Emergency Services. We have one division chief that's in charge of fire prevention, one division chief who's in charge of operations. And as a 24-hour operation, uh, we always have someone here, um, and we respond every day and every night uh, to calls for service. Uh, we are primarily a response-based agency. However, uh, within our fire prevention and our OES, we do a lot of planning and mitigating and trying to minimize risk so that we don't have to respond. However, uh, we do respond on a uh, very frequent basis. Going on to the next slide. The major uh, divisions within our fire department are operations, and that's what you can think of of a fire department. When you call 911, uh, when you have a medical emergency, when you have uh, an accident, when you have a fire, uh, that's uh, what we call operations. Um, and there are engines, there's trucks, there's battalion chiefs, but those are the folks who respond out uh, for a call for service. Within fire prevention, we have um, uh, many activities that fall, uh, that support operations. But those are the people who are making sure the building standards are adhered to, that any complaints or life safety issues are followed up on. And just as importantly, when we do have a fire, they are the ones who are doing the fire investigation. And ultimately, if it is a criminal act, uh, ensuring that we are able to prosecute and remove those people from uh, harming the community. Within marine safety, uh, we have uh, full-time staff as well as seasonal staff. And uh, they run the gamut from uh, what people think of as uh, typical lifeguard operations, uh, someone in a tower contacting people, uh, letting them know of dangers, um, all, the well, all, all, all the way over to 24-hour response for um, people who are uh, in the water at night and for that rescue. Um, and underpinning all of this is ongoing training. Uh, many of the skill sets that we have are perishable skills that you have to maintain. And we have standards uh, for OSHA, we have standards for uh, the fire service that we have to maintain. And making sure that uh, when called upon, uh, the men and women of our department are able, able to provide that service in a safe, 
efficient and, and competent manner. Um, and, and our skill set is, is pretty broad. Uh, we are not just a fire department. We are an all hazard agency. Uh, we will go from a structure fire to a vehicle accident to a cardiac arrest to a diabetic emergency. Um, and, and having all those different skill sets, uh, you know, readily available is the goal of training. Within OES, our Office of Emergency Services, they are the ones who are making plans uh, for what, may, what might come and then enacting them when it does happen. And right now we're in the middle of uh, an example of that as far as our response to COVID-19 and activating our emergency operations center and coordinating our response within the city, ensuring that we have the proper supplies, that we have the proper communication, and just as importantly, that we have the proper documentation so that when uh, time for reimbursement and federal and state aid uh, uh, comes due, that we have that documentation that allows us as a city to minimize the financial impact of what COVID-19 has been doing to um, all of us. And then lastly, we have administration, uh, which uh, supports all of these um, other functions and make sure that we're doing uh, what we need to be doing on a daily basis. Next slide. So inside the, the department, um, I gave you an overview of our different functions. Um, and internally, we have what we call our three pillars. And those are our personnel, our response, and our community. And almost everything we do is run through these three things. Um, this is how we uh, filter um, our, our response and our engagement. And the engines, the stations, uh, those are, that's equipment. Nothing happens without our people. They're our most valuable commodity. And so really we wanna make sure that they're safe um, in very unsafe environments, that they're prepared, and that they're effective and, and competent. And that really drives most of uh, what we do. And then uh, as a response agency, we have to be available. Uh, most of our uh, calls for service are very time dependent, whether it's a fire, a medical, vehicle accident, a rescue. Um, and so our response is uh, getting the right equipment with the right people, with the right training to that problem to resolve it and minimize the impact to the best of our ability. And then looking at the community, what the impact is uh, for uh, the different events that occur within our community, what we can do proactively um, to, to minimize that. And later on, you'll hear uh, Paul Horvat and Rob Odi talk about some of the things that we've done within the community as far as engaging the community for being prepared uh, for both wildland, for earthquake, um, disaster management, and making sure that, um, that we're minimizing and giving people the tools absent our response um, to take care of themselves. Next. So within response, um, these are kind of our broad categories uh, for what we respond to on a, on a daily, nightly basis. And obviously we're a fire department and for fires, uh, whether it's a wildland fire, a structure fire, a vehicle fire, um, those occur. And most of them occur at times of the day when most people aren't aware of them. Uh, last year, we responded to almost 9,000 emergency calls for service. And of those, 147 were fire related, uh, whether they were a structure fire, a wildland fire or a vehicle fire. Uh, just this afternoon, we had a fire on the east side on Effie Street, uh, second story uh, bedroom. Um, and so those do occur and that's our, that's one of our primary functions, even though it's one of our, uh, not as our frequent as some of our other calls for service. However, they can be incredibly impactful. Um, EMS and medical calls, uh, we are advanced life support agency. We provide paramedic level service. Um, and that does take up the bulk of our overall call volume. And last year, we responded to nearly 5,000 calls for service for uh, medical aid. Then rescue is an all hazard agency and is an agency that has a city that's really varied. Uh, we have everything from a harbor to a university to redwood forest, a river, an ocean, a wharf. And so rescue comes in a lot of different uh, categories for us. And we provide uh, both water rescue as well as vehicle extrication, cliff rescue, which entails uh, a technical rope rescue. Um, and last year we responded to uh, 57 uh, cliff rescues, water rescues. Um, and, and then kind of rounding out that is what we kind of uh, term as a public service. And that can be everything from a vehicle that is sheared off a water hydrant to a broken sprinkler to an odor investigation. Um, and then lastly, we are also part of the Master Mutual Aid System within the state of California with Cal OES. And uh, you see that every summer where there's a wildland fire uh, in Northern California or in Southern California. 
and we respond to support that during that time period uh, with the understanding that when we need that support, it will be available to us. Um, and that's something that happens on an ongoing basis uh, and we're, uh, we do get reimbursed for that. Uh, the state has a plan for reimbursement so that we're made whole at the end of the day. But it is uh, so that when an area has a unmanageable disaster or event, that the right resources are able to be available to mitigate those, uh, those um, disasters. So next, um, I'm going to have uh, Chief Odie uh, discuss uh, some of the next slides for uh, marine safety. And uh, he'll give you an overview uh, a little bit more in depth about what that division does. Yeah, hello, uh, Council. Um, uh, marine safety um, division that we have um, provides a co pretty comprehensive level of services. Um, primarily, uh, it's our beach lifeguard service that we do during the uh, summer season, um, which stretches um, uh, part-time from uh, Easter through Memorial Day and then full-time service from Memorial Day to Labor Day, then reverting back to a part-time schedule um, weekends only until uh, Halloween. Um, and th that beach lifeguard service obviously in entails uh, staffing towers on the beach and the wharf, um, as well as patrolling other um, areas along West Cliff that can be hazardous. Um, of, of the uh, uh, attendance that we've recorded at the beach over the last year, we had a 1 million, uh, over 1 million uh, uh, visitors at the beach that these lifeguards are responsible for. Um, in addition to um, the lifeguard service they provide during normal business hours, which is usually about nine in the morning till uh, seven at night, we have on-call core of marine rescue personnel that work in conjunction with our uh, marine safety or our rescue swimmers that are on uh, fire and group as well. They team up um, after hours um, or on call to uh, respond to water rescues within the city, actually within the county if needed. Um, of uh, the on-call marine rescue and the lifeguards that we have for the summer, um, they performed over 300, uh, 369 rescues. Um, that uh, was both in the Santa Cruz City area and in the beaches of Capitola where we were contracted to provide service. Um, uh, we also provide uh, PWC, which is personal watercraft or rescue craft. We have four of those uh, units available, and uh, not only are they available for rescue, but we will do proactive patrols uh, when conditions uh, require it. Uh, we've also, um, again, after for seven years, been providing uh, contracts with lifeguard services for the city of Capitola. Uh, recently been suspended due to uh, COVID and budgetary uh, constraints for the city of Capitola, but that's something that we have done and uh, done well. Um, uh, additionally, we hosted the 2019 uh, California Surf Lifesaving Association Board of Directors meeting here in Santa Cruz. Uh, that association is an arm of the United States Lifesaving Association comprised of about 30 different chapters within the state. They all came up here and discussed um, issues uh, and policies that direct uh, the actions of lifeguard agencies throughout the country. I also participated in a uh, 2019 NorCal Shark Safety Workshop, which um, they utilized actually to update a uh, shark uh, safety SOP or matrix that we have in place, which was actually unfortunately utilized over this last weekend to ensure safety of all people in the water and uh, on the beaches. Um, let's see, they also, uh, assisted Santa Cruz Police Department in enforcing or advising and educating uh, beachgoers of the beach closure during the shelter in place recently. And um, uh, next slide. Uh, so our training division, our training division is, uh, um, again, is sort of the, uh, the, the backbone or foundation for keeping us all up to speed on the required training that's necessary to stay safe and remain effective um, for everybody out there. Um, we just completed, uh, well, we completed a regional Santa Cruz County Fire Academy. Uh, we, that's in conjunction with multiple departments within the county. It includes Watsonville, Aptos, and um, Central Fire, uh, where we all put uh, new uh, personnel through a pretty rigorous 16-week um, training, uh, which includes a number of technical certifications that are required. And uh, as of today, we've put um, four people through that in the last year that are on the line and, uh, and working. Um, so that's another great partnership we have with other agencies within the county. 
Uh, the training division also hosted the Santa Cruz County uh, Fire Investigation Series, uh, which was required to have us uh, to allow us to be much more effective in uh, in investigating and potentially prosecuting um, arson events within the city. It also allowed us to implement um, not only on call but shift investigators within our department, and we've actually re um, instituted a uh, fire investigation task force within the county that allows us all to help each other uh, for large-scale events if they occur. Um, another thing that the training division did over the last year uh, was implement a new uh, technique or approach to uh, structural firefighting. It's a BES or vent enter search. Uh, really allows a safer, more effective, coordinated approach to fire control rescue and overall suppression um, and so once we have that all trained we actually were instrumental in instituting this throughout our county um, so it's something that all departments are on board for since a lot of what happens if there's a large uh, fire event in any of our agencies uh, we all are there to assist and so we want to make sure we're on the same page um, we also fulfilled a grant that we received for our new self-contained breathing apparatus or SCBAs. Um, they allowed us to get uh, new bottles and equipment that are safer for us. Also allow for uh, the old bottles were 30 minutes, uh, and now we have 45 minute bottles, which allows us obviously to be safer for the user, but also more effective um, in firefighting uh, activities. Next slide. Uh, fire prevention. Um, again, very supportive arm of the department to assist everybody else in what we're trying to achieve. Um, we do, um, obviously, inspections, and over the last year, we did 530 total inspections. Um, 127 of them were, like, during construction phase, and 103 of those were life safety or fire-specific uh, inspections. Along with the inspection program, we do fire investigations, and we did uh, 56 fire investigations over the last year. Um, and uh, along with investigation and inspection, we have a pretty robust vegetation management program in partnership with our Parks and Rec, identifying areas, uh, neighborhoods that are at risk um, for any type of wildland event that may occur. Um, we've, uh, let's see, as of 2000, in 2019, we've completed 24.5 acres of trees within the open spaces in the city. And this year, by the end of this fiscal year, we'll be in tap to complete another 21 acres for a total of uh, 45 and a half acres. And these include the upper and lower parts of De La Viega, uh, Arroyo Seco, and Pogan Hill. Um, in addition to vegetation management, we also are very proactive uh, with the National Fire Protection Association's FireWise program. It's a partnership with local neighborhoods to arm them and educate them to be better prepared for wildland um, events uh, should and if they occur. Um, we formally recognize uh, our first neighborhood in the county, which was the Prospect Heights neighborhood, and we're currently working with uh, the neighborhoods of Highlands and uh, Western Drive to complete their process to have them formally recognized and of course prepared should a wildland uh, event occur. Um, we also do a lot of work with the uh, city manager's office over homeless resource coordination. Uh, we have been part of the homeless assessment team uh, prior to COVID, but most recently with the COVID event, we have been uh, instrumental in inspecting and approving and assisting with uh, setting up the uh, site up at the, the armory as well as uh, Coral Street. Um, when we have high fire danger air, uh, in the city based on wind um, and fire weather, we actually are doing active management of the open spaces by actually patrolling these areas uh, in a partnership with Santa Cruz Police Department and their rangers. Um, and we've been making contact and handing out reading materials to many people, both um, people that may be using them um, for housing, uh, and also those that are just using it for recreation to um, make them a little bit more aware of the dangers uh, in these encounters. Um, and lastly, prevention is also, um, this year we adopted our 2019 fire code, and with that we also instituted the Wildland Urban Interface Code Adoption, which applies to um, new or remodeled construction in identified areas so that people's homes will be much more protected should a wildland fire occur in those areas. Um, next slide. 
And uh, again, with fire prevention, one of the another major component is community risk reduction. Uh, I know Paul Horvath will talk a little bit more about some of the uh, events that we've hosted, but I just wanted to highlight um, our most recent fuel reduction program. Um, again, these uh, grants that we received required that we engage uh, with the local uh, neighborhoods where the work is being done, where we provide information, education, um, as well as the vegetation management. So this is uh, one of the signs of the area that we're currently working on, which is uh, Pogo Nip and Arroyo Seco. And with that, I'll turn it over to Paul Burbeck. Hello, thank you, Rob. Uh, um, might be your connection or um, maybe try to unmute you again. Maybe there was some feedback happening. Thank you. Um, yeah, just wanted to give you a brief overview of the Office of Emergency Services here within the Santa Cruz. Um, one of the things that we do to manage the operation center, which is our coordination center, where we uh, respond to disasters and emergencies and we get key personnel from the city of Santa Cruz together and other agency representatives so that we can make quick, effective decisions that will reduce the loss of life and uh, damage to property and the environment. Um, most recently, our uh, Emergency Operations Center activation has been in relation to COVID-19 response. Um, uh, we did something a little bit different where we've had a virtual EOC where we're using Zoom meetings and other methods of communicating so that we can maintain our social um, distancing protocol. Uh, one of the things that we are doing is developing management objectives, um, which started about uh, two months ago uh, when the virus uh, first uh, uh, became present here in the United States. And uh, based on those management objectives, uh, we try to make sure that we provide our employees with a safe work environment and that we uh, provide as safe in this environment as possible for the community working with our county public health partners. Um, in addition to that, a, a big uh, part of the COVID-19 response is tracking all costs related to our response uh, in terms of equipment, other supplies, and uh, overtime that our employees have been working um, in the essential functions. Um, so that's a big uh, area that we have been involved with recently, as, as you are all probably aware. Um, other uh, functions within the Office of Emergency Services is to manage and train our community emergency response team members. Uh, that is a group of citizens. Um, we've had about 500 trained here in the city of Santa Cruz, where we teach them some basic first aid techniques and uh, triaging injured victims, uh, putting out small fires, and uh, rescuing individuals uh, who may be trapped uh, in a collapsed building due to an earthquake. It's a program that's been uh, up and running for about the last 20 years. Um, and uh, these members also help us out with a lot of other uh, functions on a regular basis, such as tabling to, to help keep them engaged. Um, uh, as the OES manager, I am also the Fire Safe Council president for the County of Santa Cruz. Um, our Fire Safe Council uh, has been developed to try to reduce the wildland fire risk here in the County of Santa Cruz, as well as our urban wildland fire interface uh, in the city of Santa Cruz. Um, uh, in addition to that, we are uh, really active in coordinating uh, uh, acquiring and coordinating grants for vegetation management. Um, as you, your, your council is aware, we've, we've been involved in a lot of projects in that wildland urban phase inner area to try to create a, a safer environment and slow the potential spread of a fire um, from the wildland area into the city of Santa Cruz. Um, we train uh, and uh, exercise our emergency operations center. We train our city staff to be prepared to respond to incidents such as uh, the COVID-19 response. I think I need to move to get the lights back on. Um, and uh, next slide, please. Hello? Okay, thank you.
thank you. Um, as uh, Chief Odie had mentioned, um, we are quite active in our uh, disaster preparedness events. Um, we held uh, an event last year at the beginning of wildland fire season to engage our community to be more prepared for uh, wildland fires and how they may impact us here in the city of Santa Cruz. Um, we have also worked closely with Santa Cruz PD to table and present at some of their community events, um, as well as a lot of other special events where we will If you want, we'll go ahead and I'll, I'll take over for Paul. Uh, his, his audio is failing. Yeah. Sounds good. So uh, what he was talking about is we've had a number of disaster preparedness events, both for wildland as well as earthquake uh, within the community. We've developed uh, brochures to hand out to people so that they know what they can do uh, in advance of any type of event. Um, we did not predict COVID-19 12 months ago. We were more focused on uh, wildland and earthquakes. Um, but uh, we, we are um, trying to make sure that we can do everything in advance for the community so that they have the resources they need uh, and we don't have to respond. Um, let's go to the next slide. So at the end of the day, the services that we provide uh, as a fire department um, are an all hazard, all risk. Um, you know, as you can see here, fire is obviously on the side of our engine. Um, but if you look in the top right, uh, here we have our group members doing a technical uh, cliff rescue next to a body of water for someone who fell in that they need to bring them up. Um, and that's our primary, uh, you know, our function is emergency response. Um, but we've, we've, we've really tried to lean into those things that we can uh, minimize or prevent in the first place. And uh, you've seen that in the last few years with our vegetation management and wildland in response to uh, global warming uh, and climate change uh, and the impacts that historically we've not really felt here in Santa Cruz, I think are going to become more of an issue. And so we're beginning those steps to make sure that our community is going to be safe from um, those events. Next slide. So our, our status quo budget, um, really, like every other department, and I think maybe more so than others, um, the bulk of our budget is tied up within personnel costs. Um, having those people who are readily available uh, to respond to an emergency in a time-dependent manner uh, and as a 24-hour operation, uh, most of our, our costs are associated with that. A small percentage of our budget is for supplies and services. Uh, we too uh, have a netcom contract so that 911 works. Um, and then uh, the other part of our budget is uh, for revenue. And that's a little different than most public safety agencies. Uh, besides the Cal OES response uh, that we get reimbursed for, we also have a contract for service uh, for um, UCSD. Um, and currently, uh, we do not have any CIP uh, for the next coming fiscal year. Um, and at some point, uh, that will become a, a problem uh, for us. Um, but we are going to maintain our, our budget going forward. Next slide. So what's not status quo? Um, it, it's COVID. Uh, that is the biggest singular impact that I think any uh, any any department in the city is dealing with. Um, and for us, what has not been status quo is us responding to um, the need for coordination, uh, for additional work, for uh, sourcing supplies, um, cleaning supplies, uh, getting the right PPE, um, and then against the backdrop of changing standards for our employees, making sure that they have the best information, not only for us, but also the other departments in the city, and maintaining our capability and our response readiness uh, within our workforce and as well as within our uh, city. Um, and the other, uh, and Paul alluded to this, but our EOC has been activated since March in a virtual manner. 
Um, and that has been uh, a, not a status quo because it's, uh, this event has not been a one week or two week event. Uh, this has been going on for months and we're still at the very beginning of this. And so that non-status quo um, is that, uh, that disaster response that's going to be going on for uh, the foreseeable future. And that's all I have uh, for you. And I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you may have. Great, thank you all for that presentation. And uh, thank you for all the, the hard work you all have been doing to keep our community safe. I'll turn it over to council members to see if anyone has any questions. I have a question. Um, with regards to uh, COVID and uh, the fire department's response, I know you were mentioning um, that uh, calls are highest for EMS and medical. Have we seen any change in the call volume since uh, we, you know, more people are sheltering in place, more people are off the street? Uh, has there been a reduction in call volume for those kinds of services? So our overall call volume has decreased. Um, however, within that call volume, uh, and we've been tracking this uh, as far as universal precautions, and that's uh, for screening that we put in place through our 911 center, uh, for the fire service as well as law enforcement. And right now, um, our universal precautions or COVID type symptoms within those calls that we're running, we're anywhere from 5% to 30% of our overall calls have positive COVID symptoms. However, testing has not allowed us to actually definitively decide whether or not that person has COVID. What that means for us is that any medical call that we go on, we've had to approach it as if they have COVID and the use of PPE for our folks has gone up uh, dramatically. Um, you know, before this, if somebody had uh, symptoms, we would use the appropriate PPE, but because we have people who are asymptomatic because we don't know what we're walking into, um, we, we have the use of PPE uh, for us has gone up and it's on all calls. Um, just for example, today, we had a structure fire on the east side. And as part of the 911 uh, screening process, the person who lived there had, uh, they had gotten out of the house before our arrival, but they had positive COVID symptoms. So our folks showing up for a structure fire were told to use universal precautions if they were going to treat that person. Um, so our overall call volume has gone down. It's starting to creep back up and we're starting to see an increase uh, both within our 911 system as well as in our hospital systems, but overall we are lower than we were four months ago. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Councilmember Byers. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you all of you for your presentation. Uh, and you did talk, um, highlight several times the interface between uh, the trees and the forest and the urban. Uh, particularly, I'm, I'm talking about Arana. Uh, I remember doing the management plan for our Greenville Arana and the fire, someone from the fire department participated. I learned more about how wide a road actually has to be in our Greenville or Poganip and I learned a great deal and a lot of design came out of that understanding. So I, I never hear much about Iran. I always hear about Pogonet because I know people go there and et cetera, et cetera. And then we've got more trees. I think those are three green belts. So do you have any comment about Iran and how it's gone? Has it been a problem or difficulty? It's um, it's one of our identified wildland urban interface areas. Right. However, it's not um, because of the size of it and because of the fuel that's there, it's not as high a risk as some of our, of our other areas. Uh, we have put in some shaded fuel breaks along the edges there so that if uh, we did have a fire in that area, that it would stop before it got to the houses. Um, we do, uh, we, we have had a number of uh, smaller events down there, but the fuel source, the, that interconnected fuel source, um, we don't have miles and miles of forest that are connected. It's a relatively small fuel right. source. Right. Um, and it's a, the majority of it is grass, it's not brush and, and timber. Um, so it is one of our identified buoy areas. Um, we have done some vegetation management there um, and we do have good access there. Yeah, for sure. How about Moore Creek? Any comments about Moore Creek? Moore Creek um, is uh, probably one of the more challenging uh, wildland areas that we have just because of the topography, as well as the number of um, 
um, species and types of plants that are in there and our ability to actually get into that um, and do vegetation management is limited because of that riparian corridor um, and then just also just how steep it is. And so uh, our efforts there have really been on uh, the people who live adjacent to it at the top the, what they can do for their building construction and more importantly, the maintenance they can do on an ongoing basis uh, to minimize that, the risk of that ember cast or that fire transmitting from more creek up to the top. Thanks, thanks. I don't think I have any other questions. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Vice Mayor Myers. Thank you for that presentation. Um, I just have one question for you, Chief. Um, I know Lifeguard Headquarters was on your, I believe your CIP, has been on your CIP for a number of years, and I can't recall if you had a chance, if you guys have done improvements to the building, or I, I'm just curious about, um, you know, thinking about CIP types of items. You mentioned you didn't have any CIP um, items, but I'm just curious about your comments on that so we don't lose track of that of that need. I know I've, I've been in the building and uh, I know it, it's, been a, it's been a need of your, of your departments for a while. So maybe just a quick comment on that. Yeah, so the, the reality is, is that building is decades past its useful lifespan and it's definitely grown past uh, what its use was um, in 1960, 1980 to today. So what we did last year is we, um, we used some risk funds to uh, really address the most critical components of that building. Uh, and that were, was electrical, that was leaking roofs, that was mold. Uh, we didn't change the footprint of the building or increase the size. We just really addressed those issues within it so that to make it more functional. Um, but the building itself is, you know, it houses 70 seasonal lifeguards uh, uh, on, a, on a normal year as well as mm -hmm. housing the uh, Parks and Rec Junior Lifeguard instructors. Um, and so we're kind of bursting at the seams there as far as just a, a capacity and size issue. But we did address the life safety issues that uh, needed to be done within that building. Okay, okay. So, so we keep it on the list for better days. Yes. Um, you also did not mention the most important outcome <laughs> of, of your year, which was a first place finish in the uh, 27th annual Aloha Outrigger races. So that's a, that's a, that's a highlight for sure. So congratulations. So far I'm batting 100%. It's my first time in an Outrigger canoe and it, it seemed like it went pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks for everything your department does. And uh, it's always a pleasure to see you guys around. Thank you. Thank you. All right, are there any other council members uh, with questions at this time? Okay, uh, Council Member Brown. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks for the presentation and all of the work you're doing. I know that in these very uncertain times, it's hard to think about um, kind of planning for some of those, those projects. And um, since uh, Vice Mayor Myers mentioned the uh, lifeguard headquarters on the wharf, I guess I'm just wondering, given that we're um, not likely to be able to fund that anytime soon, and there has been so much discussion about the potential for um, this coming through the, the larger repairs that we're going to do on the, with the work master plan. Um, so, but all of that seems to be uh, kind of it's likely that it'll be delayed. So um, I'm just wondering if you uh, the kind of band aids that you've uh, put uh, for um, for safe critical safety um, measures that you've taken. You feel like that will um, kind of get you through uh, uh, the the tough times. I mean, we don't know how long that will last, but I'm just wondering if there are any other ways that we could think about kind of creatively trying to help make that project happen. Because you know we've been talking about it for a long. I mean, I've been talking about it for a long time, the whole time I've been on the council and for many years before that. Um, so, uh, you know, I'd just like to find a way to, to help make that happen. And so if, if you're, uh, if you've got anything on that, I'd, I'd love to hear it. Uh, and really, really um, just, just want to appreciate the work y'all are doing. Um, I know that it's um, kind of where we don't know what this fire season is going to look like. Um, but it's definitely uh, on everyone's minds, and I appreciate all of the thought you put into kind of how to address that at the um, the uh, you know urban interface, um, wildland urban interface. It's it's um, it's 
scary, but we also feel, uh, or I feel uh, assured that, you know, you all are doing everything you can. So thank you for everything. Thank you. All right, if there are no further questions or comments, um, I'm gonna open up to the public. So if anyone is watching or has called in and is interested in commenting on the fire budget presentation, uh, please dial in now if you're just watching or if you've already called in, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. Once it is your time to speak, go ahead and announce that you've been unmuted and the time will be set to two minutes. We'll just pause for a second to see if um, members of the public would like to call in. And actually, while we're waiting for folks to call in, uh, Council Member Watkins, it looks like you have a question. I didn't have a question. I just had a comment. I just wanted to share the appreciation that has been echoed, you know, just to echo the comments made earlier about your department and, you know, that slide and showing all of your staff just being first at these really critical instances where, you know, you're so, you're so the selflessness associated with that, just, you know, I just want to echo our appreciation for you. Um, and I, too, realize and recognize that the uh, capital improvement projects keep coming up and being delayed and delayed and delayed. And, and um, unfortunately, here we are again and um, how we can keep that on the radar and appreciate your sustainability kind of thinking around um, the Band-Aid approach, I guess, until then. And then I just wanted to remind Vice Mayor Myers who else was on that outrider team. <laughs> and that was a good time. All right. Thank you. Okay. okay, we'll um, just probably give the community another minute to 30 seconds or so to see if anybody will call in on this item before we move on to our next one. Fire budget. Okay, hearing none. Thank you all again for the presentation and for being here today. And I look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you. All right. Next up is our last presentation of the day. Item number nine on our presentations, which is a presentation of our library's budget. And so for members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is a presentation you'd like to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation by staff followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and return to the council for any follow-up questions or comments. And with that, I'll turn it over to our library director, Susan Nemeth. Hi, I just wanna make sure you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you, good afternoon. Thank you for giving me the privilege to speak to you about the Santa Cruz Public Libraries. Um, like everyone else, it's, well, first I wanna say it's um, nice to go last, um, bear with me. Um, like everyone else, it actually was a great year prior to the COVID-19 um, crisis. I think we've made some major accomplishments you know that we received $67 million in Measure S funds um, starting three years ago. Um, over the last year, we've been able to open the Felton Branch, which you can see in the picture in front of you, and its Nature Discovery Park. We have Capitola and La Selva Beach under construction. We're bidding Boulder Creek and Aptos. We're developing the construction documents and getting the appropriate permits for Garfield Park, Branza Forty, and Live Oak and we continue to work on approach for downtown. I am hoping that we'll come to some resolution this summer. Um, I also just wanna do a shout out to the Friends of the Library. So far, they've raised 3.6 million for the 10 projects, and I'm really proud of their amazing accomplishments. I think we've also made some major projects in terms of K-12 partnerships. Um, 
One of the things we did last year is uh, stop all fines for children. And so we're gonna get to be able to see the results of that. But I think it really improves access for kids. Um, we're trying to make sure that all kids have library cards. We've created an educator's library card. So teachers can come in and check out materials for their classroom. And since COVID-19, we've created a concierge service for teachers where we help teachers find digital materials as they try to teach online. In terms of digital access, I'm really proud of some of the things we've accomplished. I don't think people realize that we offer 150,000 personal computer sessions a year to the public and 500,000 Wi-Fi sessions. So COVID-19 has been really hard on our library users in terms of their digital access. This year, we introduced the laptop checkout process. We offered a lot of digital literacy classes, often going to nursing homes to do so. Um, one of the proudest achievements is uh, you can see in this photo was our partnership with the city where we did a virtual reality program on sea level rise that has been um, very popular with kids and adults alike. Um, through COVID-19, one of the things we've been trying to do is boost our Wi-Fi outside our buildings so people can sit in the parking lots and use Wi-Fi. We've also donated uh, uh, digital devices to shelters because they have um, very limited access to the internet. In terms of equity, um, we're really proud that we've made a concerted effort to hire bilingual staff and offer more bilingual programs. And we're super proud of the digital liter or sorry, the life literacy center that we opened at the downtown library. We're providing a downtown social worker there, legal assistance, tax assistance, and immigration help. Um, of course, those things are closed right now. Through the COVID process, we've been, um, instead of doing our weekly deliveries to the jails, we have put deposit collections in all the jails um, and uh, continue to try to figure out how to serve some of our at-risk populations. So the governance of the Santa Cruz Public Library is complex on a good day. <laughs> um, I actually am uh, hired and uh, managed by a joint powers board that considers the, that consists of the chief administrative officer of the city, county, the city of Capitola and Scott Valley. Our board does not include Watsonville. Our board pretty much requires unanimity in all decisions, which can be difficult across those four jurisdictions. In addition to that, there's layers of complexity. So for example, the Measure S funds go to each of the four jurisdictions, not to the JPA. And the jurisdictions can decide how the buildings for libraries are built. Overhead for the JPA, both in terms of finances and HR, are provided by the city of Santa Cruz. And the staff are employees of the city of Santa Cruz. So sometimes that makes for some complexity, complexity in policy and decision making. Our traditional org chart shows the library reporting through the Joint Powers Board. Um, so it shows the Friends of the Santa Cruz Public Library as an important part of the success of our organization. and really shows that the 10 branches are divided into three regions. The downtown branch, Garfield branch, and Brand Savorty branches are part of the West region. So just to give an overview of our budget, over the last year we had about a $16.2 million budget. My board has pushed heavily to increase our reserves, and right now I'm very thankful to them for that. We have a $2.9 million reserve, and we're projecting a fund balance of 1.8 million beyond that. I think the big thing we've just uh, struggled with historically with our budget has been staffing. You can see by this chart, in 2007, we had 138 FTE. Um, this past year, we were just shy of 100. And so we have never recovered from the Great Recession. 
We consistently serve um, 10 communities with 10 physical sites. And we expect our services to grow remarkably um, as the buildings get redone. Now the city pays a subset of that budget. They pay 1.75 million um, each year. This is property tax funds that go to the JPA. There is a five year agreement. This is the third year payment. Um, now this is the fourth year payment. Uh, and then the, the five year agreement will have to be renegotiated at the end of next year or hopefully before. In addition, the JPA pays the city $482,000 for overhead. That's really for the financial services and the human resources office and services. This year, we're projecting a $1.2 million deficit. We've already gone to the JPA, instituted a hiring freeze, suspended the use of all our aides and on-call these are a temporary job classification. We suspended uh, using them. It consisted of 62 people who no longer have work after April 10th. And the budget um, for this year foresees that we will not use those temporary staff at least through July 1st, 2020. We cut non-personnel spending and we're expecting to use a fund balance of about a million dollars. And the overall um, JPA deficit for FY 2021 is 3.8 million. And we are beginning to have conversations about how to resolve that, looking closely at both what the city of Santa Cruz does and primarily the county. I'm gonna leave it at that. You've had a long day. I hope I can answer any questions you have. Thank you, Susan, and thanks to all the librarians and folks who have been doing such great work, engaging folks with all the great materials we have and, and educational resources. Thank you. Um, I have to say that um, the mayor participated in a series we're doing where we're bringing faith leaders together. I know that almost 100 people showed up for your session, um, and we've just gotten a lot of really positive feedback about yeah. those sessions. Thanks again for the invitation to that as well. Uh, I'll turn it over to uh, Council Member Watkins. Questions? I, you know, I don't really even have a question, but it's just a comment that I just want to show um, my appreciation to you, Susan, and your team, but also for how you've been able to really pivot um, and provide a lot of virtual uh, resources for our community and tools for parents as they're navigating um, distant learning and and just still continuing to provide this you know these incredible resources amongst these really challenging times. So thank you for the presentation, and for thank you, uh, Councilmember Byers. Oh, you're on mute. You're right. I wasn't. Thank you. Um, I started to say. Um, you gave me great joy in your, I don't know, almost your first paragraph or second paragraph where you said you're no longer charging children uh, fines. And I, that has bothered me since 2008. I was on the library board and I, I lost that battle. It was like, you know, I was the only no vote. So I can tuck that away that it's over, it's done, it just made no sense. So thank you very much. And thank you, we we're thrilled. Yes, we both know it's the right thing to do and the amount of money you've got. Um, also, uh, I just wanna thank you. I, I don't really have questions as much, but I just learned this last week how to download uh, books onto my phone. Uh, Someone helped, someone helped me there, but I, it's just been wonderful to browse and pick up a book and push borrow and it's on my phone or my iPad. So I hope, uh, any, I hope, I know you've offered this service for a long time, but certainly have the staff gone up on it or are you seeing more and more using it? 
our ebook use is up 80%. <laughs> That's crazy. I'm one of them. <laughs> um, I would wow. just say to the public that may be listening to this, if people are intimidated sure. by the um, software, they should call our reference line, and we have people that will walk you through it. They did. I Absolutely. It was just wonderful, and they did. It, it was daunting. I felt it was going to be daunting, and it wasn't. So, Anyway, again, thank you for everything. Thank you. Matthews. <laughs> Absolutely thrilling to see the culmination of decades of progress coming to fruition in the library. It's wonderful. And I give a personal shout out to the um, increase in online services. I'm sure you all know, but the public should know. Sign up for Canopy, <laughs> online access to movies with your library card. You have free access to tens of thousands of incredible movies. We are getting our money towards out of Canopy. <laughs> it's wonderful. And we've been able to negotiate with many of our vendors yes. who limit the um, digital services to the library on site. So for example, um, Ancestry.com, yeah. which you before had to use within a library's walls, I was available at home. It's a tremendous resource. Great to know. Uh, Councilmember Byers. Sorry, one more question. Um, do the friends of the library hire, uh, you know, the coordinator or whatever the title is, or do you, are you part of that? The friends of the library um, hire their own staff. Oh, okay. They recently hired Marcia Greenspan. Um, who was a development director or assistant director at uh, Homeless Service Center. And we're just really glad to have her on board. She has just such an interesting set of experiences and skills. I'm thrilled. The re that's the reason I asked it, because I'm on that board. And it was oh. such a loss. And then I realized she went to the Friends of the Library, and I thought, oh, are they ever lucky. So uh, say hello to her for me, because I don't see her. You probably don't I will either. Do that. But would She's you please? Magnificent. Yeah. Magnificent. Yeah. Are there any other members of the council with questions at this time? Seeing none, I, Susan, I had a question for you, um, kind of extending to the fines and fees, and I was just wondering, um, I think it was, it was either the U.S. Conference of Mayors or the League of California Cities that came up, and there's a number of cities now where they're actually just eliminating late fees altogether because oftentimes so much money is spent on the collection agencies for them and going out and trying to collect the fees they never get, but you still have to pay the collection agents. Is there any thought around potentially eliminating as we move into, you know, um, well, as we continue to see the impact of COVID-19 and given that there's a projected deficit, is there any thought around um, just eliminating late fees altogether? And I guess, is there any data out there to suggest that that might be a good route to take? Um, Mayor, I think you're absolutely right. The data really shows that um, libraries actually get more books back and um, don't um, by not having fees, um, and that the money raised doesn't necessarily always offset the cost of having fees. Um, we had a proposal to the JPA this spring to get rid of um, fees. Our whole budget. Um, proposal is sort of being rethought right now because of COVID-19. What the board is allowing me to do is um, basically put off charging fee, late fees during this period um, because people can't readily, we don't even want their books back right now. And so I think what you'll see is probably a discussion of it again next year, but in the short run, there are no late fees at the library. Okay. Thank you. I just want to thank the city council. You've been such supporters of libraries, and I know many of you were centrally involved in getting Measure S passed. Um, I think the libraries in Santa Cruz are going to, are incredible, but are going to be even more incredible as we move through um, what are some difficult um, and challenging times. Um, but I really do want to thank you all for your support. I'd also like to thank um, you all and uh, the economic development staff and the working with 
uh, the library subcommittee because we've been doing a lot over the past year to engage with the community and get perspectives of so many people in our community so that we can really make sure that we're going to make you know the best and most informed decision as we decide on uh, what our, our new library is going to look like. Absolutely. Vice Mayor Myers. Yeah, Susan, I just wanted to say thank you and thank you to all the library staff, um, especially um, all the time you've been putting in um, with um, the library subcommittee process um, and both really, um, I feel like you really um, provided, you really directed, you know, these two analysis that were done and that provide um, additional information for our community about, you know, the downtown library. And I think that's been really helpful for our community to understand. Um, better about the opportunities, you know, that need to be evaluated. And um, just want to compliment you on the Felton Library. Um, it's an amazing place, and I'm so sorry that right after it opened, um, people are not able to use it at this point, but it is truly an amazing place. And, um, and just also re-express, I believe, at least from my perspective, um, the council's commitment to um, to the Garfield and um, Brent the 40 libraries. I know, um, I know we committed to, uh, uh, to dip into budgets that right now might be hurting quite a bit, but I really hope that um, we can hold true with those commitments um, when we made the decision to upgrade those libraries to be um, beautiful and um, really 21st century libraries. So thanks for your work over this year and uh, we'll, keep, we'll keep going. Thank you. Thank you. Brown. Uh, hi, thank you, Susan, for the presentation. I um, just ditto the, the kudos and uh, thank yous for all of the work that you do and the library staff does. Um, it's just, I don't even have words to say how uh, wonderful it is to, um, you know, learn about and be a part of uh, you know, library community uh, that is so innovative, creative, and, um, you know, motivated to make uh, the library experience, uh, you know, just a wonderful experience for all of its users. I, I really appreciate your commitment to that and all of the work you've done. And yeah, the, um, the online, the kind of virtual world that is opened up now through, um, through the library for a lot of people who are, are stuck uh, at home, it's it's just it's just wonderful. So thank you, and and I did uh, being a member of that library subcommittee, I really appreciate all of the work you're doing. It's um, it's just you know I hope we can we can get over the finish line on that one. And also, as uh, Vice Mayor Meyer said, uh, make sure that we follow through on the commitments that we've made to the other libraries. Um, those it was one of the most exciting things to see and be able to do to you know to vote yes on those. Um, so yeah, um, just thank you for everything. And Sandy, thank you so much for also recognizing the staff. I get to work with extraordinary people. Okay, thank you. Uh, before we move on, I just wanna give the public an opportunity to speak uh, on this item, which is our library's budget. So if you are interested in speaking to this item, uh, there should be a list of phone numbers on your screen that you can call into. And after you've called in, you can press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And when it's your time to speak, you'll hear an announcement that you've been unmuted and the, time will, the timer will be set to two minutes. Okay, so we have one person who's on the line. Uh, you are on the line. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, I've been listening all day, believe it or not, to all the department presentations, and it's pretty clear that you know we're in an era of budget uncertainties, and we need to prioritize city spending. So I'm hoping the subcommittee will recommend the renovation at the library's present location. We can't depend on millions of dollars more for um, the mixed-use project with so many unknowns. Uh, the decision deadline is fast approaching, as you all know. Uh, and we've seen some preliminary group four designs. Uh, we're waiting for the final ones, but so far that has not been an apples to apples comparison. 
So, uh, you know, I'm listening to uh, reading what Susan presented to the JPA at their meeting last week, outlining, you know, what, what it's going to be like in libraries in the next two years due to COVID, um, coping with that. You know, there's going to be a lot less person-to-person uh, -person, uh, interactions, and uh, it's, it's a lot more virtual programming and, uh, you know, online, present, online activities. So this seems like it would be a good time to uh, do the renovation since the library is closed. And, uh, you know, two years down the road, we could have a, a totally wonderful rebuilt library there. So uh, also uh, another aspect is the value of community open space that a lot of, there's been a lot of talk about that in uh, this post-COVID times. Uh, and um, so let's not fill in parking lot four with a massive concrete structure. Uh, not needed, and uh, I hope you're going to make the right decision for the community. Thanks a lot. All right, thank you. Okay, if there's any other member of the public who would like to call in, now is the time. And after you follow the instructions on your screen to call in, you need to press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it's your time to speak, you'll hear an announcement that you've been unmuted and the timer will be set to two minutes. So we'll just give folks one last opportunity to call in. Okay, seeing no other uh, members of the public, Susan, thank you again for joining thank us in that presentation. And I'd like to thank all the department heads, city staff, members of the public who were able to join us today for our budget presentations by our various departments. Um, to our city employees and department heads, uh, you're all doing an amazing job and thank you for your commitment during this very difficult time. Um, and together we will all continue to you know, work our way through uh, Santa Cruz during COVID. And so with that, I'd like to adjourn our meeting and everybody please be safe and stay safe.